This is Audible. The Family Shelter, a small town post apocalypse EMP thriller. Written by James Hunt. Narrated by Cheryl May. Chapter One Most people didn't enjoy the simple life. They wanted complex and dangerous. But not John Carver. He enjoyed the predictable nature of his daily routine. He had no desire for unneeded risk. It was the smell of fresh cut wood that John Carver loved most about the job. No matter where he worked construction, that smell was always the same. It didn't matter if he worked on apartment buildings or a single family home. That scent always reminded him he was doing good work. Carver. John removed his gloved hands from the table saw and turned to find the site manager, Tim Meadows, glaring at him. He was new to the company and wasn't the man you wanted to cross paths with. He was not intimidating, but John wasn't in the mood for an earful. Why are you here? Tim Meadows was the only man on the work site dressed in a collared shirt and dress shoes, which he desperately tried to keep clean. He hadn't been successful. I'm working, Mr. Meadows, John answered respectively. You're supposed to be done with this room already, Meadows said, pointing to his clipboard. It's past 11, you're three rooms behind. John glanced around the room he was framing for the drywall installation. Their latest job was an affordable housing project in southern Cincinnati. He was nearly finished and was already working as fast as he could. It takes time to ensure everything is squared and level, John answered. You're costing the company money, Meadows answered. The longer it takes you to finish these rooms, the more hours it'll cost us to pay for the drywallers just to sit around and do nothing. I already discussed our plan with George, John answered. He told me I had at least five days, but I told him I could finish in probably three or four. This is only the first day. I don't care what George told you, Meadows answered. I'm the project manager for the site, and when I tell you to do something, I want it done. No excuses. Ever since Meadows had become a manager, he had been hell-bent on moving a crew as fast as possible. However, working at a breakneck pace often led to accidents and poor craftsmanship. They'd already failed a few inspections on other projects and had to redo them. Of course, Meadows blamed everybody but himself. Look, I understand that you need to hit your quotas, John answered, but I need to ensure I'm doing quality work. Quality work, Meadows asked, incredulous. Look around you, John. This is affordable housing. It doesn't matter what we put together so long as it's standing when we leave. It doesn't matter who hired us to do the job, John said, or how much it costs. Everyone is entitled to living in a home that was built properly. Then let me make this as simple for you as possible, Meadows said. If you don't have this entire floor done by the end of the day, you will be fired. It's impossible to do that by myself, John said. That's not my problem. Meadows replied, and with that, he walked away, leaving John high and dry to figure out what to do next. John stood alone in the room. He glanced around at the walls and all the work that needed to be completed. The only way for him to do this all by himself was if he cut corners, and that was something he refused to do. John's father always warned him that cutting corners was dangerous. It was easy to do. And once he started down that path, it wasn't long before he would stop caring about the job entirely. And he was taught to always have pride in his work. John stepped outside and saw the other crews working on the houses on the cleared lots. Everybody was sweating under the hot summer sun. Most of the guys would skip lunch to meet Meadows' timeline. The man would drive everybody into the dirt. And John feared they would lose the good employees when they were pushed to the brink of exhaustion. They had already lost their best electrician to another company. He had refused to work with Meadows. But Meadows had a family friend high within the company. It was the only reason he had gotten a job. 
he'd come to the office with his brand new MBA from Cincinnati University, which he believed gave him the right to talk to anybody however he wanted. If John's parents hadn't taught him patience, then he probably would have quit long ago. But he still believed in the work they were trying to do within the company. And he happened to enjoy it. Plus, there were still plenty of good employees at the company. One of them was his best friend, who happened to be their lead plumber. And if there was anybody John could count on, it was Jake Simpson. Jake, John shouted, spying his friend in the house next door. Jake and John had grown up together in Cincinnati. They were as close as brothers. Aside from his wife, there was nobody John trusted more than Jake. In here, Jake shouted. John followed the sound of his friend's voice into the almost finished kitchen of the house next door, where he found his friend underneath a kitchen sink, only his lower half visible. A radio on the countertop played a news channel. Our top story this morning comes as the notorious bank robber, Dylan Elliott, is set to be arraigned today. Dylan was the mastermind behind the robbery of Cincinnati Federal Reserve Bank. Dylan and his men stole $100 million from the bank. Authorities captured him trying to flee the city. But while Dylan was recovered, the money remains missing. John turned the radio down, catching Jake's attention. Where do you think the money's hidden? Jake asked, still under the sink. Not sure, John answered. Do you have a minute? Jake grunted, finishing something, then slid out from beneath the sink. He was dressed in faded blue jeans, even more faded work boots, and a white t-shirt drenched in sweat. He never wore a hard hat unless he was forced to. He'd always joked that nobody with as good of a head of hair as his should ever be forced to wear a hat. Yeah, what's up? Jake asked. Do you think you could give me a hand? John asked. Meadows is pushing me to finish the house next door by the end of the day. By yourself? Jake asked. Didn't you just start? I did, but he said if I don't finish it today, he's going to fire me. John answered. Jake waved his hands dismissively. Oh, he threatens to fire me at least twice a daily. But yeah, I can help you. What do you need? Are you sure it won't interfere with your day? John asked. Jake placed a hand on John's shoulder. I always have time for my brother. Thankful for his friend's help, John instructed Jake to cut the wood while he measured. He believed he could meet Meadows' quota with Jake's assistance. John had never used an assembly line method before because each room offered unique challenges. And there was a way for John to maximize the room's resources and create better space. That was what he did. But at least this way, John could ensure the quality of his work. John and Jake fell into a seamless rhythm. It didn't take long before the first room was finished, and they had already moved on to the next. But as Jake was firing up the table saw, John felt his phone vibrate in his pocket. John held up his hand to get Jake's attention when he saw it was his wife. Jake shut off the saw and John answered the phone. Hey, honey, John said. I can't talk right now. Blake broke his arm, Maggie said. What? John asked. How did that happen? I didn't get a lot of the details, Maggie answered. I think he fell off the swings or the monkey bars on the playground. I'm on my way to the hospital now. So much for your day off, John said. Maggie was an ER nurse with Cincinnati General. She had one of the better schedules in the hospital due to her seniority, but she had just finished her seven-day, 12-hour rotation, and he knew she was looking forward to some rest. Can you meet me there? Maggie asked. John glanced around the unfinished house and all the work that still remained. Meadows would be angry, but nothing was more important to him than family. Of course, I'll be there as soon as I can, John answered. I love you. Maggie said. Love you too, John replied. John ended the call. Everything okay? Jake asked. John shook his head. Blake broke his arm at school. Damn, Jake answered. You need a ride? No, I'm good to drive, John answered. Before John left, he would need to speak with Meadows. And he braced himself for an earful. 
John found Meadows barking at one of the other carpenters two houses down. No one could work fast enough for him. Mr. Meadows, John said, catching his attention. I need a word. What do you want, Carver? Meadows asked, exasperated. I have to leave, John said. No, Meadows said, get back to work. My son broke his arm at school, John replied. He's being taken to the hospital and I'm gonna meet my wife there. Meadows took one step closer, glowering with anger. I warned you that if that house isn't done by the end of the day, you're fired. You wanna test me? John had always been a patient man. His wife said he had the patience of a mountain. But every once in a while, a mountain could erupt. Mr. Meadows, my son is hurt, John said. Surely we can find some sort of understanding. I made my position crystal clear, Meadows said, refusing to back down. I understand, John said. John turned around and walked away. But Meadows couldn't help himself. Don't think you can go over my head on this one, Carver, Meadows shouted. This is my site, you hear me? You'll never work for this company again, no matter what the project is. Jake spun around. Yeah, well, you can get yourself a new plumber, too. Jake flipped Meadows the bird, then joined John, walking toward the barren field next to the work site where their vehicles were parked. You shouldn't have done that. John said. His boss will be begging us to return in less than a week, Jake said. Or we could finally start our own business like we've always discussed. Be the ones in charge wearing fancy suits. I like all that, save for the fancy suits, John said. Jake laughed. But just before they reached John's truck, the construction site went silent. The generators shut down. The saws stopped working. Drills turned off, and the hum of production was replaced with cries of confusion. What the hell? Jake asked. A few workers checked the generators, trying to figure out what had gone wrong. But as John watched the scene unfold, he had the sinking suspicion something horrible had happened. He quickly reached for his phone and tried to turn it on, but the screen remained blank. Jake, check your phone. John answered. Jake fished his phone out of his pocket, and when John saw it was turned off, he knew what had happened. It's not working, Jake said, confused. What the hell is going on? John frowned, and a cold sensation of dread flooded his bones. And as he watched other workers come out of the houses, pointing toward their blank phones, John feared the worst. It finally happened. It was an EMP. Chapter Two Maggie Carver's heart was pounding when she entered the emergency room. It was strange to be at work and not dressed in her scrubs. But she never thought she'd be in the shoes of so many mothers who entered this hospital, desperate to help their child. Maggie! Darlene waved at her, catching Maggie's attention. Where is he? Maggie asked, clinging to Darlene like a life raft. He's in prep, Darlene answered. Come on, I'll take you to see him. Maggie kept hold of Darlene's hand as they navigated the hallways of the hospital. All around her, there were staff members and patients, along with family members running around, helping those in trouble. As an emergency room nurse, Maggie had treated individuals in some of the most horrible accidents imaginable. But none of them compared to having her own son in the ER. When Darlene brought Maggie into the preparation room, where Blake was being held until the doctors were ready to work on him, she rushed to her son's bedside. Blake was in tears, unable to speak. Maggie held her son close, whispering to him that he was going to be all right. The broken arm was already wrapped, so Maggie couldn't see the extent of the damage. But it was clear from her son's tears it was serious. It hurts, Mommy, Blake said. I know, Maggie said, wiping away his tears. But the doctors are going to get you fixed up, okay? Where's Dad? 
Blake asked. He's on his way, Maggie said. Maggie sat with Blake on the bedside, and he leaned against her with his good arm to her side. The doctor should be in in just a few minutes, Darlene said. Do you guys need anything? We're good, Darlene, Maggie said. Thank you. Of course, Darlene said. Once Maggie and Blake were alone in the room, Maggie closed the door so they could have some peace and quiet, silencing the chaos of the hospital. Maggie held her son close, gently stroking his hair the way she did whenever he was sick. He whimpered and clung to her side. Even though Blake was 10 years old, she couldn't help but see him as the baby she had held in her arms. He had always loved to be cuddled when he was little. Of course, when Maggie was exhausted and wanted nothing more than to put him in his crib, it was annoying. But in moments of reflection, she wished she could return and relive them. It was so easy to keep her children safe when they were in her arms. But they were growing up, heading out into a dangerous world. But that was life. I'm sorry, Blake said. Maggie frowned. Sorry for what? Blake looked up at her, his face red and sweaty from his time outside. I didn't mean to get hurt. I was just playing around and I lost focus. And Dad always tells me that I have to pay more attention. Well, he's not wrong, Maggie answered. But everyone makes mistakes, and there are consequences. But you can choose to let those moments define you, or you define the moment. You're the one in control. Blake considered this, and then he slowly sat up. I won't make the same mistake again. Maggie saw the brave face her son was putting on. He was growing more like his father, swallowing the pain and replacing it with courage. Despite Maggie's best efforts, her son was growing up. All she could do now was to ensure he walked the right path. Eventually, the doctors and nurses returned ready to escort Blake into the operating room. The doctor explained the process and how Blake wouldn't feel a thing as they put him under anesthesia to reset the bone and apply the cast. So I'll be asleep, Blake asked. That's right, the doctor answered. And when you wake up, your arm will be put back together with a cast to keep it in place until the bone has had time to heal. Blake relaxed a little at the news that he wouldn't have to feel the pain of the bone being set again. Well, that's good. The doctor smiled. He was one of the better surgeons who had a good bedside manner, especially when dealing with the kids. He was a father himself. And Maggie believed that always helped doctors when they were speaking with children. So are you ready? The doctor asked. As Blake nodded, the power cut out casting everyone into darkness. Because they were in the middle of the hospital, there were no windows to allow light in, and the room was pitch black. Mommy? Blake asked, unable to hide the fear in his voice. The bravery he had displayed moments ago vanished, along with the light. It's okay, Maggie answered. And she fumbled through the darkness toward her son until she grabbed hold of his shoulder. He immediately tucked himself closer to her side. That's strange, the doctor said. The backup generator isn't coming online. One of the nurses reached for her phone and tried to turn on the flashlight app, but it wouldn't work. How is that possible? The nurse asked. I just charged it. It took a moment for Maggie to put all the pieces together, but between the phones not working, and the backup generator failing, she could only come to one possible conclusion about what had happened. Someone had detonated an EMP device, which had shut off all electrical equipment that used a microchip, along with the power grid. And Maggie knew it was only a matter of time before everybody's confusion transformed into full-blown panic. At that moment, Maggie needed to make a decision. The longer they stayed at the hospital, the more they would be exposed to the chaos about to unfold. She could already hear the rumblings of panic and dissent echo through the hallways as the machines keeping people alive suddenly turned off. 
and families were suddenly disconnected from their loved ones via their phones. And as people became injured and hurt in the streets after being in car accidents, with their vehicles shutting down, the hospital would be full of new patients searching for answers. With a hospital staff ill-prepared to handle the influx of injured people with limited resources. Maggie knew what she had to do. We need to set this bone now, Maggie said, grabbing the doctor's attention. It was still too dark to see anything in detail, but Maggie's eyes slowly adjusted to the darkness, and she saw the doctor's silhouette. We don't have the necessary tools to do it here, the doctor said. I can't set his bone in the dark. I thought I was going to sleep, Blake asked, suddenly worried. Maggie knew her son would be in significantly more pain. By having the doctor set the bone without anesthesia, but the faster they set it, the sooner they could get out of there. She needed to take her son home to be with her family. That was priority number one. I think we have some flashlights in the supply closet, Darlene said. I can grab them and then I can meet you in the operating room. Everything is already set up. Maggie could see the doctor better now. He was concerned about performing the procedure, but he also heard the screams and cries of everybody in the hospital. There might not be a better time to do this than now. Okay, the doctor answered. We can get this done as fast as possible. Blake immediately tugged on Maggie's pant leg, worried about what would happen next. But Maggie calmed her son. Blake, listen to me, Maggie said, looking her son in the eyes, of which she could only see the whites around his pupils. We're going to fix your arm and then we'll leave. But I'm still going to sleep, right? Blake asked. No, sweetie, I'm sorry, Maggie answered. Blake whimpered, growing more anxious. Mom, I don't want to do this. Please don't make me do this, please. Blake's cries were daggers in Maggie's heart. All she wanted to do for him was take away the pain. But there was no easy solution. It'll be over quickly, Maggie said, trying to stay positive. And I'll be right here with you, I promise. I'm not going anywhere, okay? I'm staying right by your side. Blake clung to his mother's words but it would take all of her son's strength to get through the operation. Once Darlene collected all the flashlights in the storage closet, they walked to the operating room where the doctor awaited them. When Maggie escorted her son down the hallway, they saw the staff running around, trying to save everybody they could. But the sudden and unexpected power outage had already claimed lives. And Maggie knew this was only the beginning. Once in the operating room, Maggie helped lift Blake onto the operating table, and the doctor gently laid Blake back on a pillow. Okay, Blake, the doctor said. We're going to set the bone and then place two pins inside to ensure it stays in place until the bone is healed. Then we will put a cast around your arm to keep it protected until it's fully healed. It was all Blake could do to muster a quick nod, but it was clear to Maggie that he was terrified. I promise we will do this as fast as possible, the doctor said. And I'll be right next to you the entire time, Maggie said, hoping to reassure her son. Again, Blake nodded and lay back down on the operating table. They removed his shirt and the wrap. Maggie saw how the bone was bent inside the arm. It was a gruesome sight, but Maggie kept hold of her son's hand. Blake remained tense as the doctors prepared all the necessary medical equipment. It was hard for anyone to concentrate with all the screaming and yelling inside the hospital. Everything's going to be okay, Maggie said, desperately seeking to reassure her son. Blake nodded, and then the doctor approached his arm. I'll use some numbing cream on the point of contact where we'll be putting the pins to keep the bones set, the doctor explained. Hopefully that will help ease some of the pain. Okay, Blake nodded and winced as the doctor applied the cream. Maggie wished the doctor would speed it up, but she didn't want to rush him into making a mistake. The doctor poked the spots along Blake's arm where he applied the numbing cream. Do you feel that? No, Blake answered. 
Good, the doctor replied. Then he nodded to the nurses around him. Okay, Blake, we'll set the bone now. Blake stiffened and his breathing quickened. I don't want to do this. Honey, it's okay, Maggie said reassuringly. Tightly holding her son's good hand. This has to be done. But I don't want to, Blake cried. This will be over in no time at all, the doctor said. And then the nurses gathered around Blake to hold him down, which only worsened the boy's anxiety on the count of three. Blake continued to whimper, glancing at his mother. Seeing him so afraid and in so much pain broke Maggie's heart. But this was necessary. One, the doctor said. Please don't, Blake said, hyperventilating. Two, the doctor replied. It's okay, son, Maggie said. Three. Chapter three. Everybody get back to work, Meadows barked, furious over the fact that people were simply standing around and doing nothing. The tools won't work, one of the workers said. I don't care about your excuses, Meadows answered. Everybody has to maintain their schedules. I don't care if it's the apocalypse. Everybody finishes their work today. John stood off to the side in the parking lot, where he first realized that an EMP had been detonated. It was clear to him that nobody would be working on this project for quite some time. There was a storm coming and nothing to stop it, no matter how loud Meadows screamed or how many threats he made. There was a sense of unease amongst everyone. Meadows was losing his grip on control and the crew questioned whether they should leave. But John already knew the answer. Everybody needs to go home, John said. Unlike when Meadows spoke, everyone looked at John when he opened his mouth. He was relatively quiet on the job, but whenever he spoke, people always listened. His words were held in high regard. But Meadows didn't take to John's interference kindly. Before anybody else could step forward and ask questions, Meadows quickly confronted John. You no longer work for this company, Meadows said. So why don't you get in your truck and leave? John glanced at the parking lot and saw the mix of modern trucks and cars sitting uselessly in the vacant lot. Based on his assessment, his was the only vehicle that had survived the EMP. I'm heading to the hospital, John said, looking past Meadows to the rest of them. Anybody who needs a ride into the city, I can drop off on the way. But I'm warning everybody that the longer you stay in populated areas, the worse the situation will deteriorate. The power is shut off everywhere. No power, no cell phones, no transportation. I don't know if it's simply the city, the state, or the entire country, but one thing is for certain. Once people start to realize the power isn't coming back on, they will become violent. John's blatant explanation surprised everyone, including Meadows. They all wore expressions of disbelief, and John didn't blame them. None of them had studied this sort of event, let alone heard of an EMP before today. But John had prepared. He spent the past five years building a shelter in the country to act as a secure location for his family to retreat, should the city ever collapse. It wasn't completely finished, but it would keep his family safe. How do you know the power isn't going to come back on? One of the men asked. The EMP or electromagnetic pulse fried everything with a computer chip, John answered. And because everything runs on computers these days, that means no more cell phones, no more cars, and no more power. We can rebuild, but until that point comes, society will be in chaos. Everybody was paying attention to John now, even Meadows, who had always maintained a good poker face. A few of the workers started to walk away, heading toward their cars and confirmed they wouldn't start. Once people realized they no longer had any transportation, that was when the situation started to spiral out of control. All the workers came to John, begging him to take them home. But John could only take those who were heading deeper into the city. 
he needed to get to the hospital and find his wife and son. Okay, everybody back up, Jake said, his voice cracking like thunder. John already said he could take who he could take and no more. Everybody else, I suggest you start walking home immediately. Everybody backed down after Jake intervened. John was thankful to have a friend to watch his back. Grab as much water and non-perishable food items as you can find, John answered. And if you or any of your loved ones require any medication to survive, I would suggest going to the pharmacy immediately and getting as much of it as you can. I don't know how long this blackout is going to last, but it's not something that's going to be fixed in the next week. That caused even more panic among the group. The more workers who evacuated the area, the more meadows started to unravel. This is all a bunch of nonsense, Meadows said. This guy is simply trying to scare you, but there is nothing wrong. I'm gonna get in touch with the office and we're going to have some generators brought out with some new tools. And everybody can get back to work. It's business as usual. But as Meadows turned away in his attempt to call the office, he could do nothing as his phone was already dead. He stared at the blank screen before he finally tossed the device onto the ground and crushed it with the boot of his heel. Despite everything that Meadows had done, and the nightmare he had been to work with. John knew Meadows had a family. He was married with two young children. And if John recalled correctly, they lived in the heart of the city. John walked up to him, offering an olive branch. I can give you a ride closer to downtown, John said. It would be good for you to be with your family during this time. I know they would want to see you. Meadows looked at John with an expression of disbelief. How is any of this even possible? John imagined there would be several people asking those questions in the coming days, weeks, and months. But he didn't have the time to explain all the nuances of what could happen after an EMP was detonated. He needed to get moving. We have room, John said. But despite John's offer to Meadows, the man's pride couldn't accept the help. Get out of here. Meadows said, as of this moment, you no longer work for this company. John could have been angry, and he could have said some things he would have regretted. But he knew Meadows was only afraid. He couldn't comprehend and come to terms with what was happening, so he lashed out. John returned to the truck where Jake and a few others had gathered. The construction site was nearly abandoned with only a few people sticking around with Meadows. But John didn't believe they would stick around for much longer. Why did you even offer to give him a ride? Jake asked. Some people just need a little bit of grace, John answered. And some people need a swift kick in the ass, Jake replied. So what's the plan? We need to get to the hospital as quickly as possible, John answered. From there, we'll leave the city. What about Sydney? Jake asked. Sydney was John's oldest daughter. She was working on a farm as part of an agricultural program. She dreamed of owning her own farm one day, and so she split her time between her high school work and work at the farm. She'd gotten to the point where she was mostly working on the farm, and had even toyed with the idea of getting her GED so she could work in agriculture full time. But Sydney was well beyond the city limits. She was safer than them at the moment. Sydney will be fine, John answered. We need to get to Blake and Maggie. And they're the ones who need our help the most. Right, okay, Jake answered. John glanced behind him at the folks who had decided to come with them. He hoped he hadn't bitten off more than he could chew. Because he believed the world was not ready for the chaos the EMP was about to unleash. Chapter four. The moment the other construction workers were piled into the back of the truck, John drove away from the work site and toward the highway, where it was clear that the catastrophe the EMP had created was already affecting everyone. There were no working cars on the road, creating obstacles for John to maneuver around. He saw everybody stepping out of their vehicles, 
lifting the front of the hoods, checking their engines. But nobody knew the extent of the damage, because if they did, John suspected they wouldn't be so calm. My God, Jake said, surveying the damage as he rode shotgun. I haven't seen anything like this before. It's like a parking lot out here. The congestion is only going to get worse the closer we move to the city center, John said, maneuvering around a disabled semi-truck. Our vehicle is going to move faster than anybody else, but it's also going to put a target on our back. John had already seen the way people were looking at him as he drove past. It was a mixture of confusion and envy, along with a hint of desperation. The moment people were so desperate that it had overpowered their moral sense of duty. That was when society reached the tipping point. And John feared what people would do if they lost their humanity. Most of the construction workers who hitched a ride in the truck bed lived on the outskirts of the city in the suburbs. As they dropped people off at their homes, John noticed the crowds on the front lawns. Residents were treating the power outage like a holiday. They were grilling out, trying to use up the food before it spoiled in the fridge. Others drank beer, laughing and joking around. But none of them had any idea of how dangerous the world was about to become. None of them could fathom the power not coming back on. None of them realized that all the grocery stores within the area had lost power and all the food would spoil and rot. Help wasn't coming. And even if they could get their cars working, it was unlikely they would be able to maneuver through the thousands of stalled vehicles on the highway. John studied the smiling faces and couldn't help but imagine how many of these neighbors would turn on each other within the coming days. The last guy they dropped off was Tony, a young man with a newborn. Thanks for the ride, John, Tony said. No problem, John replied. Tony lingered by John's truck. It was clear there was something else on his mind. Is it as bad as I think it's gonna be? Tony asked. John was careful about how he replied. He didn't want to sugarcoat the situation. It's gonna be difficult, John said. But if you can convince everybody to start conserving their food and water, then things will be better for you in the long run. If things get really bad, get your family out of any populated areas. Pack everyone a bag of supplies with enough food and water to sustain you for at least three days and a weapon to protect you and your family. Be ready to leave at a moment's notice because you never know when people are gonna turn on you. Tony nodded, the color draining from his cheeks. He understood what John was telling him though both men prayed it wouldn't come to that. Once everybody was dropped off in the suburbs, John returned to the interstate and began their final push into the city. I think you scared Tony, Jake said. <laughs> scared me too. People need to understand that this isn't a game, John said. And by the time they realize what is truly happening after there is no more fresh water to drink, all the food in the fridge is spoiled and their children and loved ones are hungry. And they will become angry, and they will direct that anger toward anybody who might have resources to spare. Is that why you and Maggie bought the property in the middle of nowhere? Jake asked. It's one of the reasons, John answered. We also enjoy the outdoors and the privacy that kind of life provides. It's peaceful in nature, and there is a sense of pride in doing things for yourself. Jake nodded. I suppose I should have gotten some of that land out there too. You'll always have a place in our house, John said. You are our family. Jake repressed a smile and then playfully punched John in the arm. Don't get all soft on me now, big John. But the expression didn't last. I wonder if Sarah's okay. Sarah was Jake's younger sister. She lived in Cleveland. Her husband had died a few years ago, leaving her with three kids to raise on her own. Jake had been helping her out financially, sending money whenever he could. Without him, Sarah wouldn't have been able to take care of those kids. 
I'm sure she's all right, John said, trying to soothe Jake's worries. She's out of the city, and we don't know if Cleveland was affected by the EMP or not. Yeah, Jake said, staring at his blank phone. Wish I could call her. John continued to drive, weaving between the stalled cars. As the skyline drew closer, the road became more crowded, just as he had predicted. The normal noise of the city was replaced by an eerie silence. I never thought I'd see the day when Cincinnati was quiet, Jake said. This is unbelievable. But while Jake was concerned about the silence of the city, John was growing more concerned about the number of people along the side of the road. The increase in the number of abandoned vehicles also brought an increase in people standing outside their cars. The sun was starting to get hotter as it rose higher in the sky, and with the increased heat, it was undoubtedly going to cause more pressure on those who were stuck on the highway. John saw bystanders eyeing his truck with envy. More than one person tried flagging him down, but John kept driving. You don't want to stop and take a look around? Jake asked. John had only helped out earlier because he knew the men he worked with. John didn't know these strangers, and judging by their desperation, he didn't believe it was a wise decision to stop. Even though it was hard to drive past so many who needed help, John's family was his priority. Getting to them was paramount. He wasn't going to sacrifice his family's safety for a group of strangers. Not if he had a choice. John continued navigating through the dense traffic along the highway, worried he wouldn't be able to go much further. He was barely doing 30 miles per hour, following a serpentine path. The only other option would be for him to ride along the shoulder of the highway. But that was where most people were standing around. Well, Jake said, looks like we have a situation up ahead. John saw the group of people who had created a massive blockade along the highway. Most people had their backs turned, staring at something on the road. The sight of so many people in the area worried John. What do you want to do? Jake asked. John considered his options. None of them were good. If he tried to move through the large group of people, they could be easily overrun by the large crowd, not to mention the possibility that some of them could be armed. John had a sidearm with him, but he wasn't in the mood to shed blood. We remain calm and try to go around, John answered. But the closer they neared the blockade, the more attention they drew. Each pair of eyes looked at John and his truck with desperation. A few of the people from the group broke off and started running over to John, waving their hands in the air. Unable to push through the crowd without killing people, John was forced to stop. The woman who came to John's driver's side door was red-faced and sweaty. She was accompanied by five others, a mix of men and women, all of them exhausted from baking in the sun. Thank God you're here, the woman said. We have a woman going into labor and we need to get her to the hospital. John glanced over at the group of people and couldn't see the woman they were speaking of. How far along is she? Nobody really knows, the woman answered. But she's in severe pain and it seems like the contractions are closer together and more frequent. John remembered the birth of his two children. He was with his wife when she gave birth, and he remembered how daunting the task was. I'm heading to the hospital myself, John said. If you can help her get over here and clear a path, I can take her. The woman smiled. Thank you so much for doing this. Nobody was sure what to do, and nobody can get a signal on their phone. She then frowned and examined the inside of the cabin. How is it that your truck is working? But every other car on the road won't start. John didn't want to get into the details of how his truck didn't use a computer chip controlled fuel injection system. So he simply shrugged. Just lucky, I guess, John said. Eventually, the crowd parted, 
and a group of men helped the pregnant woman over to the truck. Jake got out and allowed the woman to ride shotgun while he rode in the truck bed. Thank you so much, the woman said, her bangs glued to her forehead with sweat. And then she winced from another contraction. Has your water broken? John asked. The woman shook her head. But the contractions have definitely intensified. Just as she finished speaking, another contraction came, and she grabbed John's hand and squeezed tight. She had an iron grip, but John didn't let go. The woman needed a pillar of support. And if he could be that for this woman, then so be it. We're going to get you to the hospital, John said, doing his best to sound reassuring. Thank you, the woman replied focusing on her breathing. John looked over at the crowd and gestured for them to move. A few of them stepped aside, but others refused. Some of us need to get to our families, one man said. He was dressed in a business suit, his tie slack, and the top button of his shirt was undone. He was soaked through his dress shirt with sweat. Yeah, another woman said eagerly. I need to go to my parents. They're retired and I need to get them their medication. And then the floodgates opened. And everybody was screaming at John, begging him to take them with him. Without warning, people piled in the back of the truck. Jake pushed a few back, but there was only so much he could do against so many people. The situation was getting out of control and John knew if they stayed in this position for much longer, they would be overrun. John laid on the horn, and the people in front of the truck jumped back out of surprise. But the space created a narrow enough opening for John to escape, and he pressed on the gas. Everybody pounded on the side of the truck, screaming at John. And then as he was driving away, somebody opened fire. The gunshots peppered the tailgate and blew out the left rear tire. It was all John could do to keep control of the truck. But between the number of stalled vehicles on the road and the angry mob chasing him, combined with his busted tire, he lost control. John crashed into a sports car and the airbags exploded. Ears ringing and his vision in a blur, John was dragged out of the truck and thrown to the pavement but he managed to keep his wits about him and looked up in time to see that they were pulling the pregnant woman from the passenger seat. John instinctively reached for his pistol and fired a single shot into the air. The gunshot was far more effective than the car horn and sent people running. When the crowds cleared, John returned to the truck, which was now totaled. He pulled the pregnant woman from the passenger seat keeping everyone back with the threat of his pistol. Jake, John shouted, unable to locate his friend. Jake, we need to go. Eventually, John noticed Jake struggling to step down from the truck bed. It wasn't until John saw the blood on Jake's hands that he realized something was wrong. J John, Jake said, his voice weak. I don't think I'm gonna make it. A bullet had struck Jake's gut. Between Jake's wound and the pregnant woman, John wasn't sure how he was going to get to the hospital. But he refused to leave anybody behind. Chapter five. Blake screamed when the bone was snapped back into place. In all the years Maggie had been a mother, she had never heard her son scream in pain like that before. He bucked so wildly on the operating table that the nurse barely held him down. Keep him still, the doctor shouted. We need to get the pins in place to ensure the bone heals properly. As the doctor worked, Maggie helped the nurses keep her son from moving. Blake kicked and screamed, but Maggie knew this was necessary. When the doctors finally pushed the screws into the bone, Blake screamed louder than he'd ever done. And then he passed out. We can give him an IV when we're done, 
the doctor said, noticing Maggie's distress. The most important thing right now is ensuring we finish. As hard as it had been to watch her son scream in agony, Maggie was partially glad that Blake had passed out. At least now he wasn't crying anymore. But there were dangers in allowing her son's system to become overloaded from shock. To ensure Blake didn't slip into cardiac arrest, Maggie placed her finger on her son's wrist to track his pulse. So long as Maggie still felt that solid thump against her finger, she knew he was okay. The doctor worked quickly, and once the screws were in place, he hurried to stitch up the wound. The stitch work was hastily done and would leave a scar, but the marks were a small price to pay for fixing the arm. Once the insertion points were closed, the doctor started to put on the cast, and Darlene wheeled over an IV to get ready to put it into his arm. But just before either of them could finish, another nurse rushed into the operating room in a frenzied panic. We just received a lot of people involved in a bus accident. We need staff to assess trauma victims and clear all of the operating rooms. The doctor nodded and started packing up the room before he was finished wrapping Blake's arm. Where are you going? Maggie asked. There are other people who need help, the doctor answered, already heading toward the door. You can finish the wrap yourself. When the doctors and nurses hurried out of the room, Maggie finished the cast on her son's arm. She wanted to get out of the hospital as quickly as possible. Done with the cast, Maggie scooped Blake up in her arms and headed toward the door. Her son was far heavier than she had anticipated, and there was no other way to move him. When Maggie entered the hallway, she searched for a wheelchair, but the building was in chaos. People rushed past her, hospital staff and pedestrians, none of whom were paying attention to where they were going. More than once, Maggie was nearly knocked over, but she managed to stay on her feet, keeping her son close to her chest. Maggie eventually found an empty wheelchair and set Blake in it. She made sure to strap him down so he wouldn't fall over and then pushed him through the hallways. When Maggie and Blake reached the emergency room, the lobby was packed with people coming in from the streets. They were crammed shoulder to shoulder, blocking the exit. Everybody was shouting, screaming, and begging for help that wasn't coming. Maggie tried her best to push through, but there were just too many bodies. She tried shoving a few people out of the way, but when they shoved back, she feared they would hurt her son in the process. Just when Maggie thought she was running out of options, an opportunity presented itself. Step aside, step aside, move now. Maggie couldn't see who was shouting, but he had an authoritative voice and the crowd slowly parted. She wheeled her son closer to get a better look, and she found a man dressed in a suit and tie with a gun in one hand and a badge in the other, pulling along another man in handcuffs. I'm Special Agent Mark Willow, he said, barely able to catch his breath. I'm transferring this man to a federal prison and I was injured in a car wreck on my way there. Maggie saw the wound on the agent's abdomen, but there were no nurses around to help him, none but her. I can help, Maggie said. All I need is for you to give me a ride out of the city. Agent Willow glanced down at Blake, still unconscious in the wheelchair. I'm transporting a very dangerous criminal, Agent Willow said. Escorting a child with me isn't the best idea. I can help you, Maggie said. All I ask is that you help me too. With no one else stepping up to help, Willow had little choice but to accept Maggie's deal. Follow me, Maggie said. Maggie pushed Blake ahead of her, and Agent Willow and his prisoner followed her into a nearby room. She set Blake in the back, away from the prisoner. And Agent Willow shoved the prisoner into a nearby chair. Stay, Willow said, pointing the gun at the prisoner. Maggie grabbed what supplies she could find in the room and then cut open the agent's shirt to expose the wound. Have you heard anything about what happened? 
No, Willis said. All communications are down, so I'm alone out here. Maggie didn't want to reveal too much about what she knew of the EMP. Whenever people talked to her about preparing for an event like this, they looked at her as if she was crazy. But she thought Agent Willow might know what set off the EMP device. I wasn't sure whether or not you had heard about any type of terrorist activity, Maggie said. Willow shook his head. I'm afraid I don't work in the anti-terrorist department. I work in the banking department. He glanced over at the prisoner, who was still nearby and in handcuffs. It was then that Maggie finally recognized the prisoner. He was the bank robber whose picture had been plastered all over the news. Dylan Elliott had robbed Cincinnati Federal Reserve Bank, stealing over 100 million, which was never recovered. Maggie reached for a small knife and started cutting the line to stitch up the wound. Whatever had stuck Agent Willow hadn't hit any vital organs, but without the proper medical technology, it was impossible to know for sure. Maggie cut the line and then set the knife aside. But when she did, she had her back turned to the prisoner. And with Agent Willow having his guard down, the prisoner pounced. The bank robber lunged forward, grabbed Maggie, and removed the pistol she had in the back of her waistband. Before Agent Willow had a shot, the bank robber used Maggie as a human shield. Drop it or I kill her, the bank robber said. Let her go, Dylan, Willow said. I mean it. I know you do, but so do I, Dylan replied. Do you really want to test me? Maggie had taken a few self-defense classes, but the prisoner was stronger than she had anticipated. She tried kicking and throwing a few elbows, but neither worked. Finally, Willow lowered his weapon. Okay, Dylan, just let her go and you can walk free. Handcuff keys, Dylan said. Toss them over to her. Agent Willow complied and then tossed them so Maggie could easily catch them. Dylan then forced Maggie to set him free. Oh, that's better, Dylan said. There's nothing worse in this life than being restrained. He smiled at Maggie, unless you're into that sort of thing. Maggie winced and again tried to break free, but was unsuccessful. Let her go, Dylan, Willow said. We had a deal. Yes, but unfortunately, I changed my mind, Dylan said. Dylan squeezed the trigger, and the gunshot brought even more screams and chaos in the hospital. But all Maggie saw was the shock and pain on Agent Willow's face. Dylan had hit him in the gut, right next to the wound Maggie had been stitching up. Agent Willow collapsed into the chair and pressed his hands against the wound to stop the bleeding. But he was already too weak. Eventually, Willow passed out and lay motionless in the chair. Now that's finished, Dylan said, turning toward Maggie. You have a choice. What choice? Maggie asked. Dylan's voice had a disgustingly playful tone and he aimed the gun at Maggie's head. I need a hostage. All good bank robbers take one. Maggie gestured to the hallway. Take your pick. No, not them, Dylan said. It's either you, and then he aimed the gun at Blake, or him. Maggie rushed over to her son, using herself as a human shield to protect him. No, Maggie said. I told you I have to take someone, he replied. Not him, Maggie said. The bank robber stepped closer, and Maggie took one step back. I take you or I take your son, it's your choice. Maggie didn't know much about this man. She had not followed the news about his arrest, but he was clearly dangerous. The deal won't be on the table much longer. Dylan said. What will it be? Leaving Blake here alone was dangerous, but allowing her son to go with this man wasn't an option. 
She had told John they were heading to the hospital the last time they spoke. Her husband would come here first. Me, Maggie said. I will go with you. I was hoping you would say that, Dylan said. I'll let you say your goodbyes. Blake was still unconscious, but he was still breathing. Leaving him here wasn't ideal, but she had no other options. She did not doubt Dylan would hurt her son for his gain, and if she could step in and take his place, that's precisely what she would do. Maggie leaned close to Blake's ear and whispered, I love you so much, and I will find a way back to you. She sealed the promise with a kiss on her son's head and reluctantly turned around. What did you tell him? Dylan asked. None of your business, she answered. Dylan laughed, grabbed her arm, and pulled her close as he firmly pressed the gun against her stomach. This is gonna be fun, he said. Maggie disagreed, but didn't fight back as he pulled her toward the exit doors. But while she left willingly, the moment they were out of the hospital, Maggie would do everything she could to return to her son. And if that meant killing Dylan, then that's what she would do. Chapter Six The moment John saw the gunshot wound in Jake's abdomen, he rushed to his friend and caught him before he hit the ground. Jake was already cold and sweaty, his skin clammy to the touch. He was losing blood, and John immediately removed his work shirt and pressed it against the wound to help stop the bleeding. I don't feel too good, buddy, Jake said. Everything is gonna be okay, John said. But as he spoke, he noticed the chaos around him. Everyone was only out to save themselves. John glanced behind him and saw the pregnant woman leaning against a blue Mercedes as she struggled with her contractions. He couldn't leave her here, but couldn't carry her into the city. It was nearly impossible, but John had never shied away from a challenge or left somebody who needed help. Hang on, John said. John rushed back to the truck, which was totaled, but all his survival gear was still inside. He ripped open the driver's door and reached for the hidden compartment beneath. After John salvaged his supplies, he returned to his friend and started to clean and dress the wound. Upon closer inspection of the gunshot, John saw it had gone all the way through. The bullet is not inside of you, John said. That's a good thing. It doesn't feel like a good thing, Jake said. It's good that you still have your sense of humor, John said. I'm gonna clean the wound and then get you stitched up and then we need to move. This is gonna sting. Jake screamed when John poured the antiseptic over the wound. It feels like my heart is gonna pop out of my chest, Jake said. John checked Jake's pulse and felt it racing, but there was little he could do. All that mattered was stitching up the wound and getting Jake stabilized enough to where they could move him. Jake swore and grunted as John stitched up the bullet hole. I don't think I've heard you swear like that since your divorce, John said. Yeah, well, the divorce was more painful than this, Jake said. Almost done, John said. John finished the stitch work, which was ugly, but the bleeding had stopped. After that, he placed fresh bandages over the wound to guard it from infection. And then he left Jake with a bottle of water as he tended to the pregnant woman. How are you doing back there? John asked. The woman was sitting down now, her back against the same blue Mercedes as before. I don't know how much longer I'm gonna last, she said. I feel like he's gonna come any minute now. I need to see how far along you are and if you're dilated, John said. That requires me being slightly invasive. John didn't know how else to say it without appearing perverted, but he decided that keeping it professional and clinical was the best course of action. Okay, she said. Both of Maggie's pregnancies were home births, so John knew a little about the process. Okay, 
It looks like you're only about two or three centimeters dilated, John said. The good news is that you still have some time before the baby will come. The bad news is your contractions are only going to get worse. Great, she said. What's your name? John asked. Pam, she answered. Okay, Pam, we need to get you to the hospital as quickly as possible, John said. Pam shook her head. I can't even stand up. I don't think I'm going to make it. Pam, listen to me, John said. If you want your baby to survive, you must get on your feet. I'm not leaving you. I'll be there to help you every step of the way, but we need to move now. The mention of her baby's life prompted Pam to find an inner strength she didn't know she had and forced herself to stand. How far is the hospital? Pam asked. Best if you don't know, John said. <laughs> Great, Pam replied. Now that John was confident Pam would make it, he needed to figure out how to get Jake to the hospital because he doubted his friend would make it. Can you walk? John asked. Jake had always been a prideful man, so he nodded when he saw Pam, who was in active labor walking toward them. But when John helped Jake to his feet, he couldn't stand up straight. He was forced to hunch as he hobbled forward and gained momentum. I've got this, Jake said. Once everyone was on their feet, John guided them down the highway toward the city, joining the masses who wandered aimlessly. John wanted to warn all of them, to tell them it was a mistake to go into the city, but he didn't have time for that. He was only headed into that chaos to get his wife and son. Once he had both of them, he'd be gone. When they neared the city limits, it was clear that insanity had taken control of Cincinnati. Stores had been looted, cars lit on fire and overturned. What little order had been holding society together had vanished the moment the power turned off. It was unlike anything John had seen before and anything he'd see again. They were witnessing the collapse of society. Come on, John said steering Jake and Pam through the madness. We need to stay off the main streets and away from large crowds. John guided them down a side road, and they moved between the buildings, doing everything they could to stay out of the limelight. People were their greatest threat. It's like the entire city is about to explode, Jake said. A few other people traveled the back streets, rushing past them in opposite directions or hurrying past them to wherever they were going. But regardless of their direction, John noticed how all of them were unsure of what they were doing, and no one was confident about what came next. The world had an uncertain future, and most people chose violence in the face of that uncertainty. How much farther? Pam asked, clutching her stomach as she pushed through another contraction. We're close, John answered. We just need to keep moving. They made good time. And just when John believed they were about to be in the clear, they turned the wrong corner. Well, 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 what do we have here? The man was big, burly, and had tattoos on his arm. He was flanked by three other men, one on his left and two on his right, each just as menacing as the one before. We don't want any trouble, John said, knowing that Jake and Pam were vulnerable in their current condition. Well, you found it anyway, the man said. The four of them were blocking the alleyway, and when John glanced behind him, he saw the chaos on the streets. It wasn't ideal to backtrack, but he wouldn't put Pam and Jake's lives at risk. John glanced at Pam and kept his voice low. Turn around and find a place to hide. Move as fast as you can, I'll find you. Pam nodded, clearly frightened, but propelled by the desire to keep her unborn child alive. Where do you think you're going, sweetheart? The leader asked. She's not your concern, Jake replied. John wished Jake would have kept quiet. Now wasn't the time for escalation. 
Oh, she is now, the leader said. The group moved forward, and John saw the weapons in their hands. It was a mixture of baseball bats and crowbars, but John didn't see any firearms. Wait, John said, taking one step back. But it would be the only ground he would give up. I'm giving you a chance to walk away. We don't have to do this. The group of men laughed. They were high on the bloodlust of hurting people. They'd allowed the world's madness to soak into their thoughts and minds. And John didn't believe he could say anything to get them to stop. But he had to try. You're gonna be fun to beat up on, the leader said. No, John answered, I'm not. Part of John's survivalist preparation involved self-defense. He had never learned how to fight to hurt people, only to defend himself and others. John didn't want bloodshed, but these men had forced his hand. John never let any of them even get close to him and Jake. He removed his pistol and aimed at the leader, firing only once. The bullet struck the man in the chest, dead center, and he died instantly. The moment their leader dropped to the ground, John held his position. The others looked at their fallen leader and then at each other. It was clear that none of them had expected John to shoot. They had thought he was soft. He wasn't, but he wasn't a killer either. Go, John said, growling his final warning. The others hesitated a moment, but the second that one of them retreated, the others did the same. Once they were long gone, John lowered the weapon and released a shaky breath. You should have killed them all, Jake said. Maybe Jake was right, but it took all of John's strength to take one life. He didn't want to take any more. I'll find Pam, John said, stay here. John walked away before Jake protested. But once his back turned, he glanced down at his hand and saw it trembling. The thought had not crossed his mind for 40 years, and he had never killed anyone. He became a farmer because he wanted to feed people, to keep them alive. And now he had blood on his hands, and he feared it would never wash off. John eventually found Pam hiding down another intersection of an alleyway, and he helped her up off the ground. The contractions are getting longer, Pam said worried. We're close, John said. It was a bit of fudging the truth, but it was for the best. He needed to keep everyone's spirits up. With so much crumbling around them, it was easy to lose hope, especially given how much pain they were all in. Pam and Jake nearly collapsed into tears when they finally reached the hospital, both from relief and the state of the facility, which was completely overrun. And while John was concerned with ensuring his friends received help, he had also come here to find his wife and son. John pushed through the dense crowd, forcing a path for Jake and Pam until they finally reached the front desk, which was no longer operating. We need to find someone to help, John said. Get someone for Pam first, Jake said. I'll be all right. John nodded and then helped his friends sit down. I'll be back. The madhouse of the hospital was chaos incarnate. Everywhere John looked, people were bleeding, crying, dying, or all three. He had never seen anything like it in all his years. It was like the entire city had been bombed. But while John didn't know who had set off the EMP, it was clear the destruction had been caused by the masses. Everybody had panicked and society had spiraled out of control. John grabbed hold of the nearest nurse. I need your help, I have a pregnant lady in the lobby who's about to give birth. Where is she? The nurse asked. John guided the nurse back to the front lobby, ensuring she didn't get distracted. Thankfully, no one stopped them. And when Pam saw help arrive, she burst into tears. Thank you, Pam said, as the nurse guided her away. Thank you so much. John was glad Pam was getting the help she needed. But he still had Jake to worry about. 
and needed to find his wife and son. Did you see Maggie or Blake? Jake asked. No, John answered, standing in the center of the madness. People rushed around him like pouring water breaking on a rock. It's gonna be impossible to find them here. Just start yelling, Jake said. Good as plan as any, John said. Maggie, Blake. But no matter how loud John shouted, he couldn't break above the noise of the ER room. There was nothing he could do to make this easier for all of them. And when Jake started to cough and wince, John returned to help his friend. God, something's not right, Jake said, wincing. Let's take a look at the bandage, John said. But when John pulled up Jake's shirt, he saw a massive bulge around the wound the size of an apple. That doesn't look good, Jake said. No, it's not, John said, realizing that the wound was most likely creating a blood sac, which would need to be drained quickly. Hang on, I'll be back. Yep, not going anywhere, Jake said. John rushed through the hospital again to search for a nurse. But then John came across a familiar face. Darlene, John shouted. Darlene was hunched over a clipboard, staring at it with intensity. And it took her a moment to look up to see John nearby. And then it clicked for her. John, what are you doing here? Darlene asked. Blake broke his arm and Maggie told me she was coming here, John said. Where are they? I, I don't know, Darlene said, flabbergasted. They were here, but then I lost them. Where was the last time you saw them? John asked. It was evident that Darlene had a lot on her plate, but John didn't take no for an answer. Darlene, please, John said. I need to find them. Darlene finally nodded, and John followed her through the hallways, closer to the ER lobby where they entered. The operating room was there, Darlene said. Blake passed out when they set his bone. John figured the power must have already been out when they had worked on Blake's arm. He couldn't imagine how difficult that must have been for his son to go through. And for Maggie to watch. I, I don't know where they went after that, Darlene said. It's okay, thank you, John said. And Jake's here, he needs help. Jake? Darlene asked, showing the first sign of surprise. Well, what happened? He was shot on the way over, John answered. I stitched up the wound, but I think he has some internal bleeding. John managed to get Darlene over to Jake to help him. He'd always believed that Darlene had a crush on Jake, and he hoped to take advantage of it for Jake's sake. Once Jake was in good hands, he continued his search for Maggie and Blake, shouting their names, checking in rooms, and searching high and low to find them. But John's ears perked up at a familiar voice among the chaos and cries. It was faint and muffled, almost like it was behind closed doors. John followed the noise to a room down a darkened hallway and opened the door to find his son sitting in a wheelchair with a cast on his arm and a man sitting in a chair next to him with blood over his chest and stomach. Blake, John said, rushing to his son and checking him over. Are you all right? I don't know, Blake answered groggily. I just woke up. Where's your mom? John asked. She's not here. The answer came from the man John thought was dead nearby. He was barely clinging to life. His complexion peaked. If you want to find her, you need to keep me alive. Chapter seven. Sydney Carver was never happier than she was when she was out on her horse. There was something special about riding. She was connected to the horse and the world around her in a way that was incomparable to anything else. If it was possible, she'd live her entire life on horseback. She wasn't sure how the horse felt about it, though. Sydney pulled on the reins and slowed to a trot. She gently stroked the animal's neck, thanking the mare for such a fun ride. And she whinnied in response. I know, Sydney said. 
I didn't want to leave either. The stables were close, and Sydney knew it was time to get back to work. She was a senior in high school, but she was part of a special program where she could work on a local farm three days a week, while only attending school for two days. The program was part of a series of fast-track programs for kids who already knew what career path they wanted to follow after graduation. She had chosen to pursue agriculture, and after she had spoken to her parents at length about it, they had agreed the program was the best choice for her and what she wanted to accomplish. From an early age, Sydney loved the outdoors and animals. So pursuing a degree that allowed her to experience both made sense. The only uncertainty that Sydney faced was whether she wanted to go into livestock or grow plants. She had toyed with the idea of doing both, but it would be better if she specialized in one thing to produce on a large scale. But for now, that wasn't an issue, as she was able to take her time and learn every aspect of farming and agriculture she could absorb. She wished she could stay out on the farm full time, but she still needed to finish up a few credits at her high school. Sydney couldn't wait to finish all the high school drama. There were so many things that kids her age were concerned with, and it was all superficial. She had a few close friends, but wasn't popular. But she was fine with that. It was much easier for her to stay out of the limelight because it allowed her to focus on what she wanted. She always felt at peace whenever she worked on the farm. It wasn't a feeling she was able to recreate anywhere else. Here, it was always prevalent, except for right now. The moment Sydney rode Chestnut into the stables, it was obvious something was wrong. Everybody had stopped working and gathered at the front of the stables. She saw the owner, Clark Winsome, addressing all the workers. There was only one other high school student who was part of the program, a boy by the name of Teddy. They got along well enough but Sydney suspected he had a crush on her. She wasn't sure if the only reason he was hanging out in this program was because of her. Because he didn't know much about working a farm even after almost a year of being in the program. Or maybe he didn't like sitting in a classroom. Sydney couldn't blame him for that. Sydney tied up Chestnut, gave her a feed bag, and then approached the circle of workers. Teddy was on the outskirts of the group, and she elbowed him in the arm. What's going on? Sidney asked. Everything's shut down, Teddy answered, keeping his voice quiet while Clark addressed everyone. What do you mean everything's shut down? Sidney asked. Equipment, cars, power, it all shut off, Teddy answered. And then he fished out his cell phone. Even my phone isn't working. Sidney frowned and quickly checked her mobile device just like Teddy's. It refused to power on. It was clear to her that nobody knew what was going on. But Sydney's parents had prepared her for something like this. She just never thought it would ever happen. Are you okay? Teddy asked. Yeah, Sydney answered. And then she pushed her way through the crowd until she was face to face with Mr. Winsome. You need to send everyone home. Clark Winsome was mid-sentence when Sidney interrupted him. We need to figure out a way to turn the power back on so we don't lose the rest of the day. The power isn't coming back on, Sidney said. And our cars and phones aren't going to turn back on either. The group murmured with worry. But Mr. Winsome wasn't someone to give in to hysteria so easily. It's just a power outage, Mr. Winsome answered. No, it's called an EMP, Sidney replied. Mr. Winsome sighed. Sidney, now isn't the time for your parents' conspiracy theories. It's not a conspiracy theory, she said. The EMP destroys any computer circuit within its radius. It's the reason your phones aren't working. And why your cars won't start. Why do you think the old tractors are working, but the newer ones have stopped? It's because the older models don't have a fuel injection controlled by a computer chip. Sydney had gained everybody's attention now, including Mr. Winsome. She turned around and faced the group, 
all of them older by at least a decade, and some of them twice her age. Everybody needs to go home to be with their families, Sydney said. It's impossible to know how widespread this problem is, but until we know for certain, it's best that you gather what resources you can and start rationing food and water. Sydney, there is no need to cause a panic, Mr. Winsome said. I don't want anyone to panic, Sydney said. But I want everybody to ensure that they are as prepared as possible. The more you know what's going on, the less likely you are to panic in an unknown situation. After Sydney finished, everybody in the circle turned to Mr. Winsome. Sydney wasn't sure how he was going to respond. Despite Sydney's passion and her desire to learn, Mr. Winsome had always given her a hard time. She wasn't sure if it was because of her age or if it was just his personality. Okay, Mr. Winsome said. Everybody, head home, and we will see what tomorrow brings. Grab some supplies from the barn. Everybody take some cases of water home with you. Sydney stared at Mr. Winsome with surprise. And as the crowd departed, he glanced at her with a wry smile. You didn't think I'd agree, Mr. Winsome answered. No, Sydney said. Well, you made a good argument, Mr. Winsome replied. And it's not like we can solve all the problems today. Plus, if they are not working, I don't have to pay them. Ah, there it is, Sydney said. Mr. Winsome laughed. Why don't you get home? I'm sure your parents are worried. They're too prepared to be worried about me, Sydney said. I'll finish up with the horses and then head out. It sounds good, Mr. Winsome said. And just before Sydney walked away, he touched her shoulder. You've been doing good work. Keep it up. It was rare for Mr. Winsome to give praise, and she swelled up with pride. Thank you, sir, Sydney said. Mr. Winsome walked away, leaving Sydney alone with her happy thoughts. She was so distracted by the farmer's praise that she didn't notice Teddy was the only one who hadn't walked away with the rest of the group. Hey, Teddy said. I thought I could help you with the horses. Oh, sure, Sidney said, quickly walking past him. The pair hadn't talked much since they didn't work in the same areas of the farm. Teddy was resigned to maintenance, while Sidney was mostly in the fields handling crop management. But Sidney had caught Teddy glancing in her direction more than once. Anytime she caught him staring at her, he quickly looked away. So, Teddy said unsure of what to do. Do we just give them a bath or? Sydney laughed as she went to her locker and grabbed the inside brush kit. All of the farm hands had lockers in the barn. Taped onto the inside of the locker door was a picture of the cabin her family owned well beyond the city limits. It was situated right on the Ohio River and was a beautiful piece of land. Sydney's father had built it with his own two hands and she loved spending time out there. Just below the picture was the first mail delivered to the house. She had kept it as a souvenir, hoping to one day make it their permanent home. Our forever home, her father would say. And she'd written that over the picture of them standing outside the cabin. Sydney grabbed one of the brushes, closed her locker, and then tossed the brush to Teddy as she walked past him. I'll show you how it's done, Sydney said. Teddy clumsily caught the brush and then joined Sydney by chestnut. She showed him how to brush through the hair, and then he mimicked her. See? Sydney asked. She likes it. Good to know, Teddy answered, then cleared his throat. I don't know if your car is working, but I drove my bike over here. It's an old two stroke kickstart. It doesn't have a computer chip, so it should start, right? Sydney smiled. Yes, that's right. Cool. Anyway, I could give you a ride home if you want, Teddy said, failing to sound like he wasn't bothered if she said no. You know, if you want. Sydney shrugged. I could just take one of the horses. You can take these home? Teddy asked. Sydney laughed. You're funny. Teddy smiled. It was genuine. She liked that but the moment was interrupted by gunshots from beyond the barn. 
The horses jumped from the noise of the gunshots, and Sydney immediately reached for her pistol, which she always carried with her when she was out of the house unless she was at school, where concealed carry wasn't allowed. What was that? Teddy asked, concerned. Sydney didn't wait for Teddy to follow her, and she hurried to the front of the barn, ducking low to get a better look at the situation. Teddy eventually joined her, and they both saw a cluster of armed men rounding up the workers, along with Mr. Winsome, before they could reach their cars. Oh my God, Teddy said nervous, and he tried to stand up. Get down, Sidney said, yanking him back to the crouch position with her. We need to move. Before Teddy could reply, Sidney hurried back toward the horses, untying Chestnut, trying to calm her down. What are you doing? Teddy asked. Sidney threw a saddle back onto the horse. We're leaving, come on. Leaving to go where? Teddy asked. Sydney hopped up on the horse and held out her hand. Are you coming or not? Teddy hesitated, but only for a moment. Then he grabbed Sydney's hand, and she hoisted him up onto the horse behind her. Sydney immediately spun the mare around, and they rode out of the barn, getting as far away from the gunmen as possible. But Sydney had no intention of leaving them alone for long. She needed a moment to regroup and figure out what was happening. Chapter Eight The moment Maggie was pulled out of the hospital by Dylan at gunpoint, she expected someone to do something. Dylan wasn't trying to hide the pistol, so she hoped somebody would see the situation and intervene. But the moment she saw the city's chaos, Maggie knew she was on her own. We need to find a working car, Dylan said. Good luck with that. Maggie said, eyeing the fleet of disabled vehicles that covered the roadways. You're not much of an optimist, are you? Dylan asked. Well, that's okay. I've got enough for both of us. You need it when you rob people for a living. Maggie struggled against the same handcuffs that the FBI agent had used to restrain Dylan. She was limited in her mobility, but she needed to find a way to escape to return to the hospital. The farther they separated from the hospital, the less control Maggie had over the situation. Dylan was adamant and persistent in their pursuit of searching for transportation. And while Maggie was hoping he would lose focus, he was unfazed, even as gunshots, explosions, and fires were being set off all around him. If Maggie wanted to escape, she needed a different strategy. Maggie then wondered if she could use the chaos to her advantage. If she could separate herself away from Dylan for just a bit, she could lose herself in the crowds. It would be just as hard for him to catch her as for her to escape. All she needed was to keep as many people between her and the criminal as possible. Maggie glanced around, hoping to find an opportunity, and saw a cluster of people approaching them. They were running from something. The moment Dylan saw the crowd heading their way, it was too late for them to get out of the way. He gripped her arm even harder and pulled her through the masses. But there were so many bodies pushing against them. All Maggie had to do was yank hard in the opposite direction, and she was free. Hey, stop, Dylan shouted, reaching for Maggie. But he missed. Maggie used her strength and determination to plow her way through the crowd putting as much distance as possible between herself and Dylan. People shoved against her hard, and she nearly toppled over twice, which would have killed her if she had been caught under the stampede. But she managed to remain upright. And when she saw the crowd's edge, Maggie believed she had finally won her freedom. The moment Maggie escaped the crowd, she made a beeline toward the hospital but only made it a handful of steps before she was tackled to the sidewalk. Maggie caught herself on her forearms, saving her head from smashing into the concrete. But as she was quickly pulled to her feet, she saw bloody scrapes along her arms. Dylan shoved her up against a nearby wall, 
and put the gun in her mouth. That wasn't a smart move, Dylan said. Maggie couldn't respond because of the gun barrel in her mouth. She tasted the harsh metals on her tongue, and she gagged from the pressure against the back of her throat. I'm this close to putting a bullet through your brain and leaving you here to rot on the street, Dylan said. I don't think you understand the opportunity that I'm giving you. Maggie would have spit in his face if she could. But she was so overwhelmed with pain, it was difficult to even grunt in defiance. Eventually, Dylan removed the pistol from her mouth and pressed it into her forehead. The pressure was so hard that she thought her skull was going to crack. What was the plan? Dylan asked. Did you really think I wouldn't be able to catch you? Did you think somebody might help you? Dylan gestured to the people who were sprinting past. Nobody paid attention to them, even though he had a gun pointed at her head. No one is gonna help you, Dylan said. The only thing people care about right now is saving their own skins. So you should do yourself a favor and start playing along with me. It'd be easier for you to kill me, Maggie said. Why not get it over with? Dylan grimaced. But then he removed the gun from her head and stepped back. I think that's a good question for you to try to figure out on your own. It will help keep your mind busy and stop you from making any more stupid decisions. Dylan grabbed her again and pushed her forward, keeping her close as he pressed the gun barrel into her back. Or maybe this is what you wanted, Dylan asked. If you wanted me to be closer, all you had to do was ask. Maggie shivered with disgust as she felt his breath against her neck. She wasn't going to go quietly, but until she had a better strategy of escape, she would have to play along. Maggie and Dylan reached the outskirts of the city without running into much trouble. But even though they had managed to escape, there were hundreds of thousands of people within the city who were struggling to survive. Maggie imagined that thousands would die in the coming days. Maybe even tens of thousands, without clean water, food, and medication that so many people needed to survive. The herd would quickly thin. She still couldn't imagine why anyone would do something like this. Once they had put the majority of the chaos behind them, Dylan relaxed a little bit, and they slowed their relentless pace. Maybe now we can find an actual car to get us the hell out of here, Dylan said. Maggie already knew what cars to look for to check to see if they worked. But she kept all of that information to herself. She wouldn't give Dylan any information that would take her away from the city and her son. But as Dylan passed all the newer cars, Maggie wondered why he wasn't checking them to see if they worked. But her questions were answered when he approached an old truck parked down a side street away from the main roads. What are you doing? Maggie asked, trying to play dumb. The cars don't work. This one will, Dylan answered. And he opened the driver's side door. There was a set of keys hidden beneath the seat. And when Dylan put them into the engine, the old truck started right up. Dylan smiled as he turned back to Maggie. I was shocked. Dylan knew what to look for after an EMP. Get in, Dylan said, aiming the gun at her. Maggie complied, sitting in the passenger seat. Dylan handcuffed her to the passenger door and then sat behind the wheel. Buckle up, Dylan said playfully. Once Dylan started to drive away, Maggie thought harder about how Dylan knew the old truck would still start. And there was an answer pushing to the front of her mind that she was afraid to utter aloud. You did all of this, Maggie said. You detonated the EMP. And this time, it was Dylan's turn to glance at her with surprise. <laughs> what do you know about that? Dylan asked. How could you even do such a thing? Maggie asked. Dylan smiled. <laughs> You're much smarter than you look. He glanced out at the destruction he had caused, pleased with his work. It wasn't as hard as I thought it'd be. It was even easier to set it into motion. 
You did all of this so you could escape? Maggie asked. Do you know how many people will die because of this? Dylan shrugged. Not my problem. All I want is my money. And that's where we're heading now. You're a murderer, Maggie answered. Sweetheart, I didn't kill anybody, Dylan said. Well, except for Agent Willow. But everything that's happening in the city has been done by the people who call themselves law-abiding citizens. I am surprised at how quickly everybody turned on each other. I would have thought it would have at least taken another day. But I guess that's just human nature. It appeared that Maggie had underestimated Dylan. Is it just the city that's been affected by the EMP? Maggie asked. The radius is supposed to be 100 square miles, Dylan answered. We wanted to make sure the device was capable of reaching a few of the police headquarters and other federal buildings on the outskirts of the city. From what I can tell, our plan worked very well. We were just trying to buy some time for me to escape and the rest of my crew to get out of the city with the money we had stashed. Running away is much easier when you don't have to worry about somebody chasing you. The police will be sifting through this mess for months. And I'll be long gone by then with enough money to do whatever I want for the rest of my life. Maggie had known some very selfish and greedy people in her lifetime. But what this man had done, she was sickened because it was all done in the name of greed. Oh, don't look at me like that, Dylan said. Do you know how hard it was to pull all this off? I mean, it was a year of planning. And getting caught, Maggie asked. That was part of the plan, too? I knew the authorities would want the mastermind, Dylan answered. So yeah, I allowed myself to get caught. Because I was confident I'd be able to escape. And that's exactly what I did. I love it when a good plan comes together. He laughed struck the steering wheel with the palm of his hand, and then laid on the horn, howling along with it. Just let me go, Maggie said. Dylan glanced at her. I told you I'm not doing that. You have everything you want, Maggie said. I'm no longer any use to you. You said it yourself that the police would be too busy cleaning up this mess to chase after you. You don't need a hostage anymore. I enjoy the company. Dylan said. Maggie understood that if she wanted out, she'd have to fight her way out. And with Dylan distracted with driving, she believed she had an opportunity. Because while Maggie's arms were restrained, her legs were not. Maggie thrashed against the door in her restraints, kicking Dylan as hard as possible. She tried to aim for his face, but couldn't position her legs in the right spot. Dylan swerved back and forth over the pavement, unable to keep the car straight. Eventually, Dylan regained control of the vehicle and pulled over. Then he used the gun to put Maggie back in her place. That wasn't very smart, Dylan said. Why don't you just kill me and get it over with, Maggie asked. For a moment, Maggie thought Dylan might do it but he finally lowered the weapon and put it in his lap. He took a minute to compose himself and then looked at Maggie with conviction. I'm not good by myself, Dylan said. I've been in solitary confinement for the past week. And even if you don't say anything, I know you're there. That's invaluable to me right now. I'd rather die, Maggie said. Luckily for me, the choice isn't up to you, Dylan replied. And besides, you might grow to like me. Not a chance, Maggie said. You're a murderer. Look around, Dylan said. Everyone is a murderer. Do you even know how many people have probably killed someone today? The veil of society has been pulled back, revealing the evil that lives inside people. I could have easily killed your son at the hospital, but I didn't. I shot the FBI agent because I didn't want him following me. You don't know how tenacious he can be. You're not as persuasive as you think, Maggie said. And you don't know me as well as you think you do, Dylan said. 
You're stuck with me, so you might as well get used to it. My family will come for me, Maggie said. My husband will go to the ends of the earth to find me. He's not gonna find you, Dylan said. Maggie raised her eyebrow. Then you're in for a rude awakening. Chapter Nine The only thing John cared about was finding his wife. He had heard about the bank robber who had been captured after stealing millions of dollars from Cincinnati Federal Reserve Bank. And now that monster had his wife as a hostage. Where is he taking her? John asked. Agent Willow was pale, his complexion waxy, and there were dark circles under his eyes. The nurses had done what they could, but without surgery, John didn't think the federal agent was going to survive. My partner and I were the ones who interrogated Dylan after he was caught, Willow said. I always thought us capturing him was too easy, but my partner said we were overestimating him. That he was only a thief, but he's much smarter than that. How did he take my wife? John asked. I let down my guard, Agent Willow said. It never should have happened, and I'm sorry. But if we hurry, we could still catch him. John raised his eyebrows and studied the two wounds Agent Willow had sustained. I don't think we are going anywhere, John said. I'm getting my friends and family out of here, and then I'm gonna rescue my wife. Now tell me where he's going. Agent Willow shut his eyes, taking a moment to focus on his breathing. It was clear he was in severe pain. <sighs> Have you seen what's going on out there? The roads are completely blocked. The only way you're gonna catch up with him is with a vehicle. Agent Willow carefully reached into his pocket and then gently removed a set of keys. No car is gonna be able to navigate those clogged roads, John said. I had a truck with off-road capability, but even that didn't survive. I'm not talking about a car or a truck, Agent Willow said. I'm talking about decommissioned military vehicles. The kind that can push cars out of the way to clear a path. There aren't any army reserve bases close enough to find something like that, John said. And even if they were close, I don't think the army would let me take one of their vehicles. Luckily for you, the FBI field office here in Cincinnati managed to get their hands on a few of them, Agent Willow said. Our office wanted to repurpose them, and since the army was gonna trash them, we decided to take them off their hands. We have three in the basement of the parking garage at our office. John knew the only way those vehicles would still be operational was if they had been put into production prior to the standardization of electric fuel injection. It would have made them over 50 years old. And why are you so confident they will work? John asked. Because they were retrofitted to survive an EMP, Agent Willow answered. The comment surprised John. He didn't know the FBI was concerned about EMP devices. And what would you know about that? It was Dylan, Agent Willow answered. He was the one who was responsible for detonating the EMP. He wanted to create as much chaos as possible in order to cover up his escape. John had no idea how this bank robber had managed to create and then detonate an EMP device. But if Dylan was smart enough to pull that off, then John worried about what else Dylan had planned. Get the vehicle, Agent Willows said, and then come back and pick us up so we can track this bastard down. Why don't you tell me where he is now, John asked. Because I want you to take me with you, Agent Willow answered. And I'm not giving up that leverage so easily. John wasn't in the mood to play games, but he recognized he wasn't going to be able to move Jake and Blake in their condition without a vehicle. John took the keys from Agent Willow, but looked him square in the eye. If your wheeling and dealing costs my wife her life, then you will have to answer to me. Do I make myself clear? 
I understand, Agent Willow answered. And then he grimaced. There is one more thing. My partner might still be back at the field office. His name is Agent Parker. If you see him, then tell him I sent you and give him this. Agent Willow painfully reached for the FBI badge inside his jacket pocket and handed it to John. Tell him to come back with you and get me, Agent Willow said. If he's not there, then there is one more thing you need to get. It's something Dylan doesn't know I have. He gestured to the keys in John's hand and pointed out a golden key. The key opens a locker in the men's changing room on the first floor of the building. Inside you'll find a box. Bring it back here. What's in the box? John asked. Just bring it back, Willow answered. If you want to save your wife, you'll bring it. John wanted more detail, but Agent Willow did not provide any further information. John simply nodded and then returned to his son to make sure he was okay. I want to go with you, Blake said. I know you do, John said, but it will be safer for you here. Don't leave me, Blake said, tugging his father's shirt. I don't want to stay here alone. You won't be alone, John said. Uncle Jake is going to be here with you. That's right, bud, Jake said. You and I, we're a team, the badass duo. He winked, but Jake's voice was weak, and he wasn't in much better shape than Agent Willow. Son, look at me, John said. And Blake turned his gaze to his father. You are stronger than you realize, and you are going to survive this. What's more, you are going to help Jake and Agent Willow stay alive. John reached around for his handgun, and then placed it in his son's small hand. He had made sure Blake was familiar with the weapon, so when the time came for him to use it, he would be ready. Do you remember what I taught you about this? John asked. Blake dried his tears, and then he nodded. Keep both hands on the gun. Don't place your finger on the trigger unless you're ready to pull it. And keep your arms straight but not locked when you aim. That's right, Blake said. And you squeeze the trigger. Don't pull it. Blake nodded nervously, and John kissed his son's forehead. You're gonna do fine, John said. Anyone tries to hurt you, Jake or Agent Willow, you don't hesitate to use it, okay? Blake nodded again. I love you, bud, John said. I love you too, Blake answered meekly. John headed toward the door and then glanced back at his son. Stay safe. It was painful to leave his son in the hospital, knowing how frightened Blake was. But John needed to move quickly if he wanted to catch his wife. And with the city on the verge of collapse, time was of the essence. When John stepped back out into the chaos of the city, he knew it was only a matter of time before everything fell apart. Fires raged along the storefronts, which were smashed and looted. There was absolutely nothing left for people to sift through once they returned home. And John suspected it would be years before the city was habitable. People sprinted aimlessly in all directions. Every few minutes, there was random gunfire, and people ducked and sought cover. There was no help to be had anywhere. Whatever police and emergency services had remained had most likely taken off to take care of their own families. It truly was the end of civilization. Despite all the chaos happening around him, John remained focused on his task of getting to the FBI building to obtain a ride to get him and his family out of the city. When John arrived at the FBI building, he expected it to be busy. But as he approached, he realized it looked abandoned. The security booth at the front gate was unmanned. The iron gates were too high for him to climb. So John found a trash can to stand on so he could reach the top of the wall. He paused a moment when he neared the top. And then when he confirmed that the coast was clear, he dropped down to the other side. John found the nearest entrance and hurried inside. With the power out, 
The interior was darkened, but what John could see and hear told the story of people leaving in a hurry. Chairs were overturned, papers trailed the hallways, and personal items had been left behind. John wasn't sure where everybody went, but he didn't plan on sticking around to find out. It didn't take John long to locate the men's locker room, and John found Willow's locker. He opened it and sifted through the contents inside. There was a change of clothes and a nine millimeter pistol with a fully loaded clip. Not wanting to leave a useful firearm behind, John pocketed the weapon, and he eventually found a box the size of a necklace box on the top shelf in the far back corner of the locker. It was the only box in the locker, and John assumed that was the item Agent Willow had spoken about. Curious as to what was inside, John opened the box to find what looked like a key. It had three prongs on it, but it was most certainly a key. But John had no idea what it opened. Having what he needed, John searched for a path toward the parking garage so he could get one of the repurposed army vehicles to escape the city. Eventually, John stumbled across a stairwell connected to the parking garage. He descended to the basement floor in pitch black darkness, using the guardrail to help guide him. When John reached the bottom, he felt along the wall until he reached the door and pushed it open. The garage basement had some dim light coming through the opening on the far side of the building. And after John's eyes adjusted, he saw the hundreds of vehicles abandoned inside. Some were locked up in cages, while others were neatly organized in parking spots. Every vehicle was at least 20 years old, which made John wonder whether certain officials were better prepared for the EMP than John had anticipated. John had tried several times to bring the subject of EMP to his local representatives, but he was never taken seriously. They always assured him that such an attack would never happen on American soil. So much for that. John hurried through the basement to the parking lot, searching for the retrofitted army vehicle Agent Willow had described. But with so many vehicles parked beneath the garage, he had underestimated how long it would take to find them. And the longer John searched the parking garage, the more aware he became of a certain smell. It was very faint at first, but the longer he spent in the garage, the more prevalent it became. And then he realized he was smelling gas. It wasn't gasoline, but natural gas. He suddenly realized why the agents had left the building in such a hurry. With a breakdown in all the city's infrastructure, it made sense for the gas lines to be compromised was also probably why there had been so many explosions around the city after the EMP had started. With all the safety features disabled after the EMP, there must have been a buildup of pressure causing the explosions. John needed to get out of there sooner rather than later, so he double-timed his efforts to search for the vehicle. Eventually, John spied the vehicle Agent Willow had told him to find but before he was able to reach it, he heard movement behind him. Don't, the voice said, authoritative and strong. Keep your hands up where I can see them. I didn't think anyone was home, John said, complying as he slowly turned around. Stop, the voice ordered. I did not tell you to turn around. Sorry, John said and he continued to face forward. I was sent here by one of your own, Agent Willow. The man was quiet, and John desperately wanted to turn around and see what he was facing. How do you know Agent Willow? He asked. He ran into my family at the hospital after he was injured during the chaos in the city, John said. What about the prisoner? The man asked eagerly. Dylan escaped. John answered. Shit, the man said under his breath. Can I turn around now? John asked. 
How the hell do I know you're telling the truth? He asked. Well, if you want proof, I'll need to reach into my pocket, John answered. Turn around, he said. John slowly complied, keeping his hands up by his sides. The man was standing in the shadows about 15 feet away. He had a good shooter stance and was laser focused on John. He was dressed in a suit and tie and had all the trappings of a federal agent. I'm gonna put my hand into my left pocket, John said. And then he slowly retrieved Agent Willow's FBI badge. Why did my partner give you that, he asked. So you're Agent Parker, he replied, again eliciting a surprise reaction. Well, Willow told me I might run into you here. Parker finally lowered his weapon, and John relaxed. We should leave, Parker said. The gas leak has made this place one lit match away from blowing up. I only stayed behind to see if Willow came back. But if Dylan escaped, then we need to find him, and there's something I need to get. Parker turned away, but when John reached for the small box in his pocket. Do you mean this? John asked. The moment Agent Parker saw the box, he walked over and snatched it out of John's hand. He shouldn't have told you about this. What is this? John asked. It's a key, Parker answered. I know that, but what does it open? John asked. A safe, Parker answered, with a lot of money in it. John remembered the bank robber had stolen over 100 million that was never recovered. This was the key that would open the stolen safe. I suppose this is enough leverage to get my wife back, John said. Agent Parker frowned. What does your wife have to do with any of this? The bank robber you're searching for used my wife as a hostage when he escaped from your partner's custody, John answered. Agent Willow told me if I brought the box back to him along with one of those decommissioned army vehicles. He would tell me where the criminal was taking my wife. Agent Parker shook his head and muttered something under his breath that John couldn't hear. When he looked up at John, he had a sympathetic expression. He shouldn't have involved you and your family in all of this. I'm sorry about what happened to your wife. But this man we've been chasing is the most dangerous criminal I've ever come across. John gestured to the chaos happening outside. Clearly, but I'm not putting my wife's life and the life of my family in anyone else's hands but mine, and that's non-negotiable. Agent Parker was quiet, and then he slowly nodded. I can respect that. He then glanced around. We better get going before this place pops. Which one of these vehicles works? John asked. Any old army trucks will work, Agent Parker answered. You sure? John asked, knowing they didn't have time to second guess themselves. It'll work, Agent Parker said. Parker sat behind the wheel, and normally John would have objected. But this was Parker's turf, so he didn't fight it. But just as John opened the passenger door, the ground beneath him rumbled. You hear that? Agent Parker asked, stopping before he turned on the old vehicle. It's the gas lines. John answered, and then he jumped into the vehicle. We need to go now. Agent Parker quickly tried to start the old truck, but it wouldn't turn over. He tried repeatedly, but it refused to start. I thought these things could survive in the EMP, Agent Parker said. They can, John said, getting out of the vehicle. But you still have to make sure the battery works. Pop the hood. Agent Parker did as he was told and John checked the battery. It was old, and the connections were corroded. Do you have a Coke? John asked. You're thirsty? Agent Parker asked incredulously. I need to clean off the battery connections, John answered. And then he looked around and found a trash can. He tore off the top and sifted through until he found a half full soda bottle. He dumped the liquid over the connections, and the corrosion was washed away. He wiped down the connectors with his shirt and reapplied them to the battery. He flashed a thumbs up to Agent Parker. Try it now. Parker started the old truck again, 
and this time it fired up. We're good, Parker shouted. John slammed the hood down, and as he did, the building rumbled even louder. He hurried toward the passenger side door and climbed inside as Agent Parker shifted into first gear. The old army truck lunged forward, and John thrust out his arm to brace himself on the dash. You sure you don't want me to drive? John asked. It's been a minute since I've driven a stick, Agent Parker said. But then he easily shifted into second and navigated the basement garage floor to the exit. The building continued to rumble as they neared the exit. The shaking was so bad that John's bones vibrated. He had never experienced trembling like this and couldn't imagine what type of pressure was building underneath them. You need to go faster, John said, shouting. The pedal's to the floor, Parker replied, shifting down into another gear. The old truck might have been able to plow through anything on the road, but getting it up to speed was slow and arduous. Hang on, Parker shouted as they neared the exit. Bits of the building crumbled off, pieces of rock and concrete smashing against the roof of the truck. John tightened his grip on the dashboard. They were so close to making it out. But as the building started to collapse, John wasn't sure if they had enough time. Chapter 10 After his father was gone, it was difficult for Blake to remain brave. He had the gun in his hands, the metal composite cold against his bare skin. He gripped it so tightly that the pistol had left indents on his palm and fingers. He had held the weapon before, but he had never been in a situation where he might have to use it. The door to their room was shut, and Blake heard the people outside in the hallways. Every time somebody moved closer to the door, he feared they would bust in and try to hurt him. Blake found himself aiming the gun at the door every time that happened. But he was careful not to put his finger on the trigger. His father had always told him that using a gun was always a last resort because the taking of a life was a heavy burden to bear. Blake hoped his father would return soon. He didn't enjoy the responsibility that had been thrust on him. He glanced around at the other adults in the room. Jake was asleep, and the FBI agent had his eyes closed. Blake briefly wondered if Jake and the FBI agent were dead. But then the agent stirred awake, opened his eyes, and stared right at Blake. The agent didn't say anything at first. And the longer he stared at Blake with that glazed look in his eyes, the more unsettling it was. Don't worry, kid, the agent said. I'm not dead yet. Blake didn't reply, unsure of what to even say. But eventually, Blake looked away, unable to hold the agent's gaze any longer. Your father won't fail, the agent said. I know, Blake replied, irritated. He'd never spoken to an adult in that manner before, but his fear and anxiety were getting the better of him. And there was still a dull ache in his arm from where they had set the bone. He was tired, hungry, thirsty, and afraid for his life. He's a tough man, your dad, the agent said. Then he tried to sit up a little, but then decided against it when the pain was too much. Tougher than others I've come across. Blake knew how tough his father was, but he wasn't sure if he'd inherited his father's toughness. He didn't think those types of traits had been passed down from his father to him, because even though he was supposed to be brave, he had never been more afraid. When do you think he's gonna come back? Blake asked. But when he looked over at the federal agent, he was once again asleep. Blake shifted to a more comfortable position in his chair. But he was too restless. Between the noises in the hospital and the pain in his arm, he couldn't sit still. Blake sat up and paced around the hospital room. 
He was acutely aware of the weight of the gun in his hand. It was much larger than his small hands could hold, but his father had entrusted him with it. Blake was pacing back and forth when he heard the gunshots inside the hospital. The sudden and loud percussive blasts caused Blake to drop the weapon, and it crashed on the tile floor. He froze, staring at the closed door, listening to the screams of people in the hallways. On the next gunshot, Blake stepped back, but then stared down at the pistol on the tile. He quickly reached for it, his hands trembling as he dropped it twice more. Blake didn't know what was happening, but he feared that whoever had the guns and was shooting would enter their hospital room. Blake wanted to retreat back into the corner of the room, but he stood his ground. But when Blake heard voices outside the door, he started to shake. Come on, man, we need to find the drugs, a voice said outside of Blake's door. Let's check in here. The door swung open and two men appeared in the doorway. They both stared at Blake with a mixture of surprise and amusement. Kid's got a gun, the short one said. The taller of the two didn't look as worried as the shorter one. Both were far bigger than Blake and could have easily overpowered him. But Blake remembered what his father told him about the weapon and how it was his great equalizer. But Blake wasn't ready to pull the trigger. You need to leave, Blake said, now. The taller man studied Blake and then glanced around the rest of the room. He smiled then cleared his throat. You gonna shoot us, kid? If you come any closer, I will, Blake answered. Blake did his best to sound threatening, but he didn't think he was doing a good job. And how close do I need to be for that to happen? The taller man asked and he took one step into the room. Is it this close? He took another, or maybe this close. Again, Blake fought the urge to slink away into the corner, but he still didn't want to pull the trigger and kill a man. The shorter friend remained by the door, and he glanced up and down the hallway. Come on, Frankie, we still haven't found where they store the drugs, and I don't want to get caught by the cops. There are no cops coming. Frankie said, there's no help coming for anybody. It's a lawless world now and only the strong are gonna survive. He gestured to Blake. Are you strong enough to survive? Stay back, Blake shouted, but his voice cracked. Frankie laughed, you're not as tough as you think you are. He looked at the FBI agent and Jake, both of whom were still unconscious. Are you supposed to be protecting them? Is that what you're doing? They're dead, kid. If you're smart, you'd get that through your head. Warning you, Blake said. Still not putting his finger on the trigger, because deep down he didn't want to pull it. Is that so? Frankie asked, and he took two more steps closer. Are you gonna shoot me with that gun? Do you even know how it works? I know how it works, Blake answered. I don't want to hurt you, but I will. See, that's where you're wrong, Frankie said. I think you're too scared to pull that trigger. He tilted his head to the side and gave Blake a good look up and down. You don't seem like you could be the type. I've killed men. I've seen killers. So I know what they look like. And kid, they don't look like you. Frankie took another step forward and Blake took one step back. I said stop, Blake shouted. But the man didn't stop. He was walking toward Blake, getting closer and closer. Blake's heart hammered in his chest, and his entire body shook. He couldn't move. The fear had stolen his ability to do anything. But Blake understood what would happen if the man got his hands on him. He would die, and the others would die and then he would never see his family again. And the thought of losing his family overrode his fear as he finally placed his finger on the trigger. When Blake squeezed the trigger, the force of the gunshot almost knocked the weapon out of his hands. And while Blake was surprised by his action, 
Frankie was stunned. The bullet struck Frankie just below the chest in the center of the stomach. At first, he didn't move, other than the sudden jolt when the bullet struck him. Frankie then glanced down at the wound and touched the bloody hole. When he pulled his hands away and saw the blood on his fingertips, he looked at Blake, the blood rushing from his face. Maybe you are a killer. Frankie! The short man rushed into the room and caught Frankie as he fell to the floor. He checked his friend, unsure of what to do, and then looked at Blake, who still had the gun in his hands. You fucking killed him! Blake kept the gun up and aimed at the two men, still well aware he had more bullets and was ready to use it if necessary. Leave now! Blake shouted, his command almost like a plea. The shorter man glanced around and clearly wasn't going to stick around to die while his friend bled out. He sprinted out of the hallway and Blake stared at the man he'd shot. Blake slowly walked over and got a closer look at Frankie's face. He was choking on blood and struggling to breathe. Blake wasn't sure how he was supposed to feel. But even though he had shot this man, he still did not feel safe. In fact, he felt even more exposed than before. While he was still terrified, he could not look away from Frankie's eyes as they stared at one another. Blake held Frankie's gaze until he coughed and took his final breath. It was oddly quiet in the hospital for the next few moments, making it feel like Blake and this man were the only two in the building. But then Blake started to cry, and he lowered the weapon, eventually dropping it on the tile as he collapsed to his knees. He had killed a man, and he would have to live with that for the rest of his life. He was a killer, just as the man had suggested. And it wasn't a label that Blake wanted to live with. Chapter 11 Floor it, John shouted as the ceiling of the parking garage collapsed and smashed against the army truck. Agent Parker gripped the wheel so tightly he nearly broke it in half. There was a thunderous smack against the back of the truck just before they exited the basement of the parking garage. And then Parker turned sharply onto the street. John glanced behind them and saw a plume of smoke dust and debris jettisoned from the opening of the parking garage, which was now completely sealed off by a mountain of concrete. That was close, Parker said. Keep your eyes on the road, John said. Parker drove a little farther down the street, putting as much distance between themselves and the collapsed building before he turned down a side street and parked. I'm gonna get out and check to see if there's any damage. John said, well, at least the building didn't fall on us, Parker said, and he forced a smile. I wouldn't put that out into the universe if I were you, John said. It's not even lunch yet. Parker's smile vanished, and John performed a quick perimeter check of the truck. Aside from a few dents and getting covered in dust, it looked like they had missed any major damage. Once John checked the tires and ensured nothing was caught in the undercarriage, he returned to the truck's cab. We're good to go, John said. Parker nodded, but he didn't move. And John noticed the agent's hand was trembling. Look, I, I know things are intense right now, John said. But I need to get back to the hospital as quickly as possible. I'm sure you're eager to see your old partner again, too. I am, Parker replied. I'm just not sure what kind of world this is now. We were already hanging on by a thread. We just need to keep moving, John said. Don't think about trying to save the entire world. Focus on one person, it makes the job easier. I've been with the FBI for almost 10 years now, Parker said. And I don't think I've met anybody who's put what our purpose is so succinctly as you just did. After Parker's nerves were settled, he pulled back out onto the road. Once they got moving, Parker navigated through the back streets, 
trying to stay off the main roads to avoid the biggest pockets of stalled traffic. But eventually, they hit clogged roads, and John and Parker found out just how useful this truck was going to be. Here we go, Parker said. Parker didn't go too fast as he approached the parking lot on the highway. But once they gained some momentum, the old army truck managed to push the cars out of the way without much effort. Damn, Parker said. I should have bought one of these for my daily commutes to work. Parker laughed. But John was simply relieved that this had gone their way. He didn't want to waste any more time getting his son and Jake out of the city. And he still needed to figure out where the bank robber was taking his wife. As the army truck cleared a path on the road, they caught the attention of bystanders. When a few of them tried to wave Parker down, John stopped the FBI agent from pulling over. We don't have time to stop for anybody, John said. I know a lot of people will still need help, but we have to focus on our priorities. For me, that's getting my family, and for you, it's stopping the bank robber and helping your partner. Do we understand each other? I understand, Parker answered. And while Parker agreed, he continued to glance at the people they passed. It was difficult to leave them behind. But John meant what he had said about his family being the priority. When they returned to the hospital, John was happy to see that the building was still standing. Considering they had barely escaped a collapsing building, John wasn't sure what they would find. You stay with the truck, John said. Don't you want me to come in and help you bring everybody else? Parker asked. This truck is our only way of getting out of the city and catching up with my wife, John answered. And we're not the only ones looking for transportation. Parker nodded, and then he reached for his pistol. Be careful, John said. Just hurry back, Parker said. John sprinted into the hospital, which was more abandoned than it had been before he had left. Only a few staff members were inside, helping what people remained. But there was only so much they could do. John found the room where he had stashed Blake and the others, and he tensed as he neared the door, unsure of what he would find. And when he opened the door and saw the dead man on the floor, his heart skipped a beat. Blake, he asked, scanning the room, until he found Blake in the back corner, head on his knees and crying. John immediately rushed to his son. Are you okay? John quickly patted Blake down, making sure he was uninjured. But from what he could tell, aside from his broken arm, Blake was okay. You killed him, Blake said. It took John a moment for him to realize that Blake was talking about the dead man on the floor. John wasn't sure what had happened. But there would be time for them to unpack that trauma later. The only thing that mattered right now was getting them out of the building and out of the city. You did what you had to do, John said. You saved these people. Without you, they would have died. That's what's important. John wiped away his son's tears. Help wake up Jake, John said, hoping that if he kept his son busy, it would distract him. People needed something to do in a time of crisis. If they were allowed to sit and wallow, then they would be crushed by their own inaction. Hey, Willow, we need to go. John pushed Agent Willow's shoulder and saw his head slumped to the side. John checked Willow's pulse, and when he found none, he gently laid the man's arm down. I'm sorry. John's apology had fallen on deaf ears. But John couldn't save everyone. The reality of this cold new world was one where people would die. It was all John could do to keep his own family alive. Jake finally woke up, and John hoped he had gotten the necessary medical care to keep him alive. Wait, Blake said. And then he grabbed some pills off the table next to where Jake had been lying. The nurse said he needed to take these. Keep them in your pocket, John said. Let's go. What about Agent Willow? Blake asked. His voice so innocent. John almost didn't have the heart to tell him the truth. 
But shielding his son from the reality of this new world would only make things worse for him in the long run. He's dead, John said. We need to go now. John pushed Jake in a wheelchair and made sure he kept Blake close. They weaved through the mostly empty hospital hallways and hurried out into the parking lot. But as John approached the army truck, he noticed a crowd gathering. Agent Parker was trying to keep them at bay, threatening them with his gun. It was a small crowd, but they were clearly eager for a ride. Back up, Parker shouted from the driver's seat, firing a few warning shots. But aside from taking a few steps back, none of them scattered. Last warning. You said that three warnings ago, the man said. John singled out the man who spoke, figuring he was the group's leader. He was the boldest among them. And if they wanted to end this before it turned nasty, then that's who John needed to shut down. John removed his pistol and aimed it at the leader. Hey! Once the man turned around, John fired, putting a bullet through the man's right arm. It was a clean shot, through and through the muscle. The man fell backward and screamed, but the rest of the group sprinted away. He clutched the wound, rolling on the pavement, cursing every name in the book. John didn't pay the man any attention. The only thing he was concerned with was getting Jake and Blake inside the truck. He enlisted Parker's help to hoist Jake up into the back seat. Where's Willow? Parker asked. The truth must have been written on John's expression, because he didn't even have to answer as Parker nodded in understanding. Right, Parker said. Get them secure, John said. And then he turned back to the man he'd shot. You fucking shot me, the man cried. The man was bleeding, but not profusely. You were given a warning, John said, staring the man down without an ounce of pity in his voice. You chose this for yourself. The man grimaced, but then he broke down. I just wanted to leave, wanted to get out of the city. Look around you, it's falling apart. That doesn't give you the right to take something that isn't yours, John said. John was going to leave the man with nothing, but he handed him some first aid supplies from the truck. Clean up the wound, the bullet went through, and it's small enough that you can use some butterfly stitches to keep it closed. Make sure you clean it well, though, and make sure you remember the next time someone gives you a warning. John said nothing else as he walked away. Once everyone was secure, John nodded to Parker, but the FBI agent remained idle in the parking lot. We need to go, John said. And then he remembered that this man had just lost a partner, most likely a close friend. I'm sorry Willow didn't make it. Me too. Parker said. But then John suddenly remembered it was Agent Willow who had informed him about where the bank robber was taking his wife. Do you know where Dylan is going? John asked. There is one place we've been watching, Parker answered. But it's pretty far and there's no guarantee that I'm right. It's better than nothing, John said. Parker nodded and then shifted into drive. They pulled out of the parking lot leaving the hospital behind them. Even though they weren't out of the woods yet, John breathed a little easier once they were moving and back on the road. We need to get to the highway, Parker said. That'll take us south where we need to go. John grew up in Cincinnati. He knew the city and the area like the back of his hand. I know a quicker route. John guided Agent Parker through the city, like before. Some people tried stopping them for help, but Parker did a better job ignoring them this time. He'd learned his lesson, and considering how volatile the city was becoming, with fires starting, explosions happening, and people starting to form gangs, John knew time was of the essence to escape. Take a left up here, John said. Parker did as he was told, but the moment they turned onto the street, John knew something was wrong. You see that? Parker asked, squinting ahead. What the hell is that? The blockade had been set up across the entire street. 
a street crane had toppled over, creating a steel barrier that would prevent even the army truck from pushing through. But what was more concerning to John than the barricade were the people who were slowly gathering around them. Parker, we need to move, John said. Parker shifted into reverse, but before they escaped, the shooting started, and John hoped the truck's armor didn't fail. Chapter 12 Maggie was incredibly uncomfortable being handcuffed to the door. She couldn't really see much to her left, but she had a good view of the side view mirror. She stared at it watching the Cincinnati skyline grow smaller and smaller in the distance. But even though she'd escaped the danger of the city, and she was currently stuck in this truck with a murderer, she would have done anything to go back into that chaos and madness to save her son. Are you hungry? Dylan asked. Dylan hadn't said a word since they'd left the city, and the way he brought up getting food was so casual Maggie almost didn't notice. Are you hungry? Dylan asked, repeating himself slower. Maggie shot him a look, unsure if this was some kind of a joke. Relax, it's not a trap, Dylan answered. It's a question. Maggie had not followed the news about who this man was, but she had already noticed how his personality flipped like a switch. One moment, he was a killer and the next he was casually asking her for some food. I want to leave, Maggie said. Well, that's not an option, Dylan said, and he sighed. There has to be a place with food somewhere. They drove a few more miles, and Dylan said nothing as he glanced along the side of the road. Maggie didn't know what he was trying to play at, what he really wanted. It was clear to her that he didn't care about people no matter how much he pretended to be charismatic. He was a sociopath, and if Maggie wanted to survive, she needed to escape. Oh, that looks promising, Dylan said. They pulled over to an old school retro diner. The sharp chrome exterior reflected the hot afternoon sun. The parking lot was full, all the cars disabled, just like the ones they'd seen on the street. Dylan parked in the back of the lot near the road. He positioned the car toward the exit so they could make a quick getaway if needed. Maggie stared at the windows, but the reflection was so bad it was impossible to see inside or if anyone was looking at them. Because Maggie's hands were cuffed low on the door, they were concealed by the truck's dashboard. But before she considered screaming for help, Dylan turned her head toward him. This is what's gonna happen when we enter the diner, Dylan said. If you make any sudden moves, or if you try to leave or try to tip off anybody or tell anybody who I am, then I'm gonna kill one person in that diner. And I'm gonna make you pick who I shoot. This entire situation was completely surreal. Of all the people Dylan could have taken as a hostage, it was her. I'm going to need a verbal yes, Dylan said. Yes, Maggie answered. Dylan smiled. He was still sporting that charismatic face, the one that hid all the evil that lurked behind those dark eyes. Dylan leaned closer, never breaking eye contact with Maggie, and he unlocked her handcuffs. She almost sighed in relief, but she didn't want to give him the satisfaction. Remember the deal, Dylan said. Maggie had no intention of getting anybody killed, but she knew she wasn't going to let this opportunity pass her up. There would be no better time for her to escape than now. She just had to make sure she played her cards right. When Dylan and Maggie entered the diner, the air was hot and stale and smelled of fryer grease. She also noticed how every pair of eyes was upon them. She was surprised so many people were waiting inside, considering how hot the afternoon sun was going to make this metal diner. She wondered how long they would last. Afternoon, Dylan said, smiling. 
My friend and I were hoping for some lunch. An older woman dressed in a waitress's uniform walked over with a notepad and a pen. Hours off, but we still have our cook out back on the propane grill. Most of the menu's still available, for now at least. Where can we sit? Dylan asked. Anywhere you like, the woman answered. Right, thanks, Dylan said. And then Maggie flinched as Dylan placed his hand on the small of her back and whispered in her ear, no sudden moves. Maggie picked a booth next to the window so she could see outside. She made sure to sit opposite Dylan so they wouldn't have to sit next to each other. But the moment they sat down, a nearby patron sparked up a conversation. How did you get your truck to work? The man who turned around on the bar stool at the diner bar was overweight with suspenders, holding up his pants. He was middle-aged and wore thick glasses. I couldn't tell you, Dylan answered. I've never been much of a handyman. I just know when I walked out after the power went out, my truck was one of the few still working. All of us have been trying to figure out what's been going on, the man said. We didn't know if you heard about anything. We saw you were coming from the city. The city's not doing well, Maggie said, interjecting before Dylan could reply. I have a son there, the man said wearily. I can't stop thinking about him. It's funny, we both have cell phones, but we hardly talk. And the one time I'd give anything to hear his voice, I can't do anything about it. I'm sorry, Maggie said. Did you two have family back in the city? He asked. Yes, Maggie answered. Unfortunately, we had to leave them behind, though, Dylan said, retaking control of the situation. But we'll be back for them soon enough. Maggie noticed the threatening tone Dylan used as he stared at her. He was clearly making a threat to go back and hurt Blake. But Maggie had a feeling that John had already gotten to him by now. At least that was what she had hoped. The waitress returned and took their orders. Maggie wasn't hungry, but she knew she should eat. She ordered a turkey sandwich and Dylan ordered the meatloaf platter. It'll be a little different because of the grill, but we should be able to heat it up just fine, she said. I'm sure it'll be delicious, Dylan replied. The waitress was about to turn away, but she stopped and focused on Dylan. Do I know you? I don't think so, Dylan answered. Not unless we went on a date once. The waitress laughed and then playfully hit his arm. Then she looked back at Maggie. Better be careful with this one. Oh, I will, Maggie said. Once the waitress was gone, Maggie started to get up, but Dylan grabbed her arm and stopped her. Where are you going? Dylan asked. I need to go to the bathroom, Maggie answered. Dylan leaned closer to Maggie across the table and dropped his voice to a whisper. Are you trying to start trouble? Dylan asked. Some of his playfulness vanished, and that darkness crept into the corners of his eyes. Remember what I told you. You try anything stupid, then I make you pick the person I kill in this diner. And take a nice look around, because there are plenty of good people for you to choose. Maggie wanted to scream for help then and there, but she didn't because she had to play this smart. I remember. Maggie said. Dylan finally let her go, but he'd squeezed so tight he left finger marks on her skin. She didn't say anything else as she walked to the bathroom. She entered the women's room and then shut and locked the door. The moment she was alone, Maggie sprang into action. She saw the window above the toilet. It was narrow, but she believed she could squeeze her way through. Maggie stood on top of the toilet tank and struggled to open the window. It was much harder for her to open than she had anticipated. The hinges were rusted, and she couldn't move it more than a few inches. But she knew the longer she waited, the more Dylan would grow suspicious. When Maggie finally opened the window wide enough for her to slide through, she heaved herself up onto the windowsill and pushed herself through the opening, planting her hands on the outside wall as she forced her way through. 
Her back and stomach scraped against the old aluminum window, and she tumbled head first onto the dirt outside. Maggie was disoriented from the fall, but she stood up quickly, knowing she was already running on borrowed time. She sprinted toward the back of the diner, wanting to put as much distance between herself and Dylan as she could muster. But she never made it more than three steps before a rough hand was on her arm, yanking her backward. No, Maggie screamed, and she turned sharply, swinging her right hand to get ready to strike her attacker's head. But Dylan was too fast. Dylan pinned her up against the diner wall, out of sight of the patrons, using his size and strength to keep her immobile. I warned you not to do anything stupid, Dylan growled. Now you'll have to make someone else pay the price. Maggie screamed again, but she wasn't going down without a fight. Maggie managed to kick her leg back up behind her and struck Dylan's groin. She wasn't sure if she made direct contact or not, but the blow was enough to at least send him backward a few steps. Maggie spun around, capitalizing on her attack and struck Dylan in the throat. He gagged and hunched forward. Maggie then smashed her knee against his face, and she heard a hard crunch of cartilage and bone. With Dylan practically immobile, Maggie reached for the gun in Dylan's hand and tried to wrestle it free from him. But he was too strong. He headbutted Maggie in the forehead, knocking her down, and then quickly picked her up by her hair and dragged her back toward the diner's entrance. The patrons watching from the window in stunned silence. Dylan fired a shot at the diner window and the glass shattered. Everyone in the diner screamed and ducked for cover as Dylan pulled Maggie into the diner. I warned you, Maggie, Dylan said, blood pouring from his nose and running over his lips and chin. So who's it gonna be? Dylan aimed the weapon in a sweeping motion across the entire diner, while everyone remained crouched under whatever cover they could find. Don't do this, Maggie said. Too late, Dylan said. You and I had a simple deal and you couldn't follow through with it. Now who's it gonna be? Maggie couldn't answer the question. She saw a knife nearby, and in one last desperate attempt, she lunged for it but Dylan easily snapped it out of her hand. Okay then, Dylan said, we'll do this another way. I'm going to shoot someone every five seconds until you point to someone, starting now. One. Everyone in the diner shuddered, and a woman gasped. Two, three. Dylan, stop this, Maggie shouted. Four, five. Dylan then aimed the pistol at the nearest man and then pulled the trigger. The noise of the gunshot sounded so loud in the small diner, but it was almost drowned out by the collective scream from the patrons. One, Dylan said. Two, three. Maggie knew Dylan had more than enough bullets to kill everyone in the diner, so she had to make a choice. Either try to run and risk the lives of everyone else here or choose one to die. Four, okay, Maggie shouted. And she stepped forward, moving into the line of fire. Okay. Dylan's face was nothing but rage. Maggie studied the faces around her. No one met her gaze, and she didn't blame them. She could barely look any of them in the eye. But that was when an old man in the booth farthest from them stood up. Pick me, he said. The man's hair and beard were snow white. He had a hunch in his upper back, and he wore a plaid shirt that was far too big on his thin frame. But when Maggie looked at him, there was no fear in his eyes. I didn't expect this today, the man said, but I've lived longer than anyone here. Go on, pick me. Maggie cried. She didn't want to do this, but she knew Dylan wouldn't stop until she did. So she slowly raised her finger and pointed at the old man. I'm sorry, Maggie said. The old man smiled.
It's not your fault. Dylan shot the man in the chest, and he immediately crumpled to the floor. And with that, Dylan calmly lowered his weapon and put his charismatic mask on again. Good, Dylan said. And then as if nothing had happened, he turned to the waitress who was hiding behind the diner counter. We'll need that food to go. The waitress looked at Maggie as if he were joking. But Maggie simply nodded, and then the waitress went back and packed up their food. The rest of the diners were completely silent while they waited. Nobody moved. And the only sound in the diner was the muffled sobs of an older woman in the corner. Once Dylan had his food, he forced Maggie to carry it as they walked back out to the truck. No one made a move to help Maggie, as she was once again abducted. A small piece of Maggie had hoped that the group in the diner would band together. But no one came to her aid. Not that Maggie blamed them. In times of crisis, it was all that most people could do to stay alive. It wasn't until Maggie was back in the truck that she saw the blood on her stomach. At first, she thought it was from the dead man. But then she remembered how her body had scraped against the window in the bathroom on her escape. You should have just listened to me, Dylan said. I did tell you what would happen if you tried to run. You should have killed me, Maggie said. Maggie, if I'd done that, then there wouldn't have been a lesson for you to learn from, Dylan said. Maggie turned to Dylan, tears in her eyes. You're a madman. Dylan smiled. Maybe, but those people are dead because of you. And that makes you a killer just like me. Dylan started the truck, and they drove off, leaving more blood and destruction in his wake. Maggie couldn't help but wonder how much more death was waiting for her down the road. Chapter 13 The moment bullets struck the old army truck, Agent Parker tried to reverse. But in his haste, he smashed into a nearby garbage truck, and the back bumper was hooked on the massive city truck. Go, John shouted at Parker. But each time Parker floored the gas pedal, they remained exactly where they were. The tires were burning out, drifting up smoke, and John knew they were sitting ducks. All right, that's enough, John said. Parker took his foot off the gas, keeping low as they were slowly surrounded. We're sitting ducks out here. Parker said. We need to unhitch the truck, John said. Are you nuts? Let's just leave, Parker said. All they want is the truck. The truck is the only way to catch up with my wife in time to stop her before that lunatic does anything else, John said. And then he glanced at the rear of the truck. I think I can get to the bumper from here. The gunfire sounded like metal rain crashing against the exterior of the truck. John saw Blake and Jake hunched below the windows of the truck. John wasn't sure if Jake was even conscious, but Blake was shivering with fear. Once John was confident the truck's armor was going to hold up, he started to scan the streets where people were shooting from, even though it sounded like everybody had a gun outside. Upon closer inspection, he saw it was only a handful of people actually armed with firearms. The rest stood by, waiting for their time to strike. Do you still have your gun on you? John asked. Parker nodded. Keep those guys back and give me some cover fire, John said. Can you do that? Yeah, Parker said. But how am I supposed to shoot back? The windows on this truck don't exactly roll down. John pointed upward to the ceiling, where a hatch provided an exit point to the roof. You'll have a bird's eye view. I'll also be a sitting duck, Parker answered. You'll have the high ground, John said. Are you with me or not? With the crowd outside growing bolder, Parker didn't have a choice. All right, let's get this over with, Parker said. With the plan in place, both men moved into position. John passed his son and Jake, making sure both stayed down. Dad, what's going on? 
Blake asked. We're getting out of here, John said. Just make sure you and Jake keep your head down. Blake nodded, and then John finally reached the back of the truck. He glanced through the rear window and looked down to where the truck was smashed up against the garbage truck. He could see where the two pieces of metal were mangled together, but he believed he could pry it off with a crowbar. Hey, you ready yet? Parker asked, already positioning by the top latch. John searched the back for any tools and found an old tire iron that would have to do. Yeah, on three. One, two, three. Parker poked his head up and out of the top hole, opening fire on the surrounding crowd. And for a moment, the noise of the gunfire striking the truck ended. John opened the back door and squeezed down onto the pavement. There was no one close, so he jammed one side of the tire iron at the intersection where the two pieces of metal had smashed together, and he pressed down with all of his might. At first, it didn't budge. But the more John worked it, the metal started to give way. But John didn't get a chance to work on it for long. Hey, a man shouted. There's one in the back. John reached for his pistol, firing in the man's direction to send him running. He hoped Parker was a good shot because they were far outnumbered. John checked the clip in his pistol, making sure he still had some rounds if it came to that. But then focused on the tire iron and pressed down with all of his might until the metal finally budged from the army truck's bumper. John hurried back inside, slamming the door shut. We're good, get to the wheel. Parker popped his head back down and closed the latch, and they were once again bombarded with gunfire. As John neared the front, the glass in the front windshield started to crack. John quickly opened the hatch, but as he did, he caught Parker's attention. What the hell are you doing? Parker asked when John unlatched the hatch. You're really going out there? I need to buy us some time, John answered. And unless you have a better idea, this is the one I'm going with. Parker grunted something under his breath, but he continued to steer the old army truck around. And just before John was about to escape through the top hatch, something tugged on his leg. He glanced down and saw Blake staring up at him. Don't leave, Blake said. I don't want to be alone. You're not alone, son, John replied. And I'm not leaving. I'm just trying to push these people back. Even with the heightened chaos around them, John did his best to sound calm so he wouldn't worry his son further. Eventually, Blake released his father. Just stay low, John said. And then he took a breath to ready himself before he pushed the hatch open and poked his head through the top. John had never been someone who enjoyed fighting, and he didn't have much experience with it as a farmer but he always had the ability to calm himself when a situation was at its most chaotic. While everybody else was fueled by fear and adrenaline, John was sharpened by the purpose of his task. He was terrified of dying, but he didn't allow his fear to inhibit his ability to perform. That was what had always set him apart from others, and that was what would keep him and his family alive now. John lined up the first shot at the shooter nearest the truck and fired three rounds. The first one missed, but the second and third shot sent the man running for cover. Buying himself some time, John turned to the next closest shooter, this time winging the man and causing him to leave his weapon behind. After the first three shooters that John had engaged with were taken down, the others quickly turned tail and ran away buying Agent Parker the precious time he needed to have enough room to swing the truck around, all the cluttered mess on the road. Okay, we're good, Agent Parker shouted. Get back in here before you catch a bullet. John quickly descended into the truck and closed and sealed the hatch. He quickly checked on his son and made sure Blake and Jake were unharmed. Who taught you to shoot like that? Jake asked. John rolled his eyes. You're not that good of a teacher. I must be to take a farmer like you and turn him into Rambo, Jake answered, smiling. John, Agent Parker said, shouting from the front of the truck as they left the chaos behind them. Hang in there, 
John said, placing a comforting hand on his friend before he rejoined Parker at the front of the truck. How are we doing? The truck is a lot stiffer to handle now, Parker answered. I think they might have done some damage. We need to find another way out of the city, John said. The main city roads were the quickest path to the highway, but it wasn't the only one. A few more explosions rocked the city, shaking the army truck as they continued down the road. John didn't know how much longer the infrastructure would last with so much destruction around them. He figured it was only a matter of time before the entire city imploded. We can take the bridge, John said. Well, that's on the north side of the city, Parker said. We need to go south. John gestured to the path ahead and all the people and buildings. Going south will take us through the heart of downtown where the congestion and crowds will be the worst. If we go north, then we at least have a lesser path of resistance. Considering what we've seen so far, I'd say that's the best path forward. Parker conceded the point, but he still didn't look happy as he turned around. John glanced back at his son and Jake. The pair were huddled close to one another, barely hanging on to each other. John's idea of heading north and away from the epicenter of the city did make their path out of the city easier, but John hoped they hadn't wasted too much time. When they finally neared the bridge, Parker was forced to slow as they approached another barricade. But this one was made by the Army Reserves. Parker slowed, and both he and John squinted ahead to see what was going on. I don't see any soldiers in the area, Parker said. It looks like whoever was stationed here was called away. John nodded and couldn't help but wonder why the Army would put up a blockade across an escape route. Do you think it's another trap? Parker asked. Only one way to find out, John answered. And he opened the truck and walked out, gun in hand. John held up his hand for Parker to stay in the vehicle. And John moved quickly to the front of the barricade. The massive blocks had been spread out across all four lanes of traffic on the old suspension bridge. He checked the abandoned vehicles and saw no sign of blood or fighting. But just before John was about to turn around and rejoin Parker in the truck to give them the all clear, he heard a heavy metallic banging noise coming from the river. John glanced down on the right side of the bridge to the river below, and he saw a barge had collided with one of the bridge's support pilings. Even from the height where John stood, it was easy to see that the pillar was bent and clearly damaged. As John examined the damage below, he understood why the army had set up the barricade. It was to keep people from crossing because they feared the bridge would collapse. And judging by how the river continued to smash the barge into the bridge's pilings, John knew its collapse was imminent. John hurried back to the truck and opened the passenger door. We have a small problem. John explained the situation to Parker about the barge and how the bridge's integrity was compromised. We need to turn around, Parker said. There's a reason the Army Corps of Engineers didn't want people to cross that bridge. You saw what we just escaped from, John said. And I can promise you the situation in the heart of downtown is only going to be worse than it was before we left. It also takes even more time to backtrack. Getting across the bridge is still our best option. Parker glanced ahead to the bridge, and he nervously squeezed the steering wheel until his knuckles turned white. I don't like it. Me either, John said. We get over fast and we should be good. Parker still hesitated, but then he glanced back at Jake and Blake and then looked at John. You sure you want to do this? Yes, John answered. All right, Parker said. And then he shifted into drive. Hang on. The old truck lurched forward, and Parker slowly approached the barricade. He used the truck's size to push the barricade aside. Once on the bridge, he sped up, but he was mindful of the abandoned vehicles that clogged the road. John glanced out of the windows, staring down into the waters below. It might have just been his imagination, but it felt like the bridge itself was starting to groan and sway as they moved across it.
I don't like this, Parker said. Just keep going, John said. That's the only thing that matters right now. Both men were frightened. The only difference between the two of them was that John didn't allow his fear to cripple him. It was useless to hide it, so he embraced it and used it as motivation to accomplish his goal. And right now, that was simply to get across this bridge before it collapsed. When they reached the halfway point, the bridge physically shifted, and the army truck rocked side to side, almost tipping over. Parker froze behind the wheel, taking his foot off the gas. But John grabbed the wheel and Parker's attention. We have to keep moving, John said, shouting above the bridge's groaning and moaning. Go now! Parker floored the gas pedal and jolted forward. The bridge continued to rock and buckle, tossing the massive army truck around like a rag doll. The closer they moved to the end of the bridge, the more certain John was they weren't going to make it. And when the bridge finally snapped in half, the middle part collapsing into the river, they were literally running out of road behind them. Gun it now, 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 John shouted, punching the dash as if it would allow the vehicle to move faster. The road was falling behind them, chasing them on their way off the bridge as Parker crashed into cars along the road, shoving them out of the way with reckless force. And just when John glanced behind him and couldn't even see the road on the bridge anymore, they reached the other side. Parker pulled over to the side of the road after their escape, and they all glanced behind them, watching as the bridge crashed into the river. Jesus, Parker said. And then he finally relaxed resting his head on the back of the dash. We made it, John said, giving his frightened son a reassuring smile. We're okay. But now they'd made it out of the city. The journey was just beginning. They still needed to catch up with Maggie and find her before the bank robber killed her. Chapter 14 after Sidney and Teddy escaped the gunman at the farm, she rode Chestnut out into the fields where they could regroup. The moment they stopped, Teddy slid down from the horse and started pacing nervously. What the heck is going on? Teddy asked. None of this makes any sense. The power's not on and those gunmen are shooting up the farm. Is the world ending? No, Sidney answered, much calmer than her friend and she slid off the horse and tied Chestnut to a nearby tree. It's called an EMP. Sidney explained the situation to Teddy, and after she was finished, he looked at her with the most dumbfounded expression she'd ever seen anybody wear. There's no way that's real, Teddy said. It is, Sidney answered. Teddy opened his mouth to speak, but couldn't find the words. I know it's a lot to take in, Sidney said, but we need to figure out a way to rescue our friends. We need to call the police, Teddy said. The police can't help us, even if we could reach them, which we can't, Sidney said. Jesus, we're really all alone, aren't we? Teddy said, what are we gonna do? Sidney had been grappling with that question since the moment she knew the EMP had detonated. She wanted to regroup with her family. But she couldn't leave these people at the farm to fend for themselves. The first step in assessing the situation is determining what kind of threats we're dealing with, Sidney said. And we need to make sure we take stock of all of our resources as well. What do you have on you? Teddy patted down his pockets and removed a pair of house keys, his phone, which didn't work, just like everything else, a packet of gum and a pocket knife. Okay, that's not bad. Sidney said. Are you serious? Teddy asked. And he gestured to the knife. You want us to take on those guys with a pocket knife? We have more than just a pocket knife, Sidney answered. And she reached around for her nine millimeter pistol she carried whenever she was at the farm. When Teddy saw the weapon, he immediately stepped back and looked afraid. Where the hell did you get that? Teddy asked. I always have it when I work here. Sidney answered. 
you do? Teddy asked, incredulous. Wow, I didn't know you were so badass. Sydney rolled her eyes, but she couldn't help but blush a little. Yeah, well, it's not like I want to use it. She had plenty of target practice, but this was real life. Even with the gun, we need to be smart, and our first step is to figure out who we're really dealing with. Sydney started to walk back to the farm, but Teddy intercepted her. Whoa, what are you doing? Teddy asked. I told you we need to figure out who those guys are, Sydney answered. We already know what we're dealing with, Teddy replied. There's a big group of maniacs trying to kill us, and they have a bunch of hostages. We don't know what they want. Sydney said. Who cares what they want? Teddy replied. Sydney, look, I get it. You want to help those people. But helping those people is only going to get us killed. We need reinforcements. Sydney liked Teddy, but she finally understood what her father had been telling her all of those years about people being unable to accept the reality of a situation. Teddy, I know this is hard for you to comprehend, Sydney said. But you need to understand we are the only people standing between those guns and our friends on the farm. I'm not saying we're going in guns blazing, but if we can figure out why they're here, we might be able to gain leverage against them. Teddy fidgeted, clearly nervous. Not that Sydney wasn't. But she wasn't going to allow her second family to become fodder for whatever these armed men had planned. This is crazy, Teddy said under his breath. This is absolutely insane. He finally took a deep breath and then stared Sydney in the eye. All right, I'm with you, but let's just try to be quiet and not get caught. I really don't want to die today. That makes two of us, Sydney said. Even though it was going to take longer to get back to the farm on foot, Sydney knew the horse would be too noisy. By the time they returned to the farm, the sun was at its highest peak and both Sydney and Teddy were dripping with sweat, with dust and dirt clinging to their skin. They remained quiet and found cover wherever they could. Eventually, they followed the voices toward the main house on the farm and discovered that was where the gunmen had gathered everyone. But just before she got too close, Teddy called her back and tried to convince her one last time that they should try to find help elsewhere. I'll be fine, Sydney replied. If you want to stay behind, you can, but I'm not leaving our friends behind. Sidney had always liked Teddy, but if he was this frightened about doing something in the face of danger, then perhaps she didn't know him as well as she thought she did. But Teddy took a breath and summoned what courage remained to him. Okay, I'm with you, Teddy said, but you're going to have to tell me what to do. I feel like I'm a liability out here. You're not a liability, Sidney said. Just follow my lead, and thanks for sticking around. This time, when Sidney smiled at him, it was Teddy's turn to blush. He cleared his throat and then changed the subject. Okay, well, what's next? Teddy asked. Sidney didn't really have a foolproof plan other than watch and observe. She hoped that by getting closer to the action, she would be able to learn more about what these gunmen wanted. It was unusual for a farm to be attacked. Follow me, Sydney answered. Stay low and stay quiet. Move where I move, okay? Sydney and Teddy approached the barn first. From what she could tell, the bad guys had taken everyone into the main house, keeping them inside. There were two guards at the front door, and most likely more inside, keeping watch but Sydney also found two more doing a sweep of the property at the farm's entrance. What are they doing? Teddy asked. Sydney shook her head. They're not really doing anything. And then she recalled when these fighters had first arrived. None of them asked for any money. So they clearly weren't here to rob the place. Not that the farm had any cash on hand, which meant they were here for something else. Teddy peeked over Sydney's shoulder to get a better look. Almost looks like they're waiting for something. Sydney nodded and noticed how the patrols were keeping watch near the front entrance of the farm. Yeah, I think you might be right. Come on, let's take a closer look. Closer than this? 
Teddy asked. Sydney and Teddy easily slipped through all the equipment. Using the machines as cover, Sydney kept her head on a swivel, making sure to pay close attention to her surroundings. When they finally moved close enough to hear the pair of men talking, how much longer are we going to stay out here? One of them asked. I don't know, the other answered. I don't understand why we're here in the first place. How the hell did he get the money out here? It was all part of his plan, apparently, the first man answered. Do we even know what happened? The other asked. Like he stole the money, we helped him, and then he turned himself in and shut down the whole city so he could escape? Look, I don't know, he said. All I know is that I'm going to be as far away from this dump as I can get once I get my share of the cash. <laughs> yeah, me too, the other replied. Thank God the stupid device only shut down the city, the first man said. Yeah, I couldn't imagine having the entire country without power, the other replied. At least we still got to keep our phones protected with the rest of our gear. Those Faraday cages were a lifesaver, the first one said. Sydney might have been confused about the money, but she knew about Faraday cages. It was a device used to protect technology from an EMP blast. But it was also good to know the effects of the EMP were limited to Cincinnati and the surrounding area. It would make recovery for the city easier, knowing they could receive resources from the rest of the country. Teddy tapped Sydney on the shoulder, and when she looked at him, he looked like he was going to burst with a secret he couldn't hold in any longer. There was obviously something he wanted to tell her. So they left the two guards and moved to a more private area behind the barn where they could speak. What is it? Sydney asked. You don't know? Teddy answered. The bank robber, Dylan Elliott. I think those guys are working for him. Bank robber? Seriously? Sydney answered. It was the biggest bank robbery in American history, Teddy answered. It was all over the news. You really didn't see it? Just give me the highlights, Sydney answered. Dylan Elliott robbed the Cincinnati Federal Reserve Bank over $100 million, Teddy replied. He was missing for a few days, and then authorities caught him outside of Cincinnati. They've been holding him in custody ever since as they await a trial. But so far, no one has been able to figure out where Dylan stashed the money. Teddy glanced out to the farm with a sense of wonder in his eyes. I can't believe we've been sitting on top of $100 million for over a week. But while Teddy was focused on the money, Sydney was more concerned with the armed men talking about the effects of the EMP. They know about the EMP, Sydney said. Did the news mention anything like that? I don't think so, Teddy answered. But I know Dylan Elliott is a genius sociopath. At least that's what all the news outlets are saying about him. If he's smart enough to rob a bank, then I guess he'd be smart enough to detonate one of those EMP devices you were talking about. If those people were truly responsible for the EMP, then Sydney needed to be careful about engaging them. They were smarter than they looked, and were obviously more prepared than anybody else since they knew the damaging effects the EMP would cause. We should find the money, Teddy said. What? Sydney asked. It's like what you were talking about before, about finding out why they came here, Teddy answered. They stashed the money somewhere around here. If we can take the money, then we'll have leverage to free everybody else inside the house. If they don't know where the money is stashed, how are we supposed to figure it out? Sydney asked. The farm has hundreds of acres. It could be anywhere. Teddy smiled. Maybe, but you're standing with a bank robber expert. I've been obsessed with this story ever since it came out last week. I think I can figure out where Dylan would have stashed the cash. Sydney was glad to see that Teddy was more engaged than before, but she didn't want to turn this into a wild goose chase. Before she could even answer, there was a commotion at the house that pulled both of their attention toward it. One of the guards had pulled a woman out of the house and whisked her away toward the barn. Everyone inside the house was screaming and shouting, but a burst of gunfire quieted them. Oh my God, Teddy said. Sydney tightened her hands into fists 
as she watched the brute carry the woman against her will. It was clear to her what he wanted, and it was clear to her what she needed to do to stop it. Sydney took a step toward the barn, but Teddy stopped her. Let me go, Sydney said. It's not safe, Teddy replied. Let me go. It was obvious to Sydney that he was trying to protect her. But between the two of them, she was the more skilled fighter. She also had the gun on her, and she knew they would be able to level the playing field. I can handle this, Sydney said. Just stay here, okay? Sydney hurried away before Teddy could intervene and set her sights on the barn to stop a horrible atrocity before it was committed. But as she neared the barn, Sydney came to a reckoning of what that meant she would have to do. She had never killed anyone. But this was a different world, and it was more than just her own life that hung in the balance. Chapter 15 the farther they drove away from the city and separated themselves from the chaos that was completely devastating Cincinnati, everyone breathed a collective sigh of relief. But while John was glad his son and the others were more relaxed, they weren't out of the woods, not by a long shot. How's the truck holding up? John asked. Parker had both hands on the wheel, and he checked the dash for a quick readout of the vehicle's vital systems. It's really stiff. We might be leaking steering fluid, but the gas is holding. We're still just below three quarters of a tank, so we shouldn't have to fill up again until we reach our destination. John gestured to the cracked windshield. Are you able to see? Parker nodded. It's not the first time I've driven with some busted glass. When I was in college, I had this old Mazda that I drove longer than I should have. Eventually, it was cheaper to just scrap the car than it was to fix the windshield. But if it gets too bad, I can always stick my head out the window. Parker smiled, and John clapped him on the shoulder as he moved toward the back of the truck. Jake was lying down, his body vibrating from the rough ride the truck provided. He didn't complain, but John knew it had to be uncomfortable for him, considering his injuries. How are you holding up? John asked. Hanging on, partner. Jake answered. Some of the color had returned to Jake's face, which was a good sign, but he was still weak. You need anything? John asked. And then quickly held up his hand before Jake could make a quip. Anything that I can actually give you. Oh, well, in that case, no, Jake answered. John smiled and then looked over at his son. Blake was sitting nearby. He had his head down and his legs dangled off the seat. It was a reminder to both of them of just how young he was and how difficult it must have been for him to handle all of this. And how are you? John asked. Blake kept his head down. Fine. His voice was so quiet against the loud hum of the truck engine. John shifted into the seat next to his son and decided it was time for them to talk about what he'd gone through. But John had never been in this situation before. He didn't know how to handle it, and he certainly didn't understand how all of this had been thrust back at him. He wished his own father was still around. John's dad was a fountain of wisdom. It didn't matter what kind of problem John was dealing with. His father always knew the right thing to say. It wasn't a gift John had inherited. But over the years, he had worked hard to provide insight and knowledge to his children but he feared Blake's trauma was beyond his expertise. How does your arm feel? John asked, pointing to the cast. Blake glanced at his arm only briefly, and then stared back at the ground. He shrugged. It doesn't hurt as much as it did before. Your mom never got a chance to tell me what happened, John said. I wasn't paying attention, Blake said. I know you're telling me I always daydream, but this time it finally got me into a bad situation. It was true that his son kept his head in the clouds. He was very different from his father in that regard. John had always been the salt of the earth type, and Sydney was the same. Blake reminded John of his own mother. 
Blake's grandmother was the kind of woman who spent all day thinking in silence. She barely kept the house clean, and she couldn't cook. But she knew how to make any situation fun. Looking back on the marriage between his parents, John always wondered how the two made it work. They were complete opposites in almost every facet of their lives. But somehow, that made them fit together perfectly. By the time Blake was born, both of John's parents were dead. I wish you could have met your grandparents, John said. You would have liked them, and they would have loved you, especially your grandmother. You and she are very similar. We are? Blake asked. John nodded. Do you know how you always like to have a smiley face on your pancakes? Well, your grandmother was the same way. You mean when she was a kid? Blake asked. John laughed. No, she did that all the way through her life. She told me you're never too old for a smiley face pancake. Blake smiled. Nothing made John happier than seeing his children happy. <laughs> That's pretty cool, Blake said. It is, John said. And then he decided to shift the conversation to a more serious tone. Listen, Blake, about what happened at the hospital. I did what I had to do, Blake said, parroting his father's voice. You did, John said. But taking a life is far more complicated than that. We both have done things today that normal people should never be forced into. I'm so glad you're safe, but I'm so sorry for what you had to do. Me too, Blake said. It's weird because I don't know how I feel about it. Talk it out, John said, hoping they could find a solution to this problem together. Tell me what you're thinking about. When the man was attacking us, I didn't want to fight back, Blake said. Even though I knew he wanted to kill me. But even knowing that, I still didn't want to pull the trigger. It wasn't until I was backed into a corner and didn't have any other choice that I finally did it. And how did that make you feel? John asked. Blake was quiet for a long time. John didn't rush his son, because he wanted him to be able to process his emotions. It made me sad and angry, Blake said. I was sad because I'd taken a life, and I was angry because I didn't have any other choice. I was also angry with myself that I couldn't figure out another way to stop the situation. Blake looked at his father, his eyes wide and pleading. Was there something else I could have done? No, John answered definitively. Blake nodded and stared at the floor again. I guess that means I'm a murderer now. No, John said, forcing his son to look up at him. That is not what you are. And I never want to hear you say that about yourself, okay? You saved Jake and yourself. Without you, who knows what would have happened. But you were not a murderer. Then what am I? Blake asked. John was tongue-tied, unsure of how he should broach the subject. But he decided to channel his own father's voice as he answered. You're Blake Carver, John answered. You're my son. You're a brother and a friend and a good person. And when you were put in a horrible situation, you did everything you could to get out of it. You're a survivor. John wasn't sure if that was the right thing to say. But he wanted to ensure that his son knew he shouldn't feel guilty about defending himself when his life and the lives of the people around him were on the line. If I did something that was so good, then why do I feel so bad? Blake asked because you still have enough empathy to understand that taking a life is serious, John answered. It's a good thing you feel so conflicted about what you did. Don't ever lose that empathy, Blake. It's your superpower. Your dad is right, bud, Jake said, his voice slightly groggy. You should never feel bad for protecting your friends and family. You saved my life. You're a hero. Blake smiled. Thanks, Uncle Jake. You're a good boy, Blake, John said. I love you and I'm proud of you. Thanks, Dad, Blake said. Blake leaned into his father's side and he released the tension in his body. John was glad to be able to carry some of his son's troubles. That was what being a father was all about. 
John waited with his son until Blake had finally fallen asleep. He gently laid Blake down and let him sleep and then rejoined Parker in the front. How's your boy doing? Parker asked. I think he's gonna pull through, John replied. He's stronger than he realizes. Stronger than me, for that I'm thankful. I don't think I could have handled that type of stress at his age, Parker said. After all this is over, I can hook you up with a very good therapist, one who specializes in childhood trauma. I appreciate that, John said. I'm not sure if he'll need it, but it's good to know those resources are available. While John appreciated Parker's concern over his son, what John really wanted to speak about was where Dylan Elliott was taking his wife. You mentioned you were heading south, but you never specifically said where we were going, John said. The moment after Dylan was arrested, we interrogated him about where he stashed the money, Parker said. Over a dozen investigators questioned him, but no one figured it out. How much money did he steal? John asked. One hundred million, Parker answered, and no one could figure out how he had moved so much cash and kept it hidden. It's not like he could have stashed all of it in a duffel bag. How did he move the money he stole from other banks? John asked. He was using semi-trucks to smuggle the bills, Parker answered. But we locked down every road out of Cincinnati after the bank was robbed and we found nothing. The last thing we knew about Dylan's movements before he was captured was that he was heading south. From there, we did our best to piece together locations that would make sense for somebody to store large amounts of money. Because the suburbs of Cincinnati are so dense, we narrowed it down to a few areas. One of them happened to be a farm on the outskirts of the city. John immediately tensed. What farm? One some produce, Parker answered. And then he frowned when he saw John's face. What, you know it? Yes. John answered, feeling a tightness in the pit of his stomach. My daughter works on that farm. She's there today. I had no idea. I'm sorry, Parker said. It's okay, John said. At least now I know where we're going. And with any luck, I'll be able to get my wife and daughter back at the same time. Chapter 16 When Sydney approached the barn, she could hear the muffled cries of a woman inside. She was still resisting her attacker, and Sydney feared that if she waited much longer, it would be too late to stop it. But as she approached the barn, even with a gun in her hand, she couldn't stop her hand from shaking. It felt stupid for her to be so afraid, considering she wasn't the one who was being attacked. The woman needed help, and Sydney dug deep to find her courage. Sydney wasn't sure what she was about to walk into, but she was certain she couldn't sit by and do nothing while the woman suffered. She tightened her grip on the pistol and then turned the corner into the barn. On the other end of the barn, a man was unbuckling his pants as he held the woman down. Just enjoy it, sweetheart, he said. Stop, leave me alone. The woman fought back, but struggled as the man used his brute strength to keep her down. Stop! Sydney raised the weapon as she neared, wanting to get close enough to make sure she didn't miss her shot. But then, Sydney realized the moment she pulled the trigger, everyone in the house would know something was wrong, and the other gunmen would come rushing to help their partner. Sydney saw a shovel nearby and decided to grab that instead on her way over. She was just about to raise the shovel to strike the man when the woman who was being attacked noticed Sydney over her left shoulder. The attacker must have noticed the woman looking at Sydney because the man turned and saw Sydney approaching as well. When everybody made eye contact with each other, time froze. Sydney didn't move, and neither did the criminal. It wasn't until the woman screamed that both of them dove into action. The man shoved the woman to the ground, while Sydney swung the shovel around, missing the gunman, but only barely. The man rushed at Sydney, but she used the shovel to keep him back. Where did you come from, huh? He asked. I should have picked you out instead of that old hag. 
The man lunged forward, snatching the shovel from her hands. Sydney then quickly reached for the pistol. Trying to keep this quiet was unavoidable now. And the only thing that mattered was stopping this man before he could hurt either of them. But the man was quick. And just before Sydney could pull the trigger, the man rushed into her, pushing her over and once again knocking her to the ground, where he used the shovel's handle to pin her down by the throat, as he used his body weight to keep her immobile. Sydney bucked and tried to kick the man off, but he was too heavy. Looks like you and I'll have some fun then now, huh? He laughed. But his victory was short lived. The woman he had originally attacked rushed over to help Sydney. The woman clawed at the man, raking her nails across his cheeks as she wrapped her arms around his neck in a chokehold. With the criminal distracted, Sydney had enough time to get to her feet. But even together, they couldn't keep him down for long. Eventually, he knocked out the other woman and punched Sydney so hard in the stomach that he knocked the wind out of her and dropped her to her knees. Sidney gasped for breath while the criminal towered over her. His face was red, sweaty, and bloodied from where the woman had scratched him. He had an enraged look, and Sidney was certain she would die. In a single desperate attempt for survival, Sidney retreated, searching for another weapon for her to use. But there was nothing. And with all the noise they were making, Sidney feared it was only a matter of time before the criminal's friends joined them in the barn. Just when Sidney thought all hope was lost, she saw the pistol she had dropped earlier. She and her attacker noticed the weapon at the same time. The pair reached for the gun at the same time, but Sidney managed to get both hands on it, while the man only had one. However, he used his other free hand to clamp over Sidney's. The massive size difference in hands gave him the upper hand as she tried to fight him off. The criminal easily peeled Sidney's fingers back from the weapon before she reached the trigger. She fought back, kicking and punching, hitting anything she could reach. But it was useless to fend him off. The criminal held a look of joy as he turned the weapon around on Sidney. With Sidney's hands still on the gun too, it almost looked like she was aiming the pistol at herself. But even more terrifying than the gun aimed at her was the maniacal madness on his face that frightened her the most. It was the look of a man who cared little for life. You're gonna die now, bitch, he said. And then I'm gonna make sure we dump you in the same grave after I'm done with that other whore. Sydney continued to fight and struggle against the criminal. But for the first time in her life, she finally believed that this was going to be the end. She was literally staring down the barrel of her gun. And she never believed she would be in a position like this. Her life was about to be over before it began. It could have been the fact that Sydney suddenly realized she was going to die. Or the idea that this man would continue to spread his evil. But something inside of Sydney provided her with a primal burst of strength and speed. She would never be able to tell where it came from or how it had happened. But she swung her fist around and planted a stiff right hook against the criminal's face. The force of the blow knocked the man off balance. And he lost his grip on the pistol. She quickly took control of the gun and then made sure she was in a good shooter's stance. Once her feet were planted on the ground, her shoulders squared with both hands on the gun, she placed her finger on the trigger. She remembered her father telling her how important it was to be certain when you pulled the trigger. And in that moment, she had never been more certain of anything else. Sydney squeezed the trigger three times, putting all three bullets into the criminal's chest. Each percussive blast sent a kickback of resistance through Sydney's arms when she fired again. And just like that, the criminal stumbled backward until he fell to the ground. At first, there wasn't any blood. But then his shirt was suddenly stained in blossoms of crimson flowers. His blood bubbled up as the criminal's final heartbeats sputtered. And then finally, he was still. 
he would never hurt anybody else again. Frankie. The voice was coming from inside the house, and Sydney realized the other criminals had heard the gunshot. She located the woman who had attacked and saw she had been knocked unconscious. And she tried waking her. Hey, we need to get up, she said, gently patting the woman on the cheek. But it did nothing. Sydney glanced over her shoulder at the barn's entrance and realized they were never going to make it out of there in time. It might have been possible for her to leave alone, but Sydney wouldn't abandon this woman after they had fought together. She aimed her pistol at the entrance, prepared to make her last stand. But then she heard a familiar voice nearby. Hey, hey, over here. Sydney glanced out one of the barn windows and saw Teddy waving his arms, catching the attention of the criminals who were sprinting toward them. Teddy was completely unarmed, and Sydney feared they'd kill him. But Teddy's distraction didn't take all the criminals. A few lingered behind, and they started to jog over to the barn to investigate the shooting. Sydney had a decision to make. As the adrenaline wore off, she started to think more clearly. She could make a stand against the men coming, which would in all likelihood end with both of them dead, or she could hide. The empty stalls had plenty of hay, and Sydney had used them as hiding spaces ever since she was a little girl. She knew it would help them conceal themselves from the men, so Sydney grabbed hold of the woman and dragged her to the nearest stall. They disappeared just as the men entered, and Sydney covered them quickly but Sydney made sure to keep one small little opening so she could see what was going on. Frankie, the first man shouted, and he rushed to Frankie's side. But as the man checked his comrade, it was clear to him he was dead, and he slammed his fist into the dirt. That fucking bitch. He glanced around, hoping to find her, and when he looked into the stalls where Sydney was hiding, she feared they had been found out. But Sydney breathed a sigh of relief as his eyes passed over them without even noticing. Hey, we need to make sure we're thinking straight about this, the other man said, trying to calm the first man down. We have guns and vehicles and more manpower than we need to handle any situation. We will find out who did this. Just do me a favor, he said, his chest heaving up and down with each deep breath. I get to kill them when we find them. Fine the calmer man said. They had survived the first brush with death, but the threat was still hanging over their lives. Sydney had no idea what came next, but she hoped Teddy was faster than he looked. Chapter 17 It took a moment for the information Agent Parker had shared with John to sink in. The fact that Dylan Elliott, who had already kidnapped his wife, was currently heading to the same farm where his daughter worked an after-school program was the worst possible outcome. John, you all right? Parker asked. I know the place we're going, John answered. My daughter works there. Are you serious? Parker asked. Unfortunately, yes, John answered. Parker sat with this new information for a moment. But then his surprise turned to suspicion. Your family seems to be unusually involved in all of this, John. If there's something you want to say, just go ahead and say it, John replied. After everything they'd gone through from the start, John hoped he had earned at least a little bit of trust with Agent Parker. Then Parker realized it was simply all a terrible misfortune rather than anything nefarious. I need to know everything you do about Dylan Elliott, John said. He's extremely intelligent and very driven, Parker said. He's been in and out of jail since he was a teenager. By the time he was 19, he was already arrested for a felony. He had orchestrated a jewelry heist, and the only reason he got caught was because there was an undercover police officer working a sting unit in the area. He had caught wind of Dylan's plan, and it was stopped. But that has been the only mistake Dylan has made since. Of course, until he was caught last week after robbing Cincinnati's Federal Reserve Bank. So you're telling me that Dylan, 
who has never made a mistake, was suddenly caught after the biggest heist of his career? John asked. I know what you're thinking, Parker answered. And there was a lot of debate in the department on whether he allowed himself to be caught. But considering everything that happened with this EMP, if he was indeed responsible for it, then it's clear to me he was captured for a reason. Any theories on what that reason might be? John asked. I've tried to wrap my brain around why he did it, but I haven't liked any of the answers I've come up with, Parker answered, because they all point to the fact that he is just smarter than us. Maybe the answer is the simplest one, John said. Parker was quiet for a moment, and then he frowned. He wanted us to catch him because he wanted us to stop looking for him. Of course, we're still looking for the money, but he was still the big prize. And we were so convinced we could get him to confess to where he had stashed the money that we didn't really look for it anymore. He was buying himself time to move it to a more secure location with his team. But why would he choose to take all that money to a farm in the middle of nowhere? So much cash to move, and we locked down all the roads. But this time it was John's turn to burn some gray matter on the issue. And he believed he had some insight into why the farm had been chosen. The river, John said. What? Parker asked. Dylan needs a way to move the money, right? John asked. Right, Parker answered. Winsome's produce is situated on the Ohio River, John answered. It's one of the reasons their farm has been so productive since its inception, because it's right on the water. It never has to worry about drought, and the river is wide enough and deep enough to handle a large vessel. Parker shook his head. If they decided to do that, then they would stick out like a sore thumb on the river. It's too slow, and they would be sitting ducks for the authorities. Not if the authorities were busy with an EMP, John said. Think about it. I bet your team never considered checking the river systems to look for them, right? I guess you're right, Parker said. And in all our meetings, nobody ever thought to look at the water even before we found him. His main methods of transportation had always been two vehicles. He would use semi-trucks to smuggle money in and out of the state. Parker looked at John and studied him for a moment. Don't take this the wrong way, but you're much smarter than you look. Don't let these work boots fool you, John said. Parker laughed. And it helped break up the tension as they reached John's house in the suburbs. It wasn't as crazy as the rest of Cincinnati. But John saw signs of unrest in the neighborhoods. A few shops had their windows smashed, along with a few cars that looked looted. But because people weren't stacked on top of one another, the area had remained relatively calm since the EMP. John directed Parker through the neighborhood until they reached their house. When they pulled into the driveway, all the neighbors walked outside to see what was happening. John, where the hell did you get that thing? Ben Mitzi was John's neighbor on the left. He owned several restaurants around town, but hardly ever worked anymore due to some health issues. Can't talk right now, Ben, John said. But as he finished the sentence, he noticed that half of the neighborhood was walking over to him. It was clear they were all interested in discovering how he had a working vehicle and whether he knew what was going on. The neighborhood knew John and his family were preppers. He had talked to several of them to help make sure they were prepared for emergency situations. But they had always brushed him off, never believing the impossible could happen to them. Until now. Before things got out of hand, John made sure to keep the crowd back so Parker could help bring Jake out of the back of the truck. I know y'all have questions, John said. Right now, the only thing I can tell you is that the power is out, but it's only limited to the Cincinnati area. The power will eventually come back on, but we don't know when that'll happen, so ration your food and water. If you have any medications that need to be filled, I would walk to the nearest pharmacy and see if anyone is working. I'm sure if you explain the situation, they will be more than willing to help you out, especially if you're able to go to your own pharmacist. The crowd became more anxious. And John hoped he didn't rile everybody up and make them uneasy. But he didn't know how to say anything else besides the truth. 
Do you really think it's going to be that bad? Ben asked, acting as the spokesperson for the entire group. It will be as bad as people allow it to be, John said. Every time I talk to all of you about being prepared, I've always mentioned how important community plays in that role. Everybody here has a chance to help one another. We have a duty and responsibility to make sure the people around us are okay. What about you? Ben asked. Clearly, you have resources. Will you be sharing them with the community? Ben glanced around, noting how everyone was hanging on his reply. But John had never been good at political games, so he stuck with the truth. John told everyone about the situation with his family, how the bank robber had his wife hostage, and how they were heading to the farm where Sidney worked in hopes of rescuing both of them. I'll give you what resources I can spare, John said, but my main priority is to get my family. Ben immediately backed down after that. And it was clear to everyone in the neighborhood that John put his family as a priority, and that wasn't something anyone could blame him for. I'm sorry to hear that, Ben said. And then he turned to the other neighbors. We are a resilient community. Why don't we start by seeing who needs supplies and if there's anybody who needs medical help? Everyone nodded in agreement, and the crowd dispersed. John waited until they were heading back to their homes before he helped Parker carry Jake into the house. It looks like you have a nice standing in the community, Parker said. I know these people, John said. They might be afraid, but they're not criminals. Most of the people in Cincinnati weren't criminals either, Parker said. And look how that turned out. That's different, John said. The people out here take pride in their community. We know each other, and we know each other's families. Everybody here has worked incredibly hard for the small pieces of life they've carved out. They're not going to throw all that away so easily. They headed inside and made sure Jake was comfortable on the couch. And then John immediately headed for the gun safe in the basement. He grabbed a flashlight on his way down because he knew it would be dark and carefully navigated the steps downstairs. John opened the gun safe and removed the weapons. He had hunting rifles and one assault rifle he had purchased and used occasionally at the firing range. He understood what kind of weapon this was meant to be. It was used for war. And John had every intention of using it to inflict pain on the people who had taken his wife. John, Parker said, walking up behind him in the darkness of the basement. Why don't you let me finish this? You have your son here and friend who is injured. They need your help. I'm not going to leave the fate of my wife to somebody I don't know, John said. I don't mean any offense to you, Agent Parker, but I feel better about my wife's prospects knowing I'm going to be there to try to get her out. What if I order you not to come, Parker said. John stopped what he was doing and turned around. He didn't shine his flashlight in Parker's face, but even in the dimly lit setting, he could tell that Parker was serious. I will tell you that the only way I'm not going is if I'm not breathing. John said. John wasn't sure if Parker was going to use force against him, but before the situation escalated between them any further, there were cries for help upstairs. Dad, Blake shouted. John hurried past Parker and rushed up the steps. He was afraid something had happened to Jake, but when he reached the first floor, he saw another one of his neighbors in the doorway. It was Margaret Baker from three houses down. She was hysterical and sobbing and speaking so fast that John couldn't even understand what she was saying. Eventually, John managed to get her to calm down. And she was able to speak more coherently. Sarah, my daughter, she's going into shock, Margaret said. She doesn't have any more insulin. I was supposed to pick up her prescription today, but then the power went out and the car won't start and... It's okay, John said, calming the woman down. Where's her pharmacy? It's over in Inglewood, Margaret answered. John knew that place was at least 30 minutes away, even with a vehicle. That wasn't time he could afford to spend on another mission when his wife's life was in the balance. But he also couldn't leave Margaret and her daughter hanging when he had a working car and could get there quickly. There's a closer pharmacy, John said. We can run up there and grab the insulin and bring it back. 
Margaret lunged forward and hugged John tightly. Thank you so much. John wanted to tell her not to thank him yet because there was no guarantee that the pharmacy nearby would even have the medicine. But right now it was their best chance at finding it quickly. Stay here and watch Jake, okay? John asked, looking at his son. Blake nodded, and as John studied his son, he noticed a change in his demeanor. He wasn't as timid and frightened as he was before. And John wondered what had changed. It's okay, Dad, Blake answered. It's like you said, we all need to help. John had never been more proud of his son than at that moment. It wasn't easy to do the right thing in times of crisis. But he was happy to see that his son was rising to the challenge. Just stay here and I'll be back as soon as I can, John said. Parker emerged from the basement and he locked eyes with John. They still hadn't finished the conversation from down below. And John wondered if Parker was still going to be a stickler about following protocol. But after John filled Parker in on the situation with Margaret's little girl, he softened up a bit. I'll come with you, Parker said. John didn't object because he wasn't sure what kind of trouble they might run into on the road. But he wanted to finish the conversation about going after Dylan and recovering his wife. Because John was more familiar with the area, he drove while Parker rode shotgun. It was difficult to see through the cracked windshield but John navigated the road fairly easily. Have you driven one of these things before? Parker asked. I did a few hauls in my early 20s for a trucking company one summer, John answered. This isn't the first big rig I've driven. Parker nodded. It was awkward between them, but John still wanted to finish the conversation from earlier. I'm coming with you, John said. It would be better for both of us if you accepted that fact. Parker was quiet for a long time, and John wondered if things would turn violent. That was the last thing he wanted, but he wouldn't let anyone come between him and reaching his wife. When Parker finally spoke, he surprised John. I was working a case three years ago, Parker said. It was the first one I was appointed as lead. Nothing was going to stop me from catching the perp, but... I ended up breaking the cardinal rule of police work and was making promises I couldn't keep to the family of the victim. It didn't end well. I'm sorry, John said. You never know what's gonna happen when you work a case, Parker said. And considering how smart and dangerous Dylan Elliot is, I don't think this is a good idea, but I'm not gonna stand in your way. Thank you, John said. I just hope history doesn't repeat itself. Parker said. That makes two of us, John replied. John made good time on the drive to the nearest pharmacy. Just like the rest of the suburbs, the pharmacy wasn't looted and smashed to bits. There was actually a line coming out of the door where people waited patiently for their medications. The pedestrians looked at the old army truck as if it were Santa and his eight flying reindeer. But once John explained the situation with the insulin, no one objected to allowing them to cut to the front of the line. The pharmacist was a young man, looking barely old enough to have graduated college. He was sweaty and his hair was a mess. He was clearly overwhelmed, but he was still here, still working and trying to make a difference by keeping the doors open and keeping everyone calm. I only have one dose of insulin left, the young pharmacist said. And it's for him. The pharmacist gestured to the man at the front of the line. And John saw it was a middle-aged man who looked in good health. But diabetes was a silent killer. And anyone who needed insulin to survive wouldn't last long without it. John wasn't sure if Margaret's daughter had the time it would take to go to another store. Not to mention, every second that John spent chasing insulin was one less he had to reach his wife. I'm sorry. The man said, but I'm almost out. There's a girl in my neighborhood is already going into shock from insulin withdrawal, John said. I'm not sure how much longer she's gonna last. The pharmacist had already brought out the vial for the medication, and it was sitting on the counter. All John had to do was snatch it and then wave his gun at anyone who dared challenge him. 
but if he wanted people to obey the laws, then he couldn't put himself above it. It would have to be this man's choice of whether he wanted to give up his medicine. The man reached for the package on the counter, and he stared at it for a moment. But then he handed it to John. Take it, he said. I have more time than she does. Thank you, John said. You just saved a life. John rushed back to the truck with the medicine in hand and tossed it to Agent Parker. He reversed out of the pharmacy parking lot and sped down the road to the neighborhood. When John returned to his residential street, he saw a group of people gathering around Margaret's house. John honked his horn and forced them to clear a path as he pulled into the driveway. He never turned off the truck as he rushed inside with the medicine, meeting Margaret at the door. And you're sure it hasn't been compromised, Morgan asked. I know this has to be refrigerated. It's good, John answered. John followed Margaret into her daughter's room, where she lay on a bed, sweating and unconscious. Margaret quickly prepared the medicine and then injected it into the back of her daughter's arm. Margaret breathed a sigh of relief, but she still looked worried. We've done what we can. Uh, this should buy us some time. She walked over to John and hugged him. There's nothing I can do or say to thank you for what you did. You saved her life. John didn't know what else to say, so he simply said he was happy to help. And then when he stepped out of the house, everyone applauded. John had never been somebody who reveled in the spotlight. He enjoyed staying in the background, keeping his head down and focused on his work. But even he had to admit that it felt good. Once all the people dispersed, John returned to the truck where Parker was still waiting for him. You seem to be a man of the people, Parker said. I'm just trying to do the right thing, John replied and he backed out of the driveway and drove over to his house. Parker was quiet for a moment, but then he turned in his seat so he could face John directly. What we're about to walk into when we go and intercept Dylan will be unlike anything you've faced before. I understand you want to be a part of your wife's rescue, but you're not a fighter. He held up his hands before John could argue with him. I know you can fight, but there's a difference between knowing how to fight and being a fighter. It doesn't matter what I am, John said. You show up for your family, no matter how bad the situation is. Parker nodded. It was clear to him now that John wasn't going to back down. Okay, then we should go. There's one more thing I have to do first, John said. And then he stepped out of the vehicle. John walked back into the house where he found Blake standing guard over Jake on the couch. He had brought Jake water and made sure he took the medicine the doctor had given them when they were at the hospital. Blake, John said, getting his son's attention. There's something you need to do for me and for Jake. What is it, Dad? Blake asked. You need to take Jake to the bug out shelter, John answered. Blake frowned. But I thought we were staying to help people. I am not going to risk your life for anyone, John said. You remember how I taught you how to drive mom's car? Blake nodded. After the neighborhood settles down, I want you and Jake to get into that car and then drive toward our cabin, John said. Once I have your mother and sister, I'll meet you there. It was strange how, just earlier this morning, Blake seemed so much younger but now he looked far older than he should have. But the world had forced his hand to grow up, and all John wanted was to ensure Blake survived. Okay, Blake said. I'll make sure we get there, Jake replied. You don't think I can drive? Blake asked. Are you sure you can see over the dash? Jake answered playfully. John was glad his friend had his sense of humor back, but he wanted them to remain focused. Don't stop for anybody, John said. No matter what happens, keep going. Repeat that back to me. I won't stop for anything, no matter what, Blake said. John nodded, glad that his son understood the assignment. I love you very much, John said. I love you too, Dad, Blake said. 
John held his son one more time before he walked out of the house. He didn't want to leave Blake and Jake behind, but he knew they would be far safer at the cabin. But while John was afraid, he was also determined to rescue his wife and daughter. He was going to save them regardless of what happened to him. He would give his life for his family. And it was time to put his money where his mouth was. Chapter 18 The longer Sydney hid in the hay with the woman, the more she regretted her decision to hide out in the first place. The hay was hot and itchy, and it was becoming increasingly difficult for her to keep still and for the woman to remain quiet. The woman was whimpering in her sleep, and Sydney placed a firm but gentle hand over her mouth to muffle the noise. How did she even get his gun? The two men who had entered the barn after the gunshots were still pacing around the dead man, Frankie. The two men were complete opposites. The short one was angry, but the taller one was calm. I don't know, the calmer man answered but that guy the others are chasing might know what happened. We catch him and we'll get the answers we need. I don't care about the answers, the angry one shouted. I want blood for the death of my brother. We'll make sure that his death doesn't go unanswered, the calm one replied. Now come on, we need help with the search. You go, the angry man said. I want to stay here for a minute longer. The calmer man didn't object and it looked like he was relieved he no longer had to be in the same barn as his comrade. The woman next to Sydney started breathing heavier, and she pressed her palm harder over the woman's mouth to keep her quiet. But when she moved, the hay rustled, and it caught the angry man's attention. Sydney froze as the angry man turned toward the noise. Through the strands of the hay, she saw the angry gunman staring right at them but she wasn't sure whether he could see them. Sydney was convinced that the guy was going to find and kill them in an instant. But Sydney reminded herself she still had her gun, and if she needed to, she could shoot him before he killed them. But if they were found out now, the gunfire would draw more attention to them, and Sydney wouldn't be able to carry the unconscious woman to safety. The man raised his gun and was aiming at Sydney but she still couldn't tell whether he truly saw her. It was as though he wasn't sure himself. Just when the gunman was about to step into the stall, the horse next to them whinnied. The man jumped and then grew embarrassed over the fact that he had let an animal frighten him. He angrily kicked the horse's stall, and it jumped and whinnied even louder than before. Stupid horse, he said. And then he finally walked away. It wasn't until Sydney couldn't hear the man's footsteps anymore that she finally allowed herself to breathe. But she was suddenly claustrophobic, hyperventilating as she escaped the hay. All the adrenaline that she'd been holding suddenly came out all at once, and she couldn't sit still no matter how hard she tried. She was crawling out of her skin, and when she saw the man she had killed, all she could think about was the anger and fear that had brought her to do it. It took all of Sydney's control not to scream at the top of her lungs, but she had just evaded capture by all those gunmen, and she didn't want to tempt fate. Sydney turned to the woman in the hay and quickly removed her, too. She didn't know how much time Teddy's distraction was going to give her, but she didn't want to waste it. Laura, Sydney said, tapping the woman's cheek once she removed most of the hay. Laura, hey, you need to wake up. Sydney tapped the woman's head and shoulders harder to wake her, and Laura eventually opened her eyes. There we go, Sydney said. I need you to get up, and we need to move quickly. Laura was clearly disoriented, but she managed to get to her feet. We need to move, Sydney said. Move where? Laura asked. There's nowhere for us to go. Laura grew louder the more she started to wake up, but Sydney quieted her. There's a storm cellar outside the main house. It's hidden, and I don't think the criminals are going to bother to look down there. It's the best place for everybody to hide until help arrives. 
Sydney glanced out the window from the barn to the house and saw only one person guarding the front door. Okay, here's the plan, Sydney said, looking back at Laura. It was a mixture of fear and anger. I'm gonna take out the guard at the door. I need you to cause a distraction for me while I sneak up from behind. How am I supposed to do that? Laura asked. Act like you're hurt, Sydney answered. I am hurt, Laura replied angrily. Good, then it'll be easy for you, Sydney said. Are you with me? Yes, Laura answered. Good, I want you to get as close as you can to him before he sees you, Sydney said. And then from there, I'll sneak up from behind him and take him out. But we need to make sure we are being as quiet as possible. The last thing we want to do is draw attention to ourselves that we could cause others to come back before we've moved everybody out of the house. Sydney wasn't sure how Laura would respond under pressure. She had just been in a very brutal altercation, and it was clear she still hadn't fully recovered. But the experience seemed to have hardened her against the fear of what they were facing. Okay, Laura said definitively. I can do that. Good, Sydney answered. Then let's get ourselves in position. But just as Sydney and Laura were about to help the others in the house, she heard the unmistakable sound of gunfire coming from the river. Hey, Laura said. Are we doing this? It was clear to Sydney that Teddy wasn't going to make it on his own. But she also knew she wouldn't be able to help Teddy and everybody inside the house simultaneously. She had to make a choice. Save Teddy or save the rest of the farm employees. Sydney, Laura said. I know, Sydney said but before she was able to make a commitment either way, she heard the radio of the guard at the house. He's here, the man at the house said, speaking into the radio. I repeat, he's here. Sydney didn't know what he was talking about at first, but then all she had to do was look to the entrance of the farm, where she saw a truck driving into the parking lot. Laura walked up behind her as they remained in the barn, and Sydney suddenly realized they had lost their opportunity to escape as the other gunmen returned. Sydney's heart caught in her throat when she saw them coming over the ridge. She was livid with herself for allowing it to happen. She shouldn't have put it in Teddy's head to be so brave because now she feared it had gotten him killed. But as the others returned, Sydney's heart skipped a beat when she saw one of the men dragging Teddy by the collar. He was alive. When he moved closer, Sydney saw he'd been beaten up a little bit, but he was still breathing. Sydney sighed with relief. There was always a chance to save someone so long as they were still breathing. And Sydney clung to that bit of hope. But Sydney's hope was short lived as she saw the men gather around the truck that had just arrived. It was clearly someone who was important, and Sydney suspected. It was the leader of this horrible group of men. What now? Laura asked. Sydney focused on the large group gathering around the truck. The driver was greeted with open arms by the other criminals. But when Sydney finally caught a good look at the person in the passenger seat, she felt her blood run cold. Of all the people who could have been pulled out from the inside of the truck, seeing her mother didn't even make the list. Who is that with them? Laura asked. Is that your mom? It is, Sydney answered. And now she had even more reason to save these people, because they didn't just have her friends. They had her family, too. Chapter 19 The closer they approached Tanner's farm, the more anxious Maggie became. Dylan had no idea her daughter worked at the farm, and she prayed to keep it that way. But it was clear to Dylan that something was bothering her. He continued to glance over at her just before they arrived at the farm. Look, Dylan said, and he sighed. I'm sorry about earlier, but you have to understand that I will follow through on my threats. Maggie relaxed slightly 
realizing that Dylan simply thought she was nervous because of the people he killed at the diner. You're a murderer, Maggie said. It doesn't exactly make me feel great about the prospect of my future. People worry about the future too much, Dylan said. They forget to live in the moment. Every second a person uses to worry about something is wasted. Because we're all headed toward the same eventual end. And is that how you justify your evil? Maggie asked. For the record, I didn't want to hurt anybody, Dylan answered. But you forced my hand. When people think you don't follow through on what you say, they won't likely take you seriously. But I know you will take me seriously now. They drove past the signs farm at the entrance, and Maggie braced herself for what she would find. It took all of Maggie's concentration not to dissolve into a puddle of anxiety. She wasn't sure how she was going to react if she saw her daughter. But she knew the moment Dylan understood her relationship with Sydney, then he would immediately use that as leverage against her. A group of armed men greeted them as Dylan drove into the parking lot. Maggie searched through the faces, looking for Sydney, but she didn't see anyone she recognized. That was until she came across the face of a young boy. It was Teddy. Maggie had met him a few times before. He was in the same grade as Sydney, and Maggie had always believed the boy had a crush on her daughter. Teddy had welts and bruises all over his face from a beating. Maggie prayed her daughter was in better health. After Dylan received his hero's welcome, Maggie was pulled from the truck. The men who removed her from the passenger seat handled her roughly and tightened the handcuffs around her wrists, keeping her restrained. What do you want us to do with her? The man standing next to Maggie asked. Oh, this one is special, Dylan answered. She will have a place of honor amongst the rest of the group. She stays with us. We still have a house full of the workers another man said, stepping forward. One of them escaped and killed Frankie. Maggie studied Dylan very closely. She saw that mask he wore so well, crack under the announcement. For a moment, Maggie saw the sociopath who was capable of murder. Frankie is dead, Dylan asked. We think this kid is the one who did it, another one said. And he gestured for Teddy to be brought forward. Teddy was presented to Dylan and then shoved to his knees. The kid was bloodied from his encounter with Dylan's men. But to his credit, he didn't keep his head down. He looked up at Dylan and refused to look away. He's tougher than he looks, huh? Dylan asked. Did you kill my guy? Teddy remained silent. There's also a woman we can't find, the man said. Frankie tried to have some alone time, and that's when he died. Oh, I see, Dylan said. So Frankie tried to squeeze some of his love juice out onto some poor woman. He laughed, and then the other men chuckled. But the moment they started laughing, Dylan dropped his playful act. What did I tell everybody here about making mistakes? Everyone was silent. All of them were afraid of Dylan. Even with so many against him, he still managed to keep them in check through fear. But Maggie supposed there wasn't much else to control evil men like this in their line of work. Dylan, it was Frankie, one of them said. You know how he gets. It's like trying to cage a wild animal. That may be, Dylan said. But you know the rules. Oh, fuck the rule. The man never got a chance to finish a sentence before Dylan shot him in the head. The man crumpled to the ground, and his body lay next to Teddy, who was still kneeling in front of Dylan. Some blood splatter covered a Dylan's cheeks, and he smeared it across his face in an attempt to wipe it away, but only spread it around. Dylan studied the rest of the group, daring anyone else to speak up, but they all remained silent. No more mistakes, Dylan said, then glanced down at Teddy. As for you, well, you killed one of my guys, so you have to die. Dylan aimed the gun at Teddy, and Maggie couldn't keep quiet anymore. Stop, Maggie shouted. Dylan looked at Maggie, 
keeping the weapon aimed at Teddy. He studied her, wondering why she had stuck her neck out to save him. And Maggie tried to give him an answer before he came up with one on his own. He's just a kid, Maggie said. And you're not even sure if he's the one who killed your guy. What if it was the woman Frankie attacked? Doesn't that make more sense? Teddy was breathing heavily now, on the verge of tears. But he didn't let them fall. He was barely holding on to what courage he had left. Maggie held Dylan's gaze, wondering why she had been so desperate to save Teddy's life. You're right, Dylan said quickly, and then he holstered his pistol. Unless this kid is going to confess, we don't know for sure whether he killed Frankie. He lives for now. Teddy heaved a sob of relief, and he was picked up and dragged away by the other men. Dylan, on the other hand, walked over to Maggie, keeping his eyes on her as he approached. He got so close that Maggie had to turn her head away, lest she would have been pressed up against his chest. Maggie, are you not telling me something? Dylan asked, because I'm getting the sense that you're keeping secrets, and I don't appreciate that. I'm not keeping anything from you, Maggie said. You remember what I told you about breaking the rules, Dylan said. And just so we're clear, lying to me is breaking the rules. Maggie turned her head up so she saw Dylan's face. And all of her fear was decidedly overpowered by her anger toward this man. And just so we're clear, Maggie said, I will be the one who kills you when all of this is said and done. Dylan smiled. I knew I liked you. He stepped back and then addressed the rest of the men. Who wants to get paid? The men raised their rifles and arms high into the air as they cheered. The only thing they cared about was getting their money. And Dylan had tapped into that greed to convince them to follow him. Dylan ordered everybody in the house to be brought outside. Maggie was afraid that one of the farm workers who knew her daughter worked here would rat her out. But everybody was so afraid of Dylan's men that nobody even looked up to notice her. Everyone was marched out into the field. And Maggie and Teddy were paired up with each other in front of the rest of the group. Teddy limped along, struggling to keep up with a frenzied pace set by Dylan's men. Maggie was desperate to know what had happened to Sydney, because she didn't find her daughter among the group that Dylan's men had escorted outside. But she didn't want to start talking to Teddy and look suspicious. So she had to wait until they had a little bit of privacy. Are you okay? Maggie asked, her voice barely a whisper. Teddy nodded picking up on the sign they should be very quiet as they spoke. Where is Sydney? Maggie asked. I don't know, Teddy answered. That guy the others were talking about, Frankie, he attacked Laura and Sydney went to intervene. I think it was Sydney who killed him. Maggie shuddered, but she found solace in the fact that Sydney was still alive. Maybe she was hiding somewhere on the farm. I'm sorry, Mrs. Carver. Teddy said, keeping his voice low. I should have done more to protect her. She's alive, Maggie said. That's enough for now. Don't beat yourself up over it. But it was clear that Teddy was still distraught, and it was obvious to Maggie that he cared about her daughter. Maggie wanted to provide more words of comfort, but she didn't want to risk anybody else overhearing the conversation. It was risky enough to talk as much as they did. Maggie had only visited the farm a couple of times, so she didn't know the area very well. She had no idea where Dylan was leading everybody as they marched deep into the fields. Maggie glanced behind her and couldn't see the main house or barn anymore over the hills. But she heard the distinct sound of water, and they eventually reached the river that cut through the property. Maggie didn't know what Dylan had planned, or if he expected everybody to swim across but she noticed something coming down the river. Dylan forced everybody to line up along the riverbank. They stood there for a moment, unable to see what was coming toward them. But as it drew closer, Maggie realized it was a barge. Everybody asked, how the hell do you make $100 million disappear? 
Dylan asked as the barge came closer. And my answer was to put it in plain sight. The authorities were so used to us moving our goods via freight. That's what they assumed we would use this time. But that's exactly what I wanted them to think. He held up his hand, reveling in the attention everyone was giving him. The Ohio River moves more product through this state than all the highways combined. And it's also the least monitored by state authorities, which is good news for us. The rest of the men chuckled as the barge neared the shoreline, but never approached it. The vessel was probably too big to get close to the shore without a dock, lest they run aground. While the authorities are sifting through the rubble created by the EMP, we will be on our boats to the Caribbean with all of our money, Dylan said. And then we get to fucking party, one of them shouted. And that caused a bigger uproar than all the other cheers combined. The men danced around as if they had just won the lottery. And in some respects, Maggie figured they had. But their celebration went beyond enjoyment. There was a madness to it, along with an unbridled sense of desire, the kind that could never be slaked. The only thing these men cared about was the money they had stolen. But while everybody was jumping around and celebrating, Maggie noticed that Dylan was the only one who didn't have a smile on his face. If anything, he looked like he was disappointed, but Maggie wasn't sure why. Slowly and deliberately, Dylan made everybody settle down. Once the craze had ended, he raised his voice. Now, obviously, we can't leave any survivors, Dylan said. Maggie glanced around at the farmhands, who were all trembling. Then she saw Tanner, the owner of the farm, step forward. Let these people go, Tanner said. You have what you came for, and you don't need to hurt anyone else. Need, Dylan said. Now that's a funny word, isn't it? I don't need the money I stole, but I want it. And perhaps I want to shed more blood. The rest of the group once again cheered, and it was clear to Maggie that Dylan had no intentions of letting any of them go. It had all been a ploy to give them false hope. And now that hope had run out. Everybody step forward into the river, Dylan said. At first, nobody moved. But then Dylan fired a warning shot, and everyone walked until they were ankle deep in the river. But Maggie and Teddy were forced to stay back, held by two guards. The four of them behind everyone else as the rest of Dylan's men approached the water and aimed their weapons at the farmhands. The world doesn't work the way you want it to. So you have to bend it to your will, Dylan said. I wish all of you would have realized that sooner. But alas, I'm afraid there is nothing more we can do about that. Don't do this, Maggie shouted, looking at Dylan. Please, these are good people. But Dylan no longer wore his charismatic mask. He was the sociopath right now with nothing stopping him from killing. Maggie looked away as Dylan raised his arm. She couldn't watch another massacre, not like she had witnessed in the diner. She didn't have the stomach, so she turned away. It wasn't until Maggie heard the screams of everyone through the ringing in her ears that she looked up again and opened her eyes. All the gunmen who had stepped forward to kill the farmhands now lay dead. The two men who had kept Maggie and Teddy back had shot and killed their own people. Well, Dylan said, now that that's done. Dylan whistled and then waved his hands, and a boat departed from the barge and made its way over to the shore. Maggie suddenly realized that Dylan had planned on killing his men all along. Dylan walked over to Maggie, smiling. I told you once before that I am a man of my word, Dylan said. And you and I have more than just a bright future ahead of us. I told you that I'm not going with you, Maggie said. I think you'll change your mind, Dylan replied. Because if you don't come with me, then I'm going to kill all of your friends here. So you have to decide what you want, a future with me 
one where your friends here live, or a future without me in which you're responsible for all these people's deaths. It was an impossible choice, but Maggie already had her answer. She wasn't going to allow anyone else to die because of her. Even if that meant surviving in a living nightmare with Dylan Elliot. Chapter 20 If John could have forced the old army truck to move any faster, he would have. But he already had the gas pedal to the floor, maxing out the old truck's top speed. Thankfully, the roads weren't as blocked with stalled vehicles like they were in the city, which made it easier to move quickly. But Parker didn't appreciate the frantic speed. You know, I'd like to make it there without dying, Parker said. Just stay focused, John said. I want us to be ready for anything when we arrive. They were getting closer, and with every mile John chewed up on the road, he felt his grip tighten on the steering wheel. He was tense and angry, but he couldn't allow his emotions to get the better of him. If he allowed that to happen, then he would lose control. And that would only hurt his family. Listen, Parker said, if you're right about the farm, and that's where Dylan was heading, and he still has your wife as hostage. You need to be prepared for what happens during that negotiation. I assume you have some type of hostage negotiating training? John asked. No, Parker answered. Do you? I'm not really in the mood for jokes, John answered. Sorry, Parker replied. Sorry, Parker replied. Humor was something Willows and I always used before a big moment. It's how we calmed our nerves. Both John and Parker were wound up tight. This was by far the most high-stress situation John had encountered. The stakes were literally life and death. And the fact that his family were the ones at risk only made the situation more nerve-wracking. Are you sure you're up for this? Parker asked, picking up on John's nerves. It's okay to say no. What we're about to walk into isn't easy to process, you know? Yeah, I know, John answered. And then he relaxed his grip on the steering wheel, feeling his joints ache a little as he wiggled them around. I understand that I don't have the type of training you do, so when we get there, I will follow your lead. But I am not going to put my family at risk for the sake of you catching your bank robber. Fair, Parker said. But don't get in my way when I go after him, okay? Just before they neared the farm's entrance, John pulled the truck to the side of the road and they walked the rest of the journey. They wanted to maintain the element of surprise as much as possible, and the army truck drew too much attention. The walk to the farm allowed John to focus on something other than his nerves. The simple act of moving made it easier for him to expel some of his built-up adrenaline. He wanted to sprint toward the farm, but he maintained a steady pace as he followed Parker's lead. The closer they moved toward the farm, John's nerves vanished. He was rising to the moment like he had hoped he would. But as they stepped onto the property, they found it abandoned. They checked the main house first, moving through it as tactically as they could. And John just doing his best to not get into Parker's way. After they cleared the house, they went to the barn, where they found a dead body. He's one of Dylan's men, Parker said. I recognize him from the list of associates Dylan uses. So what, they started killing each other? John asked. Parker glanced around and he shook his head. This doesn't look like work done by Dylan. When he kills someone, he makes it more of a spectacle. He then took a closer look at the dead man and pointed toward his pants. His pants are undone. He was taking a leak? John asked. I don't think it was that innocent, Parker answered. The crew Dylan rolls with isn't exactly the best group of guys. It took John a moment for what Parker was telling him to sink in, but he was able to read between the lines. The scumbag was trying to attack a woman, and he was met with deadly force, as he deserved. We should go to the river, John said. But just as John turned toward the exit, he stopped dead in his tracks when he saw who was standing in the open doorway. At first, John thought his eyes were deceiving him, 
He didn't think it would have been so simple to find his daughter. But Sidney was standing right there in front of him, completely unharmed. Dad? Sidney asked. The moment John moved toward his daughter, she did the same, and they crashed into one another in an embrace. John squeezed his oldest tight, afraid that letting go might cause him to lose her again. Thank God you're alive, John said. Dad, listen, Sidney said, pulling back. The bank robber, the one from the news, he has a mom. I know, John answered. They walked out into the fields toward the river, Sidney said. Sydney, I need you to listen very carefully, John said. I want you to take whatever working vehicle that you can find and go to our cabin. Dad, I'm not leaving you. Your brother is heading there now, and I want to make sure he gets there safely, John said. And the only way I can make sure that happens is if you are there to help him. Sydney wanted to protest. She clearly didn't want to be left here for any reason, but the idea of helping her brother seemed to push her over the edge. I'll get mom. John said. And Teddy, Sidney said, adding his name quickly. But then she tried to cover her feelings for him. And all the others, too. Just try to save them all. I'll try, John said. John waited until Sidney located a working truck in the parking lot, then watched as his daughter sped away from the farm. He should have felt better about her leaving, knowing she was away from all the madness that was about to transpire here. But he couldn't help but think what dangers she might find on her way to their family cabin. It was no use worrying, though. The decision had been made. And he took solace in the fact that there wasn't as much danger out here as there was in the city. He had seen the way people reacted more calmly out in the country. Once Sidney was gone, John followed Parker out into the field. When John and Parker crested a hill, they both dropped to a crawl. And it was a good thing they did because when they reached the top, they saw Dylan and what remained of his criminal group with the farmhands near the riverbank, some of them being used to move items along the barge. Looks like you were right about how Dylan wanted to transport the money, Parker said. For some reason, that doesn't make me feel any better, John replied. Parker had a pair of binoculars with him, and he used them to get a better look at the situation below. It looks like Dylan killed some of his crew probably because he didn't want to share all the money he stole. John couldn't imagine how selfish somebody would have to be not to split 100 million. But then again, Dylan was a criminal. Looks like he's dumping some of the money off the boat, Parker said. This might be our only chance to get the bastard. I count three men down there, including Dylan, John said. And two of those men have a gun to my wife's head. He glanced around not liking their position. There's no way for us to get down there without being seen. Well, Parker said, we need to get down there before Dylan gets on that boat or else we will never catch him again. If we go charging down there from this hill, we'll be sitting ducks, John said. We can try to shoot them from up here, Parker suggested. John considered it. He was a good shot, but he didn't have the confidence in his accuracy from this distance. And the moment they started shooting, it would put Maggie's life at risk. I'll go down there, John said. Alone? Parker asked. That's not a good idea. I'll go down pretending I'm not a threat, and then you can take them out when I get close enough to grab Maggie, John said. Parker was quiet, staring down at the situation before he replied. It's risky. I know, John said but do you really think we can hit both of those guys with your rifle from this distance and not put my wife's life in danger? Parker remained silent and then finally nodded. All right, we go with your plan, but how do you know they won't kill you the moment you go down there? Because I have something they need. John reached into his pocket for the small box he'd recovered at the FBI building. He opened it and revealed a key. If they want to open their safe, then they need this. Parker reached for the key, but John kept it away. This isn't a good idea. Do you have a better idea? John asked. When Parker didn't reply, John took his silence as agreement. Shoot the guy on my left first, John said. I'll handle the guy on the right. Just don't wait too long to shoot. 
John started to get up, but then Parker stopped him. Just be careful, Parker said. Dylan isn't normal. He's a sociopath, so whatever he tells you, you can be sure he's lying through his teeth. Got it, John said. John stood up and moved down the hill. He kept his gun on him, figuring it would make sense for him to come armed. The last thing he wanted to do was give up Parker's position on the hill. So long as Dylan and his men believed that John came alone, his plan could work. Chapter 21 The moment John showed himself at the top of the hill, he drew the attention of the men at the riverbank. They aimed their guns at him, and he held his hands in the air, hoping this wasn't a mistake. But he would risk anything to save Maggie. The two men immediately became defensive, using Maggie as a human shield. But John kept his cool, trusting that Parker could make his shot. Don't move, the man holding Maggie kept her close, barking the order behind her. I will kill her if you move. I've got a bead on you, John said, speaking to the man who held his wife. Try anything and you're a dead man. John wasn't sure what was taking Parker so long to shoot. The longer the situation dragged on, the harder it would be for any of them to walk away from this alive. Perhaps he had misjudged Parker's abilities. I will kill her, the gunman said. Get on your knees now. John glanced between the two gunmen in front of him. If he dropped to his knees, he would lose his ability to reach for his weapon quickly. John glanced past Maggie and to the other farmhands on the riverbank. All of them were terrified, but with no one watching them, John wondered if any of them would try to help. None of them were armed, and they were all paralyzed by fear. John wanted to call out to them to help, but he feared that in doing so, he would put them in the line of fire. He didn't want anyone else to die today because of his actions. I'm warning you, the man who had Maggie tightened his grip around her and pressed the gun more firmly against her head. With his finger on the trigger, all it would take would be one small amount of pressure to end Maggie's life. I'm giving you to the count of three and then I'm gonna kill her. John. Maggie said. In the fear and helplessness in her voice, flooded John with fear and anger. One, he said. John tensed and cursed under his breath. He didn't know what Parker was waiting for. Two, he said. Maggie was visibly shaking now, and she made eye contact with John as she mouthed, I love you, to him. John had to make a decision. He believed the gunman had every intention of killing Maggie in front of him. John was never a good shot at the range, and the window to shoot this man was narrow. But he wasn't about to lose his wife, not after so much pain to keep his family together. Three. The gunshot thundered from the distance. The gunman on John's left was struck right in the chest, and he was thrust backward. He coughed and gagged a few times, drawing a rattling breath as he died on the grass. The gunfire had caused the man holding Maggie hostage to lose his concentration, and Maggie seized the opportunity and sprinted away from her captor, which cleared the way for John to shoot. John pulled his weapon and shot the man in the shoulder, then the chest, putting him on his back. The moment the altercation was over, John and Maggie sprinted toward one another colliding into each other's arms and held each other closely. Thank God you're alive, John said, leaning back to ensure Maggie wasn't injured. Are you hurt? I'm fine, Maggie answered. I found Sydney at the house, John said. I sent her to meet Blake at the cabin. Maggie sighed in relief, thankful to know that their children were safe. I wasn't sure if leaving him at the hospital was the best choice, but I knew you would find him. I believed in you. We believed in our family, John said. Maggie kissed him. But when she pulled back, she turned around and looked at the barge on the river. The man who was out there is the one who is responsible for all this. I have an FBI agent with me, John said. Agent Willow survived? Maggie asked, hopeful. No, John answered. 
that I found his partner, and he's the one who's been helping me. And on cue, Parker hurried down the hill toward the riverbank. And the moment he arrived, the farmhands who were near the water's edge converged around John and Maggie. Everybody was thankful they had been saved. But they weren't out of the woods yet. Everybody needs to go home, John said. Get out of here as fast as possible. He took other people to the barge, Maggie said. Teddy and two of the farmhands. Teddy, John asked, unsure of why that name sounded familiar. Teddy is Sydney's friend, Maggie answered. He helped save her. We can't let him die out there. We need to get to the barge before Dylan leaves, Parker said. He is not going anywhere without this, John said, holding up the box that Parker had taken from the FBI's field office. This is the key that'll open the safe on the barge. But before anyone could reply, they heard Dylan's voice escape the walkie-talkie on the dead man around them. Well, Maggie, you're more resourceful than I imagined, Dylan said. I'd like to say I'm surprised, but I knew you were trouble the moment I set eyes on you. While everybody else just stared at the radio, it was Maggie who picked it up off the dead man. She turned toward the barge, looking at it as she spoke into the transmitter. I told you my family would come for me, Maggie said. You did, Dylan answered. It appears I underestimated them. And is that Agent Parker I see? Dylan laughed. He really pulled out all the stops for me. Parker reached for the radio, and Maggie handed it over to him. It's over, Dylan. Your team is dead, and you have nowhere to run. I have an entire river to run, Dylan said. And you killing my team only makes my share of the money even bigger. I should be thanking you. You and I both know you're not getting the money without the key, Parker said. And then he held it up which I have now. Dylan was quiet for a moment. John wondered if the FBI agent had angered Dylan to the point of a rash decision. Don't act all high and mighty on me now, Dylan said. I have something you want as well. One hostage is worth one key, don't you think? Parker grimaced. This isn't a negotiation. Oh, well, in that case, I can kill the boy now, Dylan said. You do that and you're a dead man, Parker replied. We're all dead men eventually, Dylan replied. But are you willing to put this young man's life at risk for the sake of your pride? It has nothing to do with pride, Parker said. You're a criminal and I'm a law enforcement officer. I'm bringing you in. Dylan went silent after that and they all waited on the shoreline. He's not moving, John said, noticing how the barge remained still. He would have already started up the engine and taken off by now if he was going to leave. He held up the key. He wants this more than he is letting on. He's right, Maggie said. He wants to drag this out. And you two are experts now, Parker asked. Considering I spent the last several hours with him as a hostage in close proximity, I would say I have some valuable insight about what he is capable of, Maggie said. And I'm telling you, he is willing to do whatever it takes to get that money and ride off into the sunset, marking this as his greatest triumph. John realized Dylan was like his construction foreman at the job site earlier in the day. There was a difference, of course but the same underlying qualities of fear and selfishness controlled their actions. Let me talk to him, John said. Parker hesitated, but eventually handed over the radio. Dylan Elliott, John said. My name is John Carver, I'm Maggie's husband. Ah, the elusive husband, Dylan said. Maggie mentioned you quite a bit in our time together. She kept saying you were going to find her. And I guess I should have known better than to doubt her. She's quite the woman. John stiffened at the comment, but he stayed on track. Chirping back and forth with this guy wouldn't help, so he decided to take a more direct approach. I'll come to you alone. Do we have a deal? Just you, Dylan replied, the playfulness in his voice gone. And remember, this boy's life is in your hands. 
I'm coming over, John said. And unless you want to fish out this key from the bottom of the river, I'd suggest you don't kill me on the swim over. I wouldn't dream of it, John, Dylan said. John returned the radio to Parker, and Maggie immediately rushed to him. I don't like this plan, Maggie said. You're giving him too much control. I can handle myself, John said. I know you can, Maggie said. But this man is more dangerous than any other person I've ever met. He's not normal. He is a sociopath. John understood his wife was worried. He was afraid too, but they had exhausted all their other options. If we want to save that boy, this is our only option. Be careful, Maggie said. I will, John said. Even though John wasn't sure if it would do any good, Parker insisted that John bring a weapon with him. Parker gave him a handgun and a knife. The first thing you're going to want to do is secure the kid, Parker said. Do not give Dylan anything until the kid is off the boat. Because he will do anything to get what he wants before you get what you want. Do not trust a word that comes out of his mouth. He is much more dangerous than you realize, John. I can see that, John said. I hope you know what you're doing, Parker said. Me too, John said. And then he gestured to the farmhands still standing around. Get them out of here. I don't want Dylan to have more hostages than he does right now. Parker nodded. Good luck. John didn't want to linger on the riverbank any longer. He was only putting off the inevitable. He smiled one last time at his wife before he walked into the water. He hoped it wasn't the last time that he would see her. But John was at peace with his decision. And as he waded out into the chilly waters of the Ohio River, John whispered a prayer for the good Lord to protect him and Teddy. He just hoped the big man upstairs was listening. Chapter 22 John walked further up the bank before he got into the water. The river current wasn't very strong, but he wanted to make sure he didn't get swept down river before he reached the barge. Even when John was close enough to see the barge in more detail, he saw no signs of Dylan or Teddy. He figured they were both inside one of the structures on the massive platform. John reached the barge and then clung to the side for a moment. The big pontoon-like floaters, keeping the barge above water, provided him with the opportunity to take a breather. John didn't know how he was supposed to get up, but he eventually worked his way around the barge's sides and found a ladder, which he used to climb aboard. Cold and dripping wet when he finally set foot on the barge, John lingered for a moment to get his bearings. The barge was larger than John expected, very wide and long. There were three structures on the barge, one of them looked like a wheelhouse, and the other two were big storage sheds. John figured the safe was in one of the sheds. Okay, John said, calling out to Dylan. Show yourself, I'm here. There was no movement on the barge, no sound. He remembered how Parker was certain that Dylan would double-cross John, and he braced himself for an attack as he reached for the weapon in his waistband. Good of you to come out, Dylan said, his voice sounding far away. I wasn't sure if the current would take you under. That certainly would have ruined some of the fun we're about to have. Let me see Teddy, John said. So quick and to the point, Dylan said. Don't you want to do any foreplay? Aren't you curious as to how this barge is working while everything else is shut down? You like to hear yourself talk, don't you? John asked. I mean, it's pretty impressive, right? Dylan asked. I had to move the barge out of the EMP zone in order to ensure it would still work. It required a lot of planning. Are we doing this or not? John asked. For a long time, there was nothing. But then finally, Teddy appeared from around the back of one of the sheds on the far side of the barge. There he is, Dylan said, healthy and alive for now. Let him go and I'll leave the key, John said. Dylan laughed. I don't even know if what you have really exists. So we're going to need a show of good faith. 
John tried to regain control of the negotiation, but that had never been his strength. Let him go and I'll stay on the barge with you and- No, Dylan barked. You will open the safe to make sure the key works. That's the deal if you want your precious little friend to survive. Teddy was shaking and John knew he didn't have a choice. Where's the safe? John asked. Inside the shed, Dylan answered. Doors unlocked. You go inside, you open it, and you toss out some money to prove it worked. It seemed a simple enough transaction, but John knew the moment he entered that shed that he could be walking into a death trap. But considering Teddy's life was on the line, John considered it a small price to pay. All right, John said. John walked over to the shed, moving quickly. He didn't see the point in drawing this out. The door was unlocked, as Dylan said it was, and John slid the pair of doors open, parting the middle like the Red Sea. The safe was inside. It was smaller than John expected it to be, but still considerably large. How Dylan was able to steal the entire safe out of the reserve was still a mystery to him, but he didn't care how it was done as long as all of this came to an end. John reached into his pocket for the key and remembered he still had the gun and the knife. Because Dylan couldn't see John, he decided to remove the weapon from his waist and keep it handy. Once John had both the gun and key in hand, he approached the safe. John inserted the key into the lock and turned it until it disengaged. John then used the lever to open the massive door, and when it swung open, he saw the stacks and piles of bills inside. It was like something out of a movie. John had never seen so much cash in his entire life. It was unreal. But John grabbed some of the money and walked back outside to show Dylan. But when John exited the shed, Teddy was gone. John wasn't sure if Dylan was still behind the shed or not. But he tossed the money in that direction. And it landed where Dylan could have seen it if he was still there. It's open, John said. Now let him go. John watched the money, gun in hand, but nothing happened. All John heard was the sound of water running beneath the anchored barge. John slowly approached the money, knowing Dylan was most likely up to something. He kept both hands on the pistol, finger on the trigger, because John knew when the fighting started, Dylan would be shooting to kill. But when John finally turned the corner, he saw Teddy unconscious on the barge. John rushed forward, foregoing his shooter's stance. And that was when Dylan pounced. Dylan emerged from the far side of the structure, firing at John and Teddy the moment John rushed to help the young man. The pair exchanged gunfire, but John was at a disadvantage as he hurriedly pulled Teddy back behind cover. Thankfully, John's random gunshots forced Dylan back behind cover before he could do any real harm. Once John had Teddy secured, he checked to make sure the kid was still breathing. There was a gash on the back of Teddy's head where Dylan had struck him, but Teddy was still breathing and had a strong pulse. John checked the backside of the structure to make sure Dylan wasn't going to sneak around and then worked his way to the front. When John poked his head around the front side, Dylan was there, ready to shoot and he didn't waste any time. Four gunshots pushed John back behind the corner for cover, and he moved into a more defensive position, struggling to remember how he was supposed to react in a shooting scenario. It had training, but it was very different in real life. The adrenaline, the sounds, all of his senses were in overdrive. John remembered his priority, which was to get Teddy and himself off this barge alive. As John quickly prepared to move Teddy, he made sure he could still shoot with one hand. He then quickly dragged Teddy to the next structure, providing his own cover fire. By the time Dylan shot back, John and Teddy were safe behind the new structure. With Teddy unconscious, there was no way John could swim with the kid to the river before Dylan shot the two of them. They'd be sitting ducks out in the open water. Think, John, he said to himself. And that was when John glanced over at the wheelhouse on his left. 
John had worked a barge one summer in his early 20s. He'd bounced around a lot of jobs before he settled on carpentry. He was familiar with the controls. But even though it had been years since he'd worked them, John prayed his memory hadn't rusted. John readied himself to pull Teddy one more time toward the wheelhouse. Once John was inside, he could steer the barge toward the shoreline, bringing himself, Teddy, Dylan, and the millions in the safe right to Agent Parker. Hang on, Teddy, John said. And then he scooped Teddy up in his arms and sprinted for the wheelhouse as fast as possible. At first, there was nothing. But then John heard the unmistakable noise of automatic gunfire. But John never stopped running toward the wheelhouse, hoping to reach it before he caught a bullet to the head. The noise of the gunfire was deafening, but it was slowly replaced by the sound of John's pulse pounding in his head as he neared the wheelhouse door and crashed through it. John and Teddy both sprawled out on the floor, skidding over the hot plastic. John was quick to kick the door shut, but Dylan kept up his massive gunfire. Bullets tore through the wheelhouse, but John didn't have time to wait until Dylan ran out of ammunition. He hurried toward the controls, hoping to get the massive barge moving. But first he needed to detach the anchor. John searched the controls, which were difficult to read, but were all properly labeled. He eventually found the buttons for the anchor and disengaged it. A heavy clanking sound thundered through the barge, louder than the sound of gunfire, which suddenly stopped. Okay, now we just need to fire up the engine, John said, scanning the control board. And he found two sets of engine ignitions, and he started both. The big diesel motors fired up, humming efficiently. And then John reached for the wheel and found the throttle. Easy does it, John said. And he gently pressed down on the throttle. and The big barge lurched forward. John had been so distracted by moving the barge that he'd lost track of Dylan. And as the barge crawled at a glacier-like speed toward the shore, John realized he wasn't out of the woods yet. John glanced back to check on Teddy and made sure he was still alive. Once Teddy was secure and safe in the wheelhouse, John decided to put himself on the offensive. Dylan wasn't going to quit until he was caught or dead. And in that moment, with John's heart pumping and the adrenaline coursing through his veins, it was clear to John he didn't care whether Dylan was still breathing by the end of this fight or not. John poked his head out from the wheelhouse. The door riddled with bullet holes. John believed Dylan had stopped shooting at him because he wanted to salvage the controls of the barge. Dylan still believed he could navigate it down the river to freedom, but they were already on a clear path toward the riverbank, albeit they were moving slowly. John scanned the barge from his position, searching for Dylan, but the bank robber remained elusive, but not for long. The gunfire came from across the barge, near the structure with the bank vault, and it forced John back into the captain's quarters. John attempted to return fire, but Dylan's automatic rifle provided zero opportunity to gain any ground. John's first instinct was to retreat back into the wheelhouse for cover, but something told him he needed to press forward. If he didn't do something to level the playing field now, then Dylan would only have more opportunities to hurt them. Parker was right. The man was never going to stop. John pressed forward, rushing toward Dylan as fast as he could, using whatever cover he could find along the way to give himself short breaks on his path forward. As John approached, his heart rate skyrocketed. There was a stretch of no man's land of at least 20 feet before he could reach the vault. He didn't think it was possible for him to make it there without Dylan putting a few holes in him. John needed to play this smarter. Dylan didn't play by the rules, so John decided he wouldn't either. The barge that Dylan had commandeered to move his money with the safe also happened to have a large construction crane on board. The crane's big metal shovel was more than capable of stopping bullets and tearing through whatever structure Dylan tried to hide behind. John hurried to the crane before Dylan had a chance to shoot at him again. 
He had worked one of these in construction before, and though it had been on land, he figured the controls were the same. The crane started without hesitation, and John pulled the levers to swing the massive crane around toward the shed where Dylan had sought cover. The moment Dylan heard the crane turn on, he must have realized what John was trying to do. He emerged from cover, firing wildly at John and the crane. But he swung the heavy metal bucket around before Dylan could stop him. John dropped the massive shovel through the top of the shed's structure. The roof immediately collapsed, the heavy metal bucket ripping through the sheet metal like it was a paper mache. Dylan sprinted from the structure before it collapsed on him, shooting at John on his dash past to the next shed-like structure. But John was quick to follow, swinging the big crane into the next little building and collapsing it into rubble as well. Just as Dylan appeared around the back side of it, the gunfire stopped. But John couldn't tell if he'd hit Dylan or not because the crane obstructed his view of the damage. John reached for his weapon and then stepped out of the crane's control seat. He hesitantly approached the wreckage, searching for Dylan, but found no sign of a body. John glanced back at the wheelhouse, making sure Dylan hadn't made a move toward it, but found it vacant as well. The barge continued its slow progress toward the riverbank as John searched the top of the barge. It was oddly quiet. But when John approached the second collapsed shed, he saw the automatic rifle Dylan had used, discarded on the ground. Dylan had run out of ammunition, which was good news for John. But the fact that he couldn't find the slippery snake was concerning. Perhaps Dylan had abandoned the ship. Maybe he had decided it was better to live to fight another day. But John didn't believe the man was capable of letting something go not after everything he'd learned about the bank robber. John glanced at the shoreline, and he saw his wife and Parker waiting for him near the water. He was focused on them when Dylan snuck up from behind and tackled him to the ground. Dylan was on him so fast, John barely had time to react. John only managed to fire off one shot before Dylan knocked his weapon out of his hands and pinned John down. Dylan had the upper hand, and he pummeled John's body with a series of punches he couldn't defend. John had never been a good ground fighter, but the way Dylan was striking him, it was clear. And Dylan was trying to kill him. With his life on the line, John used all of his strength to flip Dylan off of him and get back to his feet. John searched for the weapon he had dropped, but Dylan saw it first. Even though Dylan reached the gun first, John wasn't far behind. The pair grappled for the weapon, and Dylan pulled the trigger, firing off several shots before John could regain control. John's ears were ringing from the gunshots, and his muscles were burning with fatigue from the long day. Dylan didn't look like he was tired at all. If anything, he looked like he was gaining strength. But John wasn't about to die and lose here. So he dug deep, searching for energy reserves, and found another gear. John pinned Dylan's arm and then twisted his wrist, forcing him to drop the weapon. He then landed two punches to Dylan's head, knocking him backward. Once Dylan was off balance, John managed to get into a rhythm, knocking the man backward with each blow. And with each hit John landed on Dylan, he felt himself lose more control. He wanted blood, and he was about to get it. But Dylan wasn't about to lose his momentum either, and he doubled down, the pair locking horns in a stalemate. You're tougher than you look, Dylan said, grunting through a strained breath. But you're tired and out of gas. You don't look much better, John replied, his muscles on fire. Better than you, at least, Dylan said. When Dylan smiled, John wasn't sure what the madman had planned. But then he bit John's wrist, drawing blood, and it caused John to drop the weapon. It was only a second, but it gave Dylan the upper hand as he turned to aim the weapon at John. But 
that moment, John watched his life flash before his eyes. Time stood still as he stared down the barrel of the gun. And when he heard the gunshot, he believed his life was over. But it hadn't been Dylan who had fired the shot. Maggie and Parker fired shots from the riverbank, pushing Dylan away from John. The barge had moved close enough to the riverbank for both of them to have a good shot. With Dylan distracted, John hurried to the wheelhouse for cover and then watched as Dylan sprinted toward the edge of the barge, away from Maggie and Parker's gunshots, and splashed into the water, disappearing into the river. John rushed to the barge's side and stared down into the water. But Dylan never surfaced, and even though Dylan was nowhere to be seen, John feared he would return. Chapter 23 After the chaos on the barge, John dropped the anchor again before the vessel ran aground on the riverbank. He shut off the engines and the barge slowly stopped moving. Maggie and Parker used one of the boats to paddle over to the barge and collect Teddy, who was slowly waking. My head is killing me, Teddy said. Pain means you're alive, John said, reassuring the young man. John helped Teddy to the side of the barge where Parker and Maggie tied off the canoe they rowed over. Maggie collided with John, wrapping him in a tight hug. Thank God you're okay. That was some good shooting, John said. You saved me. Yeah, well, I thought I'd return the favor, Maggie said, smiling. Parker walked to the barge's edge and stared down into the water. I didn't see him surface on our side of the river. He might have gotten off somewhere else. He planted his hands on his hips and turned to face John. That was a smart move with the crane. Not smart enough, apparently, John said. We need to get you and your family in a safe house, Parker said. John laughed. Yeah, right. Parker stared at John with a look bordered on sympathy and anger. You really don't get it, do you? There's no way Dylan Elliott is going to forget you. You just cost him his fortune. And that's not something he's going to forgive. Until he's buried six feet under, he will be thinking about you and your family. Then he's going to have to get through everything my family has set up to defend ourselves, John said. I can promise you he would never make it through that gauntlet. Parker dropped the subject. It was clear they were never going to see eye to eye on the matter, so for now they dropped it. John and Maggie helped Teddy over to the canoe, while Parker walked the barge to make sure everything was secure. I'll stay here with the money, Parker said. I don't think Dylan is going to try to come back for it now, but I don't want to give him an easy opening. We will come back for you, John said. Parker nodded his thanks, and once Teddy was secure, John rode them toward the shoreline. Is Sydney okay? Teddy asked. She's fine, Maggie answered. Teddy relaxed at that news. We'll make sure to look you over when we get to the cabin, Maggie said. As they reached the halfway point between the barge and the shoreline, John had the sudden realization that all of this was too surreal. He had finally been reunited with his wife, and all that was left was to go to the cabin. For a moment, he felt like it was too easy. And then his feeling was justified by the sound of a gunshot. John forced Maggie and Teddy low in the canoe and then aimed his pistol at the shoreline, searching for the shooter. There had only been one gunshot, and as John braced for more, he found Dylan standing at the top of the hill from the riverbank. Dylan lowered the rifle, and even from the long distance, John saw the smile on his busted and broken face. But while John thought that Dylan was going to shoot at them from the canoe, he didn't. He simply lowered the weapon and sprinted away. At first, John didn't understand, but that quickly changed when he heard his wife's voice. John, Maggie said. John glanced down and saw Maggie's face, which was a ghostly pale. And then he saw the blood on her shirt. No, John said. 
John immediately scooped Maggie into his arms and applied pressure to the wound. The bullet had gone into her lower left side, but there was no exit wound in the back. The bullet was still inside, and blood was still spreading. John, it's really cold, Maggie said. John immediately jumped into action. He pulled off Teddy's shirt, which was the only shirt that wasn't wet, and he immediately pressed it over the wound. Teddy, I need you to focus, John said, and he pulled the young man over to his wife and positioned his hands on the gunshot wound. I need you to keep as much pressure on the wound as you possibly can, okay? Teddy was still clearly in pain, but he nodded with confidence. Good, John said. And then he moved back to the oars and paddled as fast as he could until the boat hit the riverbank. John quickly scooped his wife up into his arms and stepped out of the boat. He needed to get her to a vehicle and get them to the cabin as quickly as possible. Teddy, John shouted, take the boat back and get Parker and tell him to come to the house now. John didn't have time to wait to see if Teddy understood him or not. But when he reached the top of the hill, he glanced over his shoulder and saw Teddy almost all the way back to the barge. The kid was tougher than he looked. John, I- It's okay, Maggie, John said. Everything is gonna be all right. I'm gonna get you help. John? Try not to talk, John said. You need to conserve your energy. Maggie didn't speak after that. And John never stopped sprinting toward the main house, well aware that Dylan was still out there. But so far, he was nowhere to be seen. John was gassed when he neared the house. But when he saw the taillights of a truck peel out of the farm's parking lot, he knew it was Dylan fleeing the scene. John veered toward the farmhouse and burst through the front door, where he laid Maggie on the kitchen table. He would have put her on the couch, but he needed a surface where he could apply good pressure to the wound. John needed a first aid kit, and he rushed to the kitchen in search of one. He ripped open cabinets, flinging dishes and canned goods off shelves, in search of anything he could use. With no first aid kit, John settled for some clean dish rags and duct tape. He then found a bottle of high-proof alcohol and rushed back over to the kitchen table. Maggie was completely still, and for a moment, John was afraid she wasn't breathing. When John checked the shirt he had placed on Maggie to help stop the bleeding, it was soaked in blood. If she lost more, she would go into shock. Maggie, are you still with me? John asked, and then watched Maggie's eyelids flutter as she struggled to remain conscious. Stay with me, baby, stay with me. John tilted Maggie onto her side so he could access the wound on her back. He poured the alcohol over the wound to help sterilize it, and then wiped away some of the blood. Maggie grunted in pain, but John considered that a good sign since she was still awake. John placed the fresh towels on the wound and reapplied pressure. He then closed his eyes and tried to think of what needed to happen next. Aside from stopping the bleeding, he needed to get the bullet out of her. In order to do so, he would need to find tweezer-like tools and make sure they were sterilized. John didn't know this farm as well as Sydney, and he wished she were here. Perhaps it had been a mistake to separate his family. But he supposed hindsight was always twenty twenty. Just when John wasn't sure of what else to do, he heard Teddy and Parker shouting in the fields. I'm in the house. John shouted. Parker was out of breath, and Teddy couldn't even stand up straight when they joined John inside the house. We need to get the bullet out, John said. To Parker's credit, he remained more focused on helping Maggie than he was on Dylan's escape. What do you need from me? John instructed Parker to find the necessary tools to remove the bullet. Teddy, do you know where Parker could find something like that? Teddy nodded, still trying to catch his breath. There should be a first aid kit in the barn. I'll go grab it. Take Parker with you, John said. I don't want you passing out on the way there. John didn't mean to sound harsh, but they couldn't afford any mistakes. The blood loss was starting to slow down, but Maggie was still struggling to remain awake. John, Maggie said, 
her voice surprisingly strong. It's okay, Maggie, John said. We're to get you all fixed up. I want you to know this isn't your fault, Maggie said. Maggie's eyes were open, but there was no color in her face. Her lips were pale, and she could barely focus on John. She was slowly losing consciousness. Don't talk like that, John said. Everything is going to turn out just fine. We're going to get you all patched up and back to normal. Maggie smiled weakly. You always had a way of making everything sound better than it was. And it was one of the reasons I married you. John teared up. I love you, John, Maggie said. And I've loved our family. The life we've built together, I love our children. Tell them, tell them I... Maggie's eyes fluttered. And then she trembled and was overtaken by a seizure. Maggie, John said. All John could do was keep his wife steady while she worked through the seizure. The shock of the blood loss had overwhelmed her system. John kept Maggie's head steady and turned her onto her side so she didn't swallow her tongue. She might have been the nurse, but John had been paying attention to everything she had taught him. They were a team, and despite having the odds stacked against them, he wasn't ready to give up. Until his last heartbeat, John would never quit. Chapter 24 There were only a few things that brought Dylan Elliot joy in his life. One of them was getting revenge on any person who wronged him, which was why he had shot Maggie in the canoe. Dylan's revenge had never been against Maggie. It was against John. And there was no better way to wound a man than to hurt the woman he loved. It would have been too simple to just kill John. John was the kind of man who didn't fear death. Not like Dylan did, though he would never admit that. Dylan's persona was built on the appearance of invulnerability. People believed he was scared of nothing, but that wasn't true. Because he still wanted to live, which was why he had run after shooting Maggie. He considered making a stand there, but he knew he was still outnumbered. Dylan didn't stop running after he pulled the trigger. He wasn't sure if Maggie would die, but that wasn't the point. The point was to send a message to John that his family wasn't safe. They would never be safe. When Dylan finally reached the barn, he took a moment to catch his breath. He was alone, his men dead, but he couldn't stick around for long. He needed a ride out of here. He still had the truck but he looked to the barn, remembering the lockers that belonged to the farmhands. He wondered if any of them had ammunition he could steal or other supplies he might need for the road. Dylan ripped open the lockers and quickly searched the contents. He discarded anything that wasn't useful, pocketing the few things he did find. He was halfway through the lockers when he opened one of them and did a double take from a picture taped on the inside of the door. Well, well, well. Dylan said, peeling the tape from the picture's corner. Look what we have here. Maggie was smiling along with her husband and what appeared to be their two children. Her son, who was supposedly still back at the hospital, and a teenage girl, a girl Dylan had seen before. The same one who had been causing so much trouble with his men here at the farm. Maggie had known all along where Dylan was taking her. The moment he had mentioned the farm was a dead giveaway, but she had played it so cool. Clever girl, Dylan said. Dylan took his time as he searched through all of Maggie's daughter's things. But of all the pieces of information he got his hands on, there was a piece of mail along with another photograph that caught his attention above all else. The picture had the same family members, but this time they were standing out in front of a cabin in the middle of the woods. Written over the picture was a caption that read, Our New Forever Home. It appeared that Maggie and her family had built a new home on a nice piece of land. It reminded Dylan of a homestead his own family used to live on when he was a child. Dylan imagined that this would be a place where Maggie 
and her family would retreat from the farm. If Dylan wanted to seek revenge on John, to truly upend his life, then he could think of no greater surprise than infiltrating them at their forever home. And thanks to Sydney, Dylan knew exactly where to find it. Chapter 25 Maggie was still going through her seizure when Parker and Teddy returned with the first aid kit. John was busy keeping her still, while Parker and Teddy emptied the kit. She's going into shock. John said, we need to stop the bleeding. Look for a clock kit. Thankfully, Parker had some training in first aid with his position at the FBI. He collected all the required triage equipment and brought it to John. Did you already sterilize the wound? Parker asked. I did, but you'll need to do it again and make sure all of those tools are wiped down too, John answered. The first aid kit came with some sterilizing wipes. Once the wound and equipment were cleaned, Parker handed John the tweezers to get the bullet out. Hold her still and keep her steady, John said. Make sure she remains conscious, too. If she stops breathing, you need to let me know. Got it, Parker replied. John focused on the bullet wound. Based on the size of the hole, John believed it was a twenty-two caliber bullet, which would be difficult to find because of its small size. John wasn't squeamish about blood but the fact that he was operating on his wife added an extra layer of nerves. But if he didn't get the bullet out, then it could lead to an infection. And once an infection spread, it could kill her. I think I've got it, John said. And then he pinched down hard on the tweezers and slowly removed the bullet from the wound. He dropped it on the floor and then immediately started to patch up the wound. We need to get it sterilized and covered up. Hand me that gauze. Teddy assisted John. And then John patched up his wife. Luckily for him, the bullet wound wasn't big, and some butterfly stitches worked fine. Once the stitches were in place, John covered them with a fresh bandage to keep the wound sterile. Let's keep her on her side for a little bit, John said. After all of that blood loss, this position will be easier on her heart. Teddy nodded, and then he took John's place as John stepped back to take a breath. He stared down at his hands, which had been steady for so long, but now they were finally shaking. John, Parker said, I need to go. You want to go after Dylan? John asked. I need the army truck to drive us to the cabin. I have a motorbike, Teddy answered. Would that help? I'll take the bike and you keep the truck, Parker answered. And then there was an awkward pause. I don't mean to leave you, John, but if I don't catch up with him now, I don't know if I ever will. It's all right, John said. I'll figure something out. Good luck to you, Parker said. You too, John replied. Teddy walked Parker out to the bike, and John stayed inside with his wife. He walked around to the other side so he could see her face, and she was quietly breathing, eyes closed. You're strong, John said. Stronger than anyone else I know, you can pull through this. Maggie did not respond, but John leaned closer and kissed her lips. He just wanted all of this to be done with and have his family be all together again. There was nothing more frustrating than having been separated from his children. He knew Maggie felt the same way. Teddy's motorbike fired up, and then John listened as the engine faded as Parker drove away from the farm. When Teddy walked back inside the house, he leaned against the nearest wall in the dining room, barely able to keep his eyes open. So what do we do now? Teddy asked. We need to get her to the truck, John said. But first we need something to carry her. John nodded. That seems as good of a place to start as any. John turned back to his wife. Maggie, I don't think that. John frowned when he looked back at Maggie noticing how still she was. He reached for her neck and checked her pulse. When John didn't feel a beat, he quickly moved Maggie onto her back. What's wrong? Teddy asked, perking up from the shift in John's body language. She's not breathing, John answered. And he immediately started CPR. Teddy, get on the other side of the table. Teddy followed John's instructions and he stood there, 
wide-eyed and worried. John followed a steady rhythm of 30 compressions and then blew two breaths into his wife's mouth, watching her chest rise with each breath, then restarted the compressions. But John was already feeling the fatigue. Teddy, I need you to take over, John said. Teddy stiffened with fear. I don't know how to do any of this. I don't know how to save somebody's life. John finished the compressions and breaths, and then he grabbed Teddy's hands and positioned them over Maggie's chest. You want to push here and push down hard, go, John said. Teddy started, and then he grimaced at the sound of bones crunching beneath him, and he stopped. But John was there to keep him on track. Don't stop, keep going, one and two and three and four, John said, clapping his hands in rhythm so Teddy could follow along. Teddy continued under John's watchful eye, allowing John to rest until it was his turn to take over again. Without an AED device, this was the only way to keep Maggie alive and try to restart her heart. But even between them, they wouldn't be able to work on her forever. The pair went back and forth, relieving each other when they got tired and continued to pump life into Maggie's heart. After five rounds of CPR, John stopped and checked Maggie's vitals. He felt the faintest bump of a pulse, and Maggie was breathing again. Okay, John said, motioning for Teddy to stop before he started compressions again. She has a pulse. It was so strange for John to say that phrase aloud, especially talking about his wife. The woman he loved more than any other was currently lying on a table, fighting to stay alive. But John wasn't about to give up on her. She was going to make it through this no matter what happened. We need to get her to the cabin, John said. And then he glanced around the room. We need to make her a stretcher, something we can carry her with to get her to the army truck. We need a long flat board. I, I saw something that might work in the barn, Teddy said. Get it, John said. While Teddy sprinted out toward the barn, John walked closer to his wife. They had a nice medical setup at the cabin something Maggie had insisted on when they had decided to build it. They would have everything they needed there. They just needed to get there before it was too late. Chapter 26 It was hard to read the directions on the map. Like so many others, Dylan had gotten used to using his phone for directions. But technology was supposed to make his life easier. But that's not how his father saw it. Dylan's father had wanted him to be a man's man, someone who could fix a car or build a house. But Dylan wasn't like his father. His father was simple. Dylan was complicated. And he had much more fun toying with people's minds than he did trying to fix a leaky faucet. Dylan's father had died years ago, but he had lived long enough to see what his son became. And Dylan still remembered the disappointment in his father's eyes as he learned the truth. Robbing banks wasn't a normal career path, but Dylan had never been normal. His father had always reminded him of that. Dylan had been conflicted about telling his dad the truth. Part of him believed his father would go to the police to give his son up. But obviously, that had never happened. But Dylan's father did something far worse than ratting on his son. He shunned him, shut him out of the family. Dylan had a younger sister and a mother who still loved him. But he supposed all mothers were like that, especially with their eldest sons. But all it took was one word from his father, and he never heard from or saw them again. Despite how Dylan was prone to enjoying solitude, the fact that he could no longer access that one piece of him that was connected to something good was more painful than any physical wound. All because his father couldn't understand him and refused to accept him for what he really was. Dylan was aware he was a sociopath. He was self-actualized in that regard. It wasn't his fault. No one blamed a lion for killing. It was in their nature. But the moment Dylan did something out of line with the rest of society, he was branded a criminal an enemy of the state, and a bad son. Dylan had kept hold of the picture he'd found hanging up in Sidney's locker. 
It was a picture of Maggie and her family. They were all happy and smiling outside of the cabin. When he looked at that picture, he had flashbacks about his own family. His father had called him mischievous when he was a boy, but there was always a more malicious intent behind it. Well, Dad, Dylan said, speaking aloud to the sky. You always said I ruined our family. Maybe you're right, but you were wrong about me not amounting to anything. I will come out on top, just like I did with you. Dylan's family had always believed that their father had died of natural causes. But Dylan had paid his father a final visit. He had given his father a choice. He could take enough sleeping pills that he would die, or Dylan would kill his mother, sister, and younger brother. The disgust in his father's eyes couldn't be faked, but he didn't hesitate in his decision. He took the pills, and Dylan smiled as he watched his father die. Dylan believed the world revolved around him. He was the center of the universe, and it was his mission to destroy anyone who tried to stop him. It was why Dylan wanted to go to John's family cabin, to destroy another family who had hated him. In many ways, John Carver was like Dylan's father. Perhaps that was why Dylan had hated him so much. The truck struggled a bit when Dylan reached the dirt road, and he didn't know how much farther he had to drive. Eventually, the truck ran out of gas, and he ditched it on the side of the road. The cabin was in the middle of nowhere. Dylan had long since passed any hint of civilization in the area. Dylan swatted the bugs and flies that came after him. It was frustrating to be out here. He should have been on his barge, heading south to the airfields and out of the EMP zone, where he had a plane waiting for him. Dylan had worked hard to steal that money from Cincinnati Federal Reserve Bank. But John and Maggie had ruined that for him. After nearly a mile of walking, Dylan's body felt like it was going to fall apart. But he was driven by the desire for his revenge. And shortly after he reached his breaking point, he saw the cabin up ahead. It was built in a small meadow with a stream running nearby. It was like something out of a postcard. It was surrounded by old forest growth. This far away from the main road, there was nothing but the noise of the forest. It was far too quiet for Dylan's taste, but he supposed that it was the most idyllic location for a family. When Dylan saw the cars parked out front, it was clear people were inside, but Dylan wasn't sure who. Dylan carefully maneuvered around the cabin, looking into the windows. He couldn't see anybody. The interior was too dark. And with one eye still swollen shut from his fight with John, he wasn't certain he could trust what he was seeing. But Dylan wondered if he could use his condition to his advantage. And he hobbled around to the front door, making it look like he was more tired and exhausted than he was. Hello? Dylan asked his voice pleading. Is anybody there? I need some help. Dylan reached the front door, knocked, and waited. He was almost certain someone was inside, but there was no way Maggie and her husband had beaten him there. Please, Dylan asked, putting on the best show he could muster. Finally, the door cracked open, and Dylan was met with the business end of a shotgun. He feigned surprise and jumped back in a cowardly retreat. Please, Dylan said, holding up his hands and bowing his head. I, I don't want any trouble. It was hard for Dylan to see out of his one good eye. And he was able to see it was only Maggie's son, the one he'd seen at the hospital earlier. But the boy had been unconscious then. He had no idea who Dylan was. Didn't you see the signs? The kid asked. This is private property, you need to leave. Oh, I'm so sorry, Dylan answered, pretending to fumble over his words. I didn't see the signs. I just uh, walked so far, and I wasn't even sure I was in the right place. Maggie sent me. Who? The kid asked. Are you her son? Dylan asked. She told me about you. She said you could help me. The kid lowered the shotgun a little. He studied Dylan more closely. 
and his expression softened when he saw the state of Dylan's condition. Why did my mom send you here? Blake asked. I've never seen you before. I, I helped her in the city, Dylan answered. She said this was a safe place to stay. Please, I, I don't have anywhere else to go. Dylan had always been good at playing on people's emotions. It was one of the gifts he recognized early when he was just a kid. Blake stepped to the side, opening the door wider. Sure, come in. Dylan smiled, the expression stretching his face into an unnatural position. Thank you so much. He hobbled forward, still playing up the broken man angle, and then passed Blake as he entered the cabin. Blake shut the door and locked it, and then he placed the shotgun against the window frame next to the door. Can I get you anything to eat or drink? Blake asked. If I could have some water, that would be wonderful, Dylan answered. And then he finally noticed the man on the couch. Dylan jumped with surprise, but Blake was quick to calm him down. It's okay, Blake said. He is alive, but he's just resting. What happened to him? Dylan asked. Blake filled a glass of water and then brought it over to Dylan in the living room. He's a friend of my dad. They were heading into the city to come to get me because I broke my arm, but on the way to the hospital, they were attacked and Jake was shot. Dylan sipped from the glass of water. And is your arm okay now? Blake stared at the cast wrapped around his left arm. He had used it to prop up the gun when he opened the door. Doesn't hurt very much now, but it's starting to be very itchy underneath. I broke my arm when I was your age, Dylan said, even though it was a lie. I had to use a wire coat hanger to scratch it underneath. It was the only way I could get it to stop itching. Blake smiled. I'll have to try that, thanks. It was almost too easy for Dylan. If he weren't so focused on getting what he wanted, he would have felt bad. But guilt had never been an emotion Dylan was capable of feeling. How is he doing? Dylan asked, walking over to the man on the couch. Blake joined Dylan. I don't really know. The nurses at the hospital patched him up as best they could and then gave him some of these pills to take. I've been making sure he's been taking them every few hours to help with the pain. Dylan leaned closer to the man and then placed his hand on his forehead. He frowned feels like he's really warm. Blake touched the man's head too. And Dylan watched as the wheels of uncertainty and worry churned in the boy's head. It does feel a little hot, Blake said. I wonder if he has a fever. And if that's the case, then we need to cool him down, Dylan said. It could be dangerous for him if his fever gets too high. Do you have a thermometer or anything we could use to check it to make sure? Yeah, there's one, Blake said. My mom is a nurse, so we have a pretty nice setup for medical equipment here. Go, Dylan said, hurry. Blake disappeared into one of the back rooms. While the kid was busy searching for the medical supplies, Dylan took the opportunity to scan the house. He was certain Maggie and her husband had a stash of weapons somewhere. This was the kind of home and family who were prepared for all outcomes, including defending themselves. The man stirred on the couch, and Dylan glanced over at him as he searched through the cabinets in the rooms. Do you need any help back there? Dylan asked. No, I've got it, Blake answered, his voice muffled from the walls in the rooms. Dylan wasn't sure how the man on the couch was going to react if he woke up, and he would have preferred if the man remained unconscious. Can you tell if he's shivering? Blake asked, shouting from the back rooms. Dylan rolled his eyes, and then he walked over to the man on the couch. He was twitching, but Dylan wouldn't say he was shivering. No, Dylan said. I think that is a good sign, Blake said. Yeah, I think you're right, Dylan shouted, already irritated with the boy's do-goodness. The kid was like his father in that regard, a man who was willing to save others. Dylan had always hated altruistic acts and selflessness. He much preferred being selfish. It was infinitely more fun and satisfying. Just before Dylan was about to turn away from the man on the couch, he stirred awake and opened his eyes. 
The pair of men glanced at one another, and it was clear to Dylan that the guy recognized him. You, Jake said, his eyes widening with surprise. Holy shit, it's you. Dylan covered Jake's mouth before his voice rose any higher, and he reached for the knife in his pocket. He didn't hesitate as he jabbed the blade into the man's side, sticking him repeatedly. Each time that Dylan shoved the knife into the man's side, he groaned into Dylan's palm. Blood poured onto the couch, staining the cushions. And after the man finally lay completely still, Dylan quickly covered up the blood with a blanket and shut the man's eyes. He was dead, and Dylan wasn't sure how long he was going to be able to fool the boy into thinking he was still alive. But just as Dylan was dealing with one problem, he saw another approaching through the window. It was a massive truck pulling up to the front of the cabin. He saw Maggie's daughter, Sydney, quickly get out and hurry toward the cabin. Blake, she shouted. Blake, are you here? Dylan had to think quickly or his plan for revenge would unravel. He heard the boy move closer to him from the back of the room. Okay, I have a thermometer and some ice packs, Blake said, staring down at the items in his hands. Once we break them, they'll start to cool down and we can place some around his body. Do you think we should? Dylan was on Blake before the boy realized what was happening. He quickly clamped his hand over Blake's mouth so he couldn't scream and pinned the boy's arms at his side so he couldn't move. He then placed the blade against Blake's throat and used him as a shield as the front door swung open. Blake, are you? Sydney froze when she saw Dylan with a knife to her younger brother's throat. It took her a moment to react, but by the time she decided to raise the rifle, it was too late. Drop the gun, Dylan said. You already know what I'm capable of, so I suggest you don't try anything stupid. Even with the threat of losing her brother, Sydney almost didn't comply. But in the end, she set the gun down and raised her hands. Dylan was in complete control now. Well, 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 Dylan said, marveling at what he had already been able to do. It looks like the family is coming back together. So why don't we all come inside and play a little game until your parents show up? Chapter 27 It was harder to carry Maggie to the truck than John had originally thought. The wood Teddy found in the barn was flimsy and rotting. So they had to take apart the kitchen table and use the top to carry Maggie down to the road. But even before they reached the truck, John knew something was wrong. He instructed Teddy to gently set Maggie down on the ground and then hurried to examine the truck. The tires had been destroyed, sabotaged, no doubt by Dylan, who must have seen the truck on his escape from the farm. Frustrated, John kicked the deflated tires and he hunched forward, trying to think about what they could use to move them quickly to the cabin. John paced back and forth, Teddy watching him in a daze. The cart and horse could work, but even that would be difficult to navigate on the roads, and it would be slow. They needed something that could move quickly. Something that was the barge, John said. It's still working, and the river runs through my property on the cabin. What? Teddy asked. We need to get her down to the river, get back on the barge, John answered. John and Teddy picked Maggie back up and hurried toward the river. The canoe was still on the bank. They gently laid Maggie into the canoe and they kept her stable while the boat rocked. Make sure you keep a close eye on her pulse, John said, just like I showed you. Right, Teddy replied, gently keeping his hand on her neck. If you don't feel anything for 10 seconds, you let me know right away, John said, rowing quickly. What happens if we can't get the barge to start? Teddy asked. They drove it here, so it has to be working, John answered. There were still plenty of obstacles in their path, but John was confident they would be able to overcome them no matter what. And John's drive to keep his family safe overpowered everything else in his mind. There was nothing more important to him than getting his wife healthy and reuniting with his children again. When they finally reached the barge, 
John didn't have any rope to tie off the canoe to keep it steady from the current. So he and Teddy used both arms to keep them from moving farther downstream, while John picked up his wife and placed her onto the barge. Once Maggie was on the barge, John climbed up and then helped Teddy to do the same. And then together, they heaved the canoe onto the barge in case they needed it later. John and Teddy then carried Maggie to a shady spot to keep her out of the sun. John instructed Teddy to stay with his wife and keep an eye on her, just like he'd been doing. Remember, if she doesn't have a pulse for 10 seconds, I'll call you, Teddy said. I've got this. The wheelhouse was shot up, but the controls were still operational. He positioned himself at the wheel and then hoisted the anchor and steered the boat farther down the river. The old barge was much harder to control than John anticipated, and it took him a bit to get a feel for the vessel's movements. Once John had the barge heading in the right direction, he decided to check on Teddy and Maggie. How is she? John asked. Fine, I think, Teddy answered. John bent down and checked his wife's vitals, and once he confirmed they were still strong, he allowed himself to relax. It looks like we really dodged a bullet on this one. Teddy said. We're not out of the woods yet, John said, but it looks like things are finally heading in the right direction. Teddy didn't share John's enthusiasm about the situation. Not that John blamed the kid. After everything Teddy had experienced, it made sense for him to be a little nervous about the possibility of what came next. How did you do it? Teddy asked. John frowned. What do you mean? I mean, I don't understand how you managed to get through all of this and still have energy, Teddy answered. How are you not terrified of the future? It was a fair question. But John wasn't sure how he should answer. He didn't even know if he was capable of answering. Life is unpredictable, John said. Today was a harsh lesson in that reality. But no matter the uncertainty of what comes next, you have to have confidence in yourself. You have to have faith in the people around you. It doesn't do any good to worry about the future that you have no control over. It will only hurt yourself in the long run and cause even more stress for you and the people around you. So you just don't worry at all? Teddy asked. John almost laughed. I worry every day. I worry about my family and my friends. I worry about what kind of world we're leaving behind and what part I played in shaping that future. But I don't dwell on the worry. I guess that's the biggest difference. Being afraid, worrying, not having all the answers. It's all a crapshoot. The only thing you have control over is how you react to a situation. You can let it control you or you can control the situation. That's it. Once you learn how to accept that, then you can face anything, no matter the odds. Teddy bowed his head. I just don't think I have that kind of confidence. I think you have more confidence than you realize. John replied. You just need to have faith in yourself that it'll work out. Teddy remained hunched forward and slightly timid, but John believed the young man would be able to overcome his own doubt in order to grow into a good man. John returned to the helm of the barge as they continued down the river. They caught a few stares from people along the riverbanks, and even came across a few stuck out on their boats, but most of them had managed to maneuver to the shoreline. John counted dozens of boats that had been abandoned, and all the frustrated captains who were trying to figure out what was wrong. John stuck to the middle of the river where he hoped it was deepest, and he only had a few close scares when he had to pass under a bridge, scraping against one of the concrete pillars, but no real damage was done. After it was smooth sailing, all the way toward the dock that was part of John's property that pushed up against the river, Once they maneuvered past the farms and other homes in the agricultural area outside of the city, they entered the forest where John had bought land. It was a much more scenic route along the river, with nothing but trees surrounding them. It was the kind of peace and quiet that John had wanted. Everything slowed down, even the rush of the river. There were no car horns, no people shouting at one another, and no planes flying overhead. It was just the sounds of nature. The moment John was back in his environment, he remembered why he had worked so hard to build a home out here. 
everything he had done had been for the same reason, making sure his family had a safe place to grow up. This was their sanctuary, and it was a place where they could come to recharge and regroup, and it had never been needed more than right now. John maneuvered himself as close to his homemade dock as he could get without damaging it, and then he dropped the anchor. John put out 20 feet before he stopped and waited to see if the anchor had caught the riverbed. Once John was certain the vessel was secure, he and Teddy prepared the canoe to take Maggie to the dock. I don't know if you want to stay on the boat or come with us, John said. You're more than welcome to come inside and get some water and food. I'm sure Sidney would be glad to see you. Even with Teddy's injuries and the marks all over his face, John noticed Teddy blushed at the mention of his daughter. I'll come with you, Teddy said, clearing his throat. If that's okay. It's fine, John replied. I could use the help with Maggie anyway. John and Teddy carefully carried Maggie over to the side of the barge, where they had placed the canoe. John stepped down into the canoe first, and then carefully cradled Maggie's head as he gently laid her down in the boat. Once Teddy was in the boat, John rowed them back to the dock. Thankfully, the river waters were much calmer here than near the farm. How far away is the cabin from the dock? Teddy asked. It's less than a mile, John answered. We should be able to use the canoe to carry Maggie over the trail. It's mostly flat all the way to the cabin, and I cleared a path when I first built the dock. It's peaceful out here, Teddy said, glancing around and admiring the landscape. Yes, it is, John said. I don't get out much from the city, aside from going to the farm, Teddy said. But this is much nicer than the farm. Do you even like working on the farm? John asked. Teddy shrugged. It's okay. I wasn't around nature a lot growing up, so it's been a bit of an adjustment, dealing with the different animals and that kind of thing. I only really joined up because of sit. Teddy caught himself, and then he cleared his throat as his cheeks flushed a crimson red. John repressed a smirk. You like her, John said. Teddy struggled to find the courage that John had noticed before, but he eventually harnessed it. He straightened up and looked John in the eye. I do, sir. I very much enjoy spending time with your daughter. And if it's all right with you, I would like to take her out on a date, you know, after all of this is over. John almost smiled at Teddy's sincere request. The kid had a good heart. And while John didn't know if Sidney had similar feelings toward him, he didn't have any qualms about the two going on a date. Well, I don't think it's really up to me, John said. You have to ask Sidney if that's what she wants to do. But if you're asking if I approve, I do. Teddy smiled and once again blushed. After so much bloodshed, hardship, pain, and suffering they had all experienced in this short amount of time, it felt good to see a bit of hope shine through. Everything John did, everything Maggie did, was for the prospect of the future of their children. They wanted to create a path they could follow. But ultimately, their children would have to walk it on their own. They had always preached the importance of finding somebody to walk that path with them, somebody who shared the same ideals and hopes for the future. Above all else, that was what John and Maggie wanted for their children, to find the balance between all of life's struggles and happiness, to never become so overwhelmed that they were crushed by life itself, but instead to meet challenges head on and find a way to thrive. And if there was one silver lining John found amid all the pain the EMP had caused, it was that his family had the strength and perseverance to overcome any obstacle. They had faced the worst life could throw at them, and they had survived. Now all that mattered was making sure everyone was healed and rested to start again. Or perhaps this was finally the last push that John and his family needed in order to leave the city and move out to the homestead for good. John didn't have any qualms about living out here. It was nice to think about all the plans that could come to fruition. And it was a very welcome change of pace from all the horrible decisions that John had had to make since the EMP was detonated. After 10 minutes of walking along the trail, Teddy stopped. Mr. Carver, I think I need a break, Teddy said. Sure, John replied. The pair sat the canoe down and Teddy walked over to a nearby stump. While Teddy caught his breath, 
John tended to Maggie. Maggie's vitals had improved, and when he brushed her sweaty bangs from her forehead, she grunted as she stirred awake. Hey, it's okay, John said. It's me, you're safe. Maggie looked startled when she finally opened her eyes. What happened? Maggie asked. You were shot, but we got you to the cabin, John answered. We're almost there, and Sydney and Blake are waiting for us. Maggie started to sit up, but John held her back down. I need to see them. I need, I need to see my children. You will, John said, keeping his hand firmly on her chest. But right now you need to rest. We have plenty of time for a reunion, I promise. Maggie relaxed, and John gently brushed his fingers through her hair. They stared at one another for a moment, happy to have made it out. I wasn't sure I was going to see you again, Maggie said. You can't get rid of me that easy, John replied. No, I guess I can't, Maggie said. The brief show of strength that Maggie had vanished, and she closed her eyes again. He was glad she was awake, and was thankful this was almost over. He let Maggie sleep and then checked on Teddy. You all right? John asked. Teddy shook his head. It's my ribs. Feels like something is stabbing me every time I take a breath. Let me take a look at your side, John said. John slowly lifted his shirt and revealed a bruise along his side. It was clear they were broken, and he had a possible collapsed lung. It was a serious condition and required more medical expertise than John could offer. Maggie might be able to help if she was awake, but she was still recovering herself. Why don't you sit right here and I'll get Sydney to come back and help me, John said. Are you sure? Teddy asked. Yeah, it'll be fine. John answered. Just hang tight and I'll be right back. It's not much farther up the trail. Okay, thanks, Teddy answered. And he started wheezing again. Just stay on the path, John said. Don't wander off of it. There are traps I've set in the woods as a security precaution. Got it, Teddy replied. John was fully aware of just how dangerous a collapsed lung was. But he didn't want to alarm the boy. He hurried along the path toward the cabin leaving Maggie to help save time. John was so consumed with thinking about the next steps for Teddy that he didn't pay attention to his surroundings. But when he neared the cabin, he noticed how quiet it was. He didn't think Sidney and Blake would be having a party, but the silence made him worry there was something wrong. And as John was slowing down, gunshots were fired in his direction from the cabin window, and John dove behind a nearby tree for cover. Chapter 28 Bullets peppered the trunk of the white oak tree where John ducked to shield himself from the gunfire. Pieces of wood splintered off, slowly transforming the massive tree trunk into sawdust. There was only one person who could be doing this, but John didn't know how Dylan had found the cabin. But it was obvious to him Dylan had found the stash of automatic weapons John kept in the gun vault. Eventually, the continuous gunfire ended, and John slowly poked his head out from around the tree in the deafening silence. Johnny boy, Dylan shouted. I was wondering when you would show up. John tightened his grip on the pistol and discreetly peered out from behind the tree trunk. He saw the open window in the cabin where Dylan had been firing from. After John had located Dylan, he pressed himself back up against the tree and stood up so he was ready to move at a moment's notice. I have your son and daughter in here, Dylan said. But I'm afraid I have some bad news about your friend, Jake. Looks like he didn't make it. John tensed in anger and nearly allowed his emotions to take control. But then John wondered if Dylan was telling the truth. What do you want, Dylan? John asked. You know, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, Dylan answered. And I think I finally figured out how we can solve this. You've taken something of mine, so I think it's only fair that I take something from you. If you lay one hand on any of my children, there is no deal, John said. 
The only thing that will happen between us at this point will be me hunting you down and putting you in the ground myself. Do you know what is funny about that? Dylan asked. Your wife told me the same thing. How is she doing right now? Dylan was talking a big game, but he was on John's turf now, and he had every intention of using that to his advantage. John had tried to be prepared for any and all eventualities while building his cabin. In the event, however unlikely, that the cabin would be overtaken, John made sure to install escape tunnels. He built three of them because he wanted to make sure his family had options if they needed to get out or back in. And while John never had considered using those tunnels, he was glad he had them prepared. But in order for his plan to work, John needed to buy himself some time, and he believed he had just the solution to the problem. You want your money? John said. Well, I have it. Dylan was uncharacteristically quiet, and John took that as a good sign. Dylan was motivated by greed and selfishness, and that was what John needed to exploit in Dylan, just as Dylan had exploited John's family. You managed to get the barge all the way here, Dylan said. That's very clever of you, John. Perhaps I did not give you enough credit. You're not the stupid hillbilly I thought you were. So how about a trade, John asked. The money for my children, it's that simple. It's never that simple, John, Dylan answered. Because you're smarter than I imagined you to be. So it makes me wonder what else you have up your sleeve. I'll get the money and bring it back to you as a show of good faith, John said. To prove to you that I really have it. Dylan was silent as he considered John's proposal. But the longer the quiet stretched, the more John feared his plan would fail. Anxious to figure out what was happening, John slowly slipped out from behind the edge of the tree trunk. When he stared at the window where Dylan had been before, he saw he was gone. Unsure of where Dylan had disappeared to, John stepped out from the cover of the tree. But this time, Dylan brought the gunfire from above shooting at John from the cabin's rooftop. The gunfire forced John back behind the cover of the tree, and he heard Dylan's maniacal laughter replace the gunshots. I just wanted to make sure I had a better view of what you're up to, Dylan said. I have the high ground now, John, so don't think that you're gonna outsmart me. With Dylan in his new position, John was pinned down. Even if he tried to make a run for it, the likelihood he would survive had dropped significantly. If there was ever going to be a moment where John needed a miracle, it was now. Sidney and Blake struggled against the ropes Dylan had used to restrain them. They were tied up by their wrists and ankles and attached to the cast iron pipe that ran down the center of the house and into the basement. Dylan had brought Sidney and Blake into the basement because he thought it would be the most secure location. But if Sidney could only get free, they would be able to escape. One of the three tunnels leading out of the cabin was located in the basement. Sidney could see it from her position where they were tied up. Because Sidney and Blake were both gagged, it was impossible for the pair to communicate, and Blake was starting to panic. Sidney wished she could comfort her brother. She wished she had paid more attention when she had arrived at the cabin. She had immediately recognized Dylan's truck, but he was already waiting for her. It had been stupid of her not to fully prepare or try to sneak in another way, but she was so worried about Blake that she burst through the front door, and that was exactly what Dylan had expected. Sydney continued to work against her restraints. She had already managed to create a tiny amount of slack on the rope around her left wrist, but it still wasn't big enough for her to slip her hand through. The gunfire outside prompted her to work faster, and she used the loud noises outside as a cover to tug against the cast iron pipe to loosen the rope. She'd had to be careful earlier when Dylan was inside, because any noise from the pipe traveled up to the first floor. But the gunshots masked her noises. Not making much more progress on her own restraints, she was nudged by Blake on her right. It wasn't until he smacked her hard in the ribs with his elbow she finally looked over. He was obviously trying to say something to her, 
but she couldn't understand him through the gag. Eventually, Sidney watched him motion to his own restraints and saw that one of his hands was almost free. The cast around his busted arm had given him some wiggle room. If Sidney could reach over with one of her hands and help pull on the rope, then Blake might be able to break free. She nodded in understanding and then strained to reach Blake's ropes. It took a few tries, but Sidney finally reached Blake's restraints. As she pulled the rope toward her, Blake pulled in the opposite direction. It took a few tries, but with one final tug, Blake was free. Blake might have only had one good arm, but he worked quickly on Sidney's restraints when he was done with his own. Blake removed Sidney's gag first, and she glanced to the basement stairs, wanting to get moving before Dylan realized what was happening. Hurry, Blake, Sidney said. We need to make sure we get this done. I'm working as fast as I can, Blake said. The longer it took Blake, the more anxious she became. She imagined Dylan coming down the stairs with a gun in his hand, seeing what they were doing, and then shooting them on sight. It was clear to her that Dylan was completely unhinged. He was angry and out for revenge, and Sidney could think of no better way for him to get revenge on her parents than to kill them. Done, Blake said. Sidney finally removed her hands and untied the rope around her ankles. She flung the ropes off her and quickly jumped to her feet. She pulled Blake toward the secret passage and heaved the section of the flooring that had been cut out, exposing the hole underneath. Get in, hurry, Sidney said. And just as Blake lowered himself into the hole, Dylan burst into the basement. Okay, kids, it's showtime. When Dylan reached the halfway point down the stairs, he froze when he saw Sidney lowering Blake into the hole. Knowing that both of them could not escape, Sidney quickly pushed Blake farther into the hole and then slammed the door shut. Run, Blake, go, Sidney shouted. Dylan was quick down the stairs, aiming the gun at Sidney the entire time. But Sidney stood her ground and refused to move giving Blake as much time as she possibly could to escape through the tunnels. Move now, Dylan said. If you kill me, then you lose your last bargaining chip, Sidney answered. I'm the only thing you have left. It was quite the gamble, risking her own life. But she was betting that Dylan wanted that money more than anything else. And when he didn't pull the trigger, he proved her point. Dylan rushed over to Sidney and forced the girl back onto her knees. He pressed the barrel of the gun against the back of her head and opened the door in the floor where Blake had escaped through the tunnel. Once it was clear to him Blake was long gone, he angrily slammed the door shut and pressed the rifle's barrel against the back of Sidney's skull. That was a very stupid mistake, Dylan said. I was hoping to have more than one of you but I'm sure having John's oldest will be enough. He removed the gun from the back of her head, picked her up by the arm, and then shoved her toward the stairs. Move, and don't do anything else stupid. Sydney complied and ascended the steps. She found solace in the fact she had been able to save her younger brother. She'd always been protective of him. Sydney did not make any sudden moves in fear that Dylan would finally lose his patience. Because while he might have wanted his money, he was still highly unstable, and there was no telling what he might do next. But Sydney knew her father was still outside, and she had an opportunity to let him know Blake was all right, and that Dylan was distracted. It wasn't an opportunity she was going to allow to slip past. When she neared the top of the stairs, Dylan keeping close to her backside, she knew if she screamed loud enough, her father would be able to hear. She took a deep breath, and then before Dylan could stop her, she yelled. John remained still. He didn't want to put himself in a situation where he was pinned down again, so he took his time to think about his next moves. But his thoughts were interrupted when he heard screaming inside the cabin. It was Sydney. Dad, Blake's safe in the tunnels, Sydney shouted. Dylan's in here with me, you need to. Sidney's voice was cut short, and John feared the worst. 
he immediately sprinted from the tree and toward the cabin. He no longer cared about being exposed. The only thing he focused on was that his daughter was in trouble, and he was the only person who could save her. John reached the front of the cabin quickly, busting down the front door to find Dylan with a gun to his daughter's head and a wicked smile on his face. Well, 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 Dylan said. It's funny how quickly things can take a turn for the worse. It's over, Dylan, John said. Here we are again, Johnny boy. Dylan said, but it looks like I have the upper hand. Let her go, John said. And stop all of this fun, Dylan asked. I don't think so. I think you have had too simple of a life, Johnny. You need a little bit of chaos, a little bit of complexity. I think I can teach you an important lesson. Just shoot him, Dad, Sidney said. I'm getting tired of listening to this prick. Oh, such a mouth on this one, Dylan said. I don't think daddy taught you your manners very well. John thought back to everything that had happened since the detonation of the EMP. He thought of his wife being held hostage, then his son, and now his daughter. And when he saw Jake's lifeless body on the couch nearby, John knew what he had to do. She's not what you want, John answered. You want me. For a moment, Dylan was confused by John's actions. Is this some sort of joke? Dylan asked. It's the truth, John answered. I still have the most important thing to you, and that is your freedom. Dylan laughed. Is that so? It is, John answered. The moment you hurt my daughter, I'll come after you. There'll be no place you can run to escape me. No place for you to hide. It was obvious to John he had finally struck a chord with Dylan. The first hint of fear had crept into Dylan's head. He fidgeted uncomfortably. Well then, Dylan said, I guess I'll have to shoot her and then you really quickly, won't I? You're not that fast, John answered. I learned a lot about you today, more than I ever wanted to know. And you're not the guy who does the dirty work. You're the planner. You're the mastermind. The fact that you're out here all by yourself means you're out of your element. Dylan's playfulness slowly waned. You're not as dumb as you look, John. Perhaps you're not as simple as I thought either. It took me a little while to figure you out, but I got there eventually, John answered. It was quiet for a moment, both men contemplating their next moves. John was willing to give up himself in exchange for his daughter but he needed to do it in a way that wouldn't put Sidney's life at risk or give Dylan the upper hand. I still have the key to the safe, John said. I think that would be more than enough for my daughter's life. I think that's a fair assessment, Dylan said. Give me the key and then I'll let your daughter go. John thought back to a similar situation on the barge with Teddy's life. He wasn't about to fall into the same trap. We both go out to the river, John said. When we're there, we'll do the exchange, but I'm not giving you the key until I have my daughter. And I'm not giving you the girl until I have the key, Dylan said. You might feel different once you're closer to the barge, John said. Think of all that money and the freedom waiting for you down south. You still have an opportunity to escape. You can still get away. I won't chase you, not if you let my family go. This could be the end of it. Here and now. Dylan was quiet as he contemplated John's suggestion. All right, Johnny boy, Dylan said. Let's take a walk. Maybe the fresh air will help both of us see reason. John doubted that, but all he cared about was getting Dylan out of the cabin and into the woods. The woods were John's element, and he planned to capitalize on that to save his daughter. Chapter 29 Once everyone was outside, Dylan moved down the path in the woods first, keeping Sidney close while John followed. But as they walked the path, John knew Teddy and his wife were still at the halfway mark where he'd left them. He needed to let them know he was coming without giving it away to Dylan. So what is the plan when we reach the barge? John asked, raising his voice so it would carry into the woods. 
I'm going to take my money and ride off into the sunset, Dylan answered. All this for an early retirement, John said. It's more than that, Dylan replied. People will remember me, John. They will remember what I did, that I stole more money from any bank than any person in the history of the world, and no one will ever find me once I'm gone. <laughs> you keep telling yourself that, John said. Dylan laughed. Do you doubt me? People like you can't change their nature, John answered. You'll find trouble again. It's only a matter of time. Maybe you're right, Dylan replied. Maybe I'm only buying myself some time. Either way, I will come out on top. I always do. Dylan's confidence bordered on arrogance. But John had every intention of knocking him down a few pegs. But first he needed to make sure Sidney was out of harm's way. John made eye contact with Sidney, and he gestured toward the woods. The pair had been out here several times. Both of John's children were well aware of the traps he had set in the woods to protect their home. And she nodded in understanding. All that mattered now was making sure Sidney was safe. Once that was accomplished, then he didn't care what happened to him. The terrain from the house to the dock was fairly stable, but they were approaching an area where it was much thicker and trees off the path. If John was waiting for an opportunity to make a move, then he was nearing it. But they were also getting closer to the spot where John had left Maggie and Teddy. John's pulse quickened. Things could turn south very quickly, and he wanted to make sure he was ready. He kept a close eye on Dylan, watching his every move. When they finally turned the corner on the path where John had left Teddy with Maggie and the canoe, John hoped he had hidden his surprise when he saw that they were both gone. Dylan noticed John's hesitation and raised an eyebrow. Something you need to tell me? John quickly recovered. No, we're getting closer. John thought it best to scan the woods nearby discreetly, searching for where Teddy could have taken Maggie but he was nowhere to be found. The closer they moved toward the barge, the more John had to think about what came next. He continued to make eye contact with Sydney, hoping she would pick up on their need to make something happen. It was a nerve wracking situation, and one wrong step could be fatal. But John finally saw Sydney give him a nod. She was ready. Getting closer, Dylan said. What do you think is going to happen? There was a malicious playfulness in his tone, and John watched as they neared one of the traps closest to the path's edge. I think you're going to lose, John said, because that's what's right. Dylan laughed. <laughs> do you want to know what I think your biggest problem is? You truly believe that if you do the right thing, then you will be rewarded. But that's not how the real world works, Johnny boy. People take what they want. And if they're not strong enough to hold on to it, then someone else will come along and rip it from their grasp. That's a very cold and calculated view of the world, John said. Have you not been paying attention since the EMP was detonated? Dylan asked. Look at how quickly people turned on one another when resources were scarce. People were only out to save themselves. People are more than just the violent animals you make them out to be, John said, except for you. Then is that what you think I am? Dylan asked. No, John answered. Staring Dylan in the eyes, I think you're a coward, plain and simple. Dylan laughed. I'm not afraid. Yes, you are, John said. You're afraid of dying. You're afraid of drawing that last breath. It's the only reason you kept my family alive, and the only reason you haven't tried to kill Sydney yet. You're not confident that you could beat me in a real fight. John had wanted to pick at Dylan's ego, blind him with anger so Sydney could make her move. Dylan was nothing more than a child. If John exploited the man's insecurities, he would take the bait. They were getting closer to the trap now, just a few more steps. You're not as clever as you think, John. Dylan said. You're not going to trick me into a fight. Sydney tensed when they reached the spot near the edge of the path. She was in a good position, too, 
All she had to do was push Dylan to the right. Then I guess we'll have to settle this some other way, John said. And on cue, Sydney shoved Dylan hard with her shoulder. He didn't move as far as John hoped, but the few steps were enough to spring the trap. And when the spike flew into Dylan's leg, Sydney sprinted away from him toward her father. But Dylan started shooting, and John moved quick to get Sydney out of harm's way, before either of them caught a bullet. When Teddy first heard the gunshots, he had no idea what to do. All he could think about was making sure that Mrs. Carver remained safe. He knew that was what Mr. Carver would have wanted. It took all of Teddy's strength to pull the canoe off the path and into the woods, being mindful of the traps that Mr. Carver had told him about. Mrs. Carver was still unconscious, but she was alive. Between Mrs. Carver's condition and the gunfire, Teddy was at a loss for what to do. He remembered what Mr. Carver had told him about how dangerous the woods around the property were, all the traps he had set and how one wrong move could be fatal. Teddy was stuck. But then he heard movement on the left, and Teddy readied himself for a fight. But that all ended when he saw Blake pop his head out from a hole in the ground. Teddy, Blake said, keeping his voice at a whisper. Blake? Teddy asked. Blake was quick to get out of the tunnel, and then rushed over to Teddy. He hugged Teddy and then noticed his mother in the canoe nearby. Mom, Blake said, his voice a whisper. She's okay, Teddy said, trying to calm Blake down. Well, she's hurt, but she's still alive. I wanted to get her back to the cabin, but your dad mentioned there was some traps out in the woods. I didn't want to misstep. It's okay, Blake said. I know where to go. Just stay here with mom and I'll be back with help. Maybe I should go with you, Teddy asked. I'll be okay, Blake answered. It would be too difficult to try to navigate my mom on the canoe, and I don't think I can help carry it. He gestured to his broken arm. You stay here and keep her safe like you've been doing. Thank you, Teddy. Blake hurried away, the noise of gunshots growing louder in the woods. Blake knew he had to go back to get his sister. It had been his fault the bank robber was able to do this because Blake had let him in the house. Blake should have known better than to trust a stranger, but he had allowed his emotions to get the better of him. Blake was tired but he was boosted by a shot of adrenaline after escaping the house through the tunnels. He kept tasting bits of dirt in his mouth from his escape, but it was a small price to pay to remain alive. Blake was careful not to trigger any of the trip wires through the woods. He was glad his father had taken the time to show him where they were. Blake was nearly back to the house to save his sister when the shooting started again, and Blake jumped from the gunfire and then he saw his father drag Sidney into the woods. The other man was nearby, screaming and shooting, without hesitation. Blake shifted course and hurried toward his dad and sister, but when he neared them, he was immediately shoved down to the ground by his father. Stay down, John shouted. Blake covered his ears as his father returned gunfire, but with the other man firing so wildly, his dad could barely get a shot off. He leaned closer to his sister, who embraced him in a hug. Are you okay? Blake asked, staring at his sister. Yeah, I think so, Sydney answered, checking herself. Eventually, the shooting stopped, and when it did, John turned to both of his children. Blake had seen his father angry before, but never this focused. It was like he turned into someone else as he spoke. I need the two of you to get back to the cabin immediately. John said, stay there and lock down, do you understand? But dad, we can help, Sydney answered. Yeah, Blake said. You two have already done more than I could have hoped for, John said. I'm so proud of the two of you, but right now all that matters is making sure you two are safe. We don't want to leave you, dad, Blake said. For a brief moment, Blake saw his father become normal again, even at the height of so much chaos. John would never forget he was always a father first. I know, John said softly. But you two are the most important thing to your mother and me. And everything we do is to protect you. That's my job. And that's what I have to do now. Sydney understood, and she slowly pulled Jake away from their dad, 
but Blake didn't want to leave. They had been apart for far too long. It won't be much longer, John said, reading his son's mind, I promise. Blake remembered what his father had always told him about making promises. You never did it unless you were certain it could be kept. And his dad always kept his promises. Once the kids were out of harm's way, moving through the woods away from Dylan, John turned his attention to Dylan. The man had no more leverage over John, which granted him the opportunity to treat Dylan like the animal he was. And given he had a wooden spike through his leg, John knew it was only a matter of time before he was brought down. Clever, Dylan finally shouted after a period of no gunfire. I did underestimate you, Johnny boy. You're a regular Eagle Scout, aren't you? He laughed. But then he cursed from the pain. I'd still like to think I can take you, though. John had Dylan up against the ropes, and he planned on capitalizing on that momentum. He slowly stepped around the tree, searching for where Dylan might have limped off to. He couldn't have gotten far, not with the spike impaling his leg, not to mention the other traps John had set in the woods. John tracked Dylan's blood trail and saw he was heading toward the river. He was still trying to escape, even after all of this. The man was, if anything, persistent in his pursuits. John moved quickly through the woods, easily stepping around the trip wires and traps he had set. Based on the blood loss, it was clear that Dylan was moving quickly and clumsily. A few of the alarm trip wires sounded off, giving John an even more precise location of where Dylan was located. The man was running out of time. The blood trail led back to the riverbank, but John saw no sign of Dylan. He used the scope of his rifle to make sure he wasn't missing anything on the barge. John turned around and studied the woods around him. He picked up the blood trail again, but it went cold. Dylan had stopped his bleeding. The forest was quiet. Dylan had gone silent, and for a man who enjoyed talking as much as he did, John imagined that must have been very hard for him. But while Dylan might have been hiding, John knew this part of the woods better than anybody else, and John was much more familiar with the sounds of the forest. He was connected to this piece of land in a way that no other person would understand. John closed his eyes and waited for the right opportunity. It wasn't until he heard the snap of a twig to his left that he finally opened his eyes and aimed in the direction of the noise. John opened fire, and Dylan immediately dodged out of the way. He tucked himself behind a large tree, but John didn't sit idle. He moved to the left, positioning himself to get a better angle on Dylan's location. You're quite the hunter, Johnny, Dylan said. I think you got into the wrong line of work. John caught Dylan in his crosshairs and fired, this time winging Dylan in the arm. Dylan cursed as he spun away from the gunshot, and then he fired back at John. But Dylan had lost his ability to aim and fired blindly in John's direction, missing terribly. John saw the blood on the tree trunk where he'd shot Dylan. It was almost done. I didn't think you were a killer, Dylan said. You didn't strike me as the type to be able to take a man's life. John ignored Dylan's comments and continued pushing the man on the riverbank, where another surprise was waiting for Dylan. Do you really think you'll be able to finish the job, John? Dylan asked. John continued to push Dylan toward the hole, driving him backward with unmatched precision. It was all that talk about taking a life unless it was necessary, a bunch of bullshit, Dylan replied. Because it's starting to feel like this is very personal. I'm beginning to think you want to kill me for the sake of killing me. John fired three more shots, pushing Dylan backward in a straight line. Dylan cursed, hating the fact that he was being pushed into a retreat. And he cursed John with every name he could think of. It was almost over now. Just a few more steps, and Dylan would be caught. Come out and face me like a man, Dylan shouted. Okay, John said. 
and he emerged from his cover and fired one shot over Dylan's head, causing the man to step back and collapse into the pit John had made. Dylan cried out in pain when he landed in the pit. There were no spikes below. It was designed to capture people, but the pit was 12 feet deep with no way to climb the slick dirt walls. John approached the edge of the pit and stared down into it. Dylan immediately fired his weapon angrily, but it was futile. John waited until Dylan ran out of bullets, and John heard the click of the firing pin to approach the edge again. Dylan caught his breath and calmed himself down. So now what, Johnny? Are you gonna kill me? Shoot me like a fish in a barrel. Not very sporting. I have every right to kill you, John said. But I've never enjoyed killing. That's not who I am. And no amount of persuasion will convince me to be more like you. You are an animal. An animal should be caged as such. I would get used to those walls because you're going to be in the cell the rest of your life. You don't think I'll be able to get out like I did before? Dylan asked. You don't think I'm going to spend every waking minute searching for you and your family trying to get back here so I can finish the job? You really can't be that stupid. John took a breath and calmed his nerves. I think you misunderstand me. I said that I'm not going to kill you. Because it's not me that should be the one to do it. But that doesn't mean you're not going to die. Dylan frowned. But he understood when he watched Maggie limp over to them. She was held up by Teddy, and she stared down at Dylan with contempt. I told you it would be me who pulled the trigger, Maggie said. John handed his wife a gun, and she aimed it at Dylan. And for the first time in his life, Dylan understood that no amount of talking would save him. He was finally staring down reality and his own mortality. And just as all cowards do, he begged. Please, Dylan said. Please, I didn't. Maggie shot him through the head and his body crumpled into the dirt and mud. And just like that, the forest fell silent again. Maggie dropped the gun, and then her legs gave out. But John caught her and scooped her up in his arms. I'm tired, Maggie said. Then let's get you home, John replied. John and Maggie walked away from the hole in the forest and returned to the cabin. John would return later to fill in the hole and bury the body. No one would ever hear from the famous bank robber, Dylan Elliott, again. His name would fade as he rotted in the dirt. Chapter 30, One Week Later John swung the axe down hard, splitting the firewood in half. He picked up the halved pieces and tossed them into a pile with the others, then wiped the sweat from his brow. He glanced over to the cabin, where he could hear his children through the open windows. The weather had cleared up nicely today, and the gloomy morning had transformed into a beautiful afternoon. There was a crispness in the air, and John took a moment to inhale the scent of the nature around him. It smelled of earth and water. He wished they had made the move out here years ago. John picked up some of the wood he had chopped and carried it back toward the cabin when a car pulled up his drive with a familiar face behind the wheel. Hey, Jim Parker, John said. What brings you up this way? Parker's arrival in the car meant the restoration efforts in the city were well underway, with power being restored to many who had lost it. I just wanted to let you know we still haven't found Dylan, Parker said. John and his family had decided to keep Dylan's death a secret. None of them wanted to go through the process of a trial, even though he was certain no jury would find them guilty. But given everything his family had been through, John didn't want to take that chance. Good to know, John said. Parker crossed his arms and eyed John more carefully. Each time I talk to you about this and give you an update on our search for Dylan, you never seem very interested in what I have to say. You don't even look worried that he's still out there. John shrugged. You know what they say about people who worry, they suffer twice. Parker walked closer to John. He studied John with a skeptical eye. Is there anything else you want to tell me about what happened? 
why don't you think Dylan ever came back for the money? I told you I always believed Dylan was more concerned about staying alive than he was about being rich, John answered. Maggie said the same thing, and I'm sure she would agree with me still. Right, Parker said. Well, I'll let you get back to it. Do you want to come inside? John asked. We're just about to have some dinner. Nah, I have to get back to the office, Parker answered. The cleanup efforts and repairs for the EMP are starting to overtake our search for Dylan. I don't think we're going to pursue him for much longer, not unless we get a lead. Okay, then, John said. Drive safe. Parker returned to his car. But just before he got inside, he stopped and called out to John one more time. You know, they finally finished counting the money from the heist. Looks like there was a few hundred thousand dollars missing. Is that so, John said. Yep, Parker said. I guess some of it may have gotten lost when I took the barge down the river, John said. It was a bit of a bumpy ride. Mm-hmm, Parker said. Let me know if you remember any other details about that day. Will do, John said. Once Agent Parker was gone, John returned to the cabin. When he stepped inside, it was clear that everybody had been listening to the conversation. Sidney and Blake looked worried, but John eased their fears. Nothing happened, John said. Are you sure he'll never find out? Sidney asked. I don't think he cares enough to keep looking anymore, John said. And he set the firewood down by the potbelly stove. Why don't you two get a fire going so I can get your mother? Sidney and Blake started stacking the wood, and John walked to the back where he found Maggie resting. After the incident with Dylan, they had managed to get Maggie some professional medical care. Thankfully, the gunshot had not damaged any of her organs, as they had previously feared. The bullet only missed her kidneys by less than an inch, but there was no significant damage the doctors could find. Hey, John said, gently waking Maggie up. Do you think you're ready for some dinner? Maggie stretched a little and yawned. Yeah, I could eat. How long was I asleep? Not too long, John said, and he brushed his fingers through her hair. Maggie frowned. What's wrong? John had never been good at keeping things from his wife. She had always said John had the worst poker face in the history of mankind. He couldn't dispute that. Agent Parker swung by, John answered. He asked about the money. Did he say anything specific? Maggie asked. John shook his head. No, nothing like that. He might think we took some of it, but I don't believe he's ever gonna say anything. Probably thinks we kept it for ourselves. Maggie squeezed John's hand. It was good giving that money to Jake's sister. She needed the help. After all the chaos of the EMP had died down, John was the one who had broken the news to Jake's sister about his death. Jake had supported his sister and her family financially, and with Jake gone, John didn't want them to struggle. And John didn't think the bank would miss a few hundred thousand after getting back all their millions, especially for such a good cause. We did the right thing, giving them some money, Maggie said. I know, John said. Maggie tilted her head to the side. What else is bothering you? John wasn't sure if he should speak his mind. After everything they had escaped, it seemed as though they had dodged a bullet. And John didn't want to dig up the past, especially when it was still so fresh. Did it make you feel better? John asked, killing Dylan. I didn't take any joy in it, Maggie answered. But if you're asking me if I'm breathing easier now that I know he's dead and our family is safe, then yes, and I would do it all over again if I had to. John nodded. Even after everything he'd done, what he'd said, I still don't know if I could have pulled the trigger. Maggie reached for John's face and gently caressed his cheek. Do you remember our first date together? I do, John answered. Do you remember those guys who kept harassing us when we were at the bar? Maggie asked. Yes. John answered. They were very annoying. They were assholes, Maggie said. But you never let them get to you. But the moment they said something inappropriate to me, I saw your face change. And I remember how you calmly stood up and walked over to their table. 
I never heard what you said, but when you walked away, I saw the look of fear on their faces. They never said a word the rest of the night. They just needed straightening out, John said. I know, Maggie said. And I knew right then and there that you were no coward. But you weren't violent either. You'd never been that kind of man, John. And that's the reason I married you. You and I, we've always done what the other can't do. That's why I squeezed the trigger. It was my turn to stand up and straighten things out. John smiled. Remind me to never let you get mad at me. Don't forget it, Maggie said. The pair kissed, and then Sidney and Blake hollered that they had the fire going. I'll get dinner ready, John said, standing up. I'll come help, Maggie said. The doctor said you needed to rest, John replied. Maggie flipped the covers off of her and swung her legs out. She reached for John's hand to help her up and then stood. I'm fine. And the doctor also said it was good for me to move around when I was feeling better. And I feel better. John escorted his wife into the kitchen. And together they started preparing dinner. It was nothing fancy. They were making spaghetti with a salad and some homemade bread. But as John chopped some peppers, he was unable to wipe the smile from his face. This was the kind of life he had always wanted being with his family, and spending as much time with them as he could. This was a life that a man like Dylan Elliott could never understand or appreciate. But it was a life that John craved, and he would always fight to keep it. This has been The Family Shelter, a small-town post-apocalypse EMP thriller, written by James Hunt, narrated by Cheryl May. Copyright 2023 by DBS Publishing, LLC. Production copyright by DBS Publishing, LLC. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.